ஜான் மீ டைம் ஆச்சா பா இல்ல இருக்கா 2 मिनिट्स இருக்கா 2 ஓ클ாக் ஆயிருது சார் we can start 2 சார் 2 ல 2 சார் respected senior teachers dear colleagues and friends on behalf of metha multi speciality hospital private limited chennai i welcome you all for this comprehensive cme on covid 19 most uttered word in the last 18 months when we were doing medical when we were just entering medical college in late 1960s our medicine professor told if you know syphilis you know all about medicine when we were leaving in 1974 same professor told me i revise my state and if you know diabetes you know all about medicine if he is alive today he would have definitely told if you know covid you know all about medicine the spectrum of covid is so wide affecting all the systems deep raising lot of queries always the differing course of illness acute post covid syndrome mis and long term issues i am um, we are going to this uh, disease is going to influence epidemiology of the world health in the next probably next one decade i am sure we are going to see at least a certificate course and fellowship course on covid will be started in any one of the universities all over the world in the future this cme from meta is going to cover important aspects of covid in a comprehensive manner including two important adult topics of course we don't do ct for kids but we should know what is the ct finding in adult so we included one radiology topic and we also included what the adult icu persons were doing with complicated covid you included a topic from from an adult intensivist with this uh, i welcome you all and then hand over the mic to dr john me and sangeeta to take over the proceedings thank you very much thank you sir good afternoon to one and all present here i would like to invite dr kannan sir to deliver the welcome address sir. good afternoon to you all it is a matter of immense pride that dr metha hospital is organizing the cme on covid 19 infection in children and young adults dr metha hospital if we compare it to a jewel the department of pediatrics is the crown this cme is organized by our hospital in association with iap chennai city branch and ima dr metha's chetpet branch the cme is going to be very useful for all practicing pediatricians whether they are in private practice or in the hospitals or in their own clinics because as dr tangavel sir rightly said the knowledge of covid is very essential for our survival and practice in these troubled times it is my proud privilege to welcome first and foremost i welcome dr k venkatesh president iap chennai city branch under his leadership iap chennai city branch is very active conducting many academic programs imparting knowledge to all pediatrician in and around chennai i welcome you sir i welcome all the distinguished faculty who are gathered here i welcome dr srinivasan a special welcome to you sir the teacher of teachers i welcome all the distinguished faculty who has spared the time to come here to give impart your knowledge and i welcome all the delegates who have joined us in this webinar let this knowledge empower you as lord gautama buddha said several centuries ago there is no wealth like knowledge no poverty like ignorance another saying the power of knowledge burns all karmas to ashes do everything with your knowledge you have to do but not with greed not with ego not with lust not with envy but with love compassion humility and devotion use your knowledge to the welfare of the humanity thus speak lord krishna to arjun in bhagavad gita the song celestial let knowledge and wisdom come to us from all sides let us serve the children whom we treat with humility compassion and use our knowledge to the benefit of humanity thank you very much thank you sir i would now like to call upon dr n c gauri shankar who is the head of clinical operation dr metha hospital to deliver a few words about the cme thank you dr janvi good afternoon respected dignitary professor the teachers this came on covid the seed was sown by 
our own Sam Samir Mehta, our CEO, who said like, we need to just put in all the facts together. It has been more than one and a half years since at COVID. Put in a joint effort, make sure everyone learns from your experience. Yes, we are going to put our experience too, but much more than that, what already has been known, probably with so many webinars, everyone will know. But what actually is known for the day to day practice is what is going to, uh, get, uh, what you are going to get from me. And everyone will do have to have some unlearning and then relearning after this COVID CME. Happy learning to all. Mm. All. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I request all the uh, delegates to kindly mute that mic. I now take immense pleasure in calling Dr. K. Venkatesh the present IAP Chennai City branch to deliver the inaugural address. Thank you, Dr. Janvi. Here, Dr. Kannan, Medical Director of Dr. Mehta's Hospital, Dr. Gaudi Shankar, Angavelu, Dr. El Subramaniam, Dr. Sharda Satish, Secretary IMA Mehta Chetra branch, all the faculty and our TNSC dignitaries, Dr. Rajendran and Ramesh Babu, who have joined all the faculty and delegates of the CME for the COVID-19 infection in children and adults, young adults. Warm greetings to you all from the Chennai City branch. Uh, COVID-19 is an evolving disease and guidelines keep changing every day. Hence, there is need for frequent updating on this subject. I sincerely thank Dr. Mehta's hospital for associating with Chennai City branch and doing a lot of virtual programs in this pandemic year. I think we have quite a done almost nearly 10 programs, I think, this year which I, with the Mehta's Hospital. I have great pleasure in inaugurating this CME, which I hope will be useful to all. Best wishes for the success of this academic year. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now call upon Dr. Sharada, Secretary, IMA, Dr. Mehta <laughs> Hospital branch to deliver the vote of thanks. It is my pleasant duty to thank all those involved in the smooth conduct of this virtual CME. And uh, as... Uh, Sarada, a little louder, please, Sarada. As uh, already... We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Now, can you hear me, sir? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, it's my uh, pleasant duty to thank all those involved in the smooth conduct of this virtual CME. Thanks a lot, Dr. Venkatesh, sir, uh, President IAPCCB to preside over this session uh, and uh, thanks a lot to President uh, IMA Meta Chetpet branch, Dr. Kannan sir. And thanks to the IT department and uh, DRM of uh, Meta Hospital. And I, and last but not the least, thanks to all the enthusiastic delegates who are going to make this CME a success. Let knowledge spread everywhere. Thank you. Thank you one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Request to the speakers. We kindly request the speakers to adhere to the allotted time of 15 minutes. There will be a prompting at 30 minutes as a reminder. The compare will introduce the speaker and chairperson of each talk and kindly stop sharing at the end of your presentation. Request to the chairperson. The chairperson can take two minutes to add valuable extra point on each talk at the end. And request to the delegates to mute your mic during the entire program and kindly post your questions in question answer box only, which will be taken up for the discussion in question answer session at the end. Tamil Nadu Medical Council credit points are available and kindly contact Mrs. Angel in the given number and email ID drm2 at metahospital.com. Thank you. I would, like, I would now like to call upon Dr. Sharda Satish to deliver the first talk, Spectrum of COVID-19 Infection, in ER or OP. Dr. Sharda Satish is currently the head of department pediatric emergency medicine in Mehta Multi-Specialty Hospital. The session will be chaired by Dr. C. V. Ravi Shekhar, who was formerly a reader in pediatrics, ICH and HC Chennai. Over to you, ma'am.
hope my slides are visible sir yes visible inshallah um the, for the next uh, 15 minutes uh, i'll be uh, taking you through the spectrum of covid 19 in children mainly uh, as a outpatient or in the emergency department so as we know we are all following the trend of the uh, covid uh, from the beginning from its beginning and uh, all of us are learning so many new things uh, every day and uh, the guidelines which are released uh, it is helping us to increase the knowledge of covid 19 as such so for uh, adults were the most frequently studied uh, subjects but now pediatrics is also coming into the forum now this was the first wave and uh, after a period of uh, literally 3 months rest in india we had a very high surge in the form of second wave globally 17 crores of uh, 17.9 crores of affected uh, patients are there with uh, of whom three crores deaths are reported in india the confirmed cases ca come to around uh, 30 crores and uh, we have uh, crores and we have 3 lakh uh, uh, and odd deaths so the numbers are uh, very well up and it is very uh, it's going up day by day the reason which was suggested for the uh, second wave surge was lowering of the guard people tried to understand covid and uh, they wanted to just uh, play with it and uh, they had uh, because of complete state of unlock mass gatherings and there was absolutely lack of adherence to social distancing mask use and virus also became smart and started mutating as with the absolute numbers in the increase uh, in the adult numbers the pediatric numbers also started increasing so we had a proportionate uh, increase in the numbers uh, according to the adult increase the individuals uh, proportion of which was consistently below 12% in less than 20 years and the mortality was uh, 3% of all deaths happened in less than 20 years during the second wave and uh, many of the deaths were reported in the uh, adolescent age group uh, ranging from 12 to 18 years one reassuring thing was only 10 to 20% of the affected uh, children required hospitalization of which 1 to 2% required icu admission so trying to understand the uh, disease uh, we uh, as globally uh, studied uh, the adult population elderly population were the most affected and the disease progressed to death in the first wave as well as in the second wave uh, when vaccinations uh, started bringing the numbers down whereas in pediatrics during the first wave as well as the second wave disease was very mild and we started uh, uh, in the later part of the first wave we started uh, seeing the uh, increase in the cases of uh, uh, post covid syndrome like multi system inflammatory syndrome in children children are less susceptible to coronavirus infection as compared to other viruses and uh, because the most of the infection spread from infected adults and these uh, lockdowns and uh, uh, stoppage of schools uh, closure of schools helped in the reduction of uh, patient children uh, getting exposed to the coronavirus and isolation of infected individuals reduced the rate of uh, pediatric infection among the studies of household contacts odds of infection in children were less than elderly so elderly were more frequently affected than the children so we to understand the uh, reason for this uh, we we have to understand the virus and the pathogenesis see the virus is a large enveloped single stranded rna virus which was a very heavy virus with multiple spikes and uh, through genetic recombination and variation it is giving us newer challenges for us to face see the sars cov2 virus infection uh, virus requires the ace2 receptor as well as tm prss2 are to successfully attach itself to the pulmonary alveolar cells and to enter the pulmonary lung cells as children have lesser uh, ce2 receptors and uh, children have innate immunity to multiple episodes of common colds t t cell immunity is very better and the reduced number of tm prss2 in children in type 1 alveolar epithelial cells protective th uh, t cell immunity in children all helped in the uh, lesser frequency of infection in children as such there is a excellent regeneration capacity of pulmonary alveolar epithelium because of young age and the risk factors such as comorbidities which are frequently seen in adults are less frequent in children coming to the case definition a child was suspected to have a covid for whom rt pcr is inconclusive or could not be performed due to any reason or child was said to be covid positive when the laboratory confirmation is present rt pcr is positive irrespective of clinical signs and symptoms 
The clinical phenotypes ranged from pre-symptomatic to uh, uh, symptomatic uh, phase, where in pre-symptomatic phase, there is a time period between the exposure to the virus and development of symptoms. Children were very infective during this stage. During the asymptomatic phase, where the RT-PCR test is positive, predominantly identified by contact tracing, children did not develop any clinical symptoms and signs, and child is still continuing to be infective. When they come into the symptomatic or uh, classic manifestation as described in adults, fever, cough, cold, shortness of breath, and it, which was very uh, indistinguishable from any other upper respiratory tract infection. But the, as such, fever, cough, and breathlessness as presenting symptom in, uh, in adults, which was seen in 93% of the adults, was very less in children. Only 73% of them showed these uh, classic symptoms of corona. But children developed atypical symptoms like uh, GA symptoms ranging from mild uh, acute gastroenteritis to acute dysentery and they developed severe acute abdomen and uh, we had a child, uh, we had an infant with intersusception and uh, ranging to acute appendicitis. Neurological manifestations were more frequent and cutaneous manifestations were more frequent and now the present evolving thing is MISC. Based on the severity of illness, the child was said to be asymptomatic, who had a suspected contact and incidentally detected due to cluster testings. Many children turned positive when the parents tested positive and contact tracing was done and uh, that is when they knew that the child is also infected. Mild infection was said when there was a sore throat, trinorea and a very, upper, very less upper respiratory symptoms were seen. There was cough without breathlessness and uh, SpO2 was more than 94% in room air. Child is said to have moderate severe uh, COVID when there is increased respiratory rate and uh, described as in less than two months, more than 60, two to 12 months, more than 50, one to five years, more than 40, and more than five years, more than 30. Saturation wavered between 90 to 94 percent. If the SPO2 was less than 90 percent and the children uh, developed the symptoms of ARDS, septic shock, severe pneumonia, MARDS, children are said to have severe COVID. So how do we classify this severity? It is based on the sequential performance of airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure as described in PALS. So I'll try to take you through simple case scenarios, uh, which we see in day-to-day -day care in, uh, as a OP basis, as well as children who come in sick and to identify them easily. So this was a seven years old child brought to OP as parents tested COVID positive. This child was tested uh, because of the uh, parents who had COVID positive and this kid has uh, COVID positive. So performing the uh, cardiovascular pulmonary assessment, we found out this uh, child had no uh, system involvement, airway was stable, breathing was normal, circulation was normal and disability was normal. Uh, so the child was advised home isolation for home isolation, generally, infants and children, uh, we are allowed to be under the care of the parents who are already positive. Older children can be isolated and uh, to be in constant touch with the parents to avoid mental stress in them. And uh, to practice COVID appropriate behavior, even at home with mask, social distancing and hand hygiene. There was no specific medications uh, prescribed uh, for these kids who were incidentally positive and uh, uh, Stress was given upon uh, giving fluids and feeds and adequate nutritious diet. But parents were counseled about onset of uh, any uh, symptoms. They had to review back to the hospital. The same child had a congested nose and fever for one day. So again, uh, when we examined, this uh, physiological status was absolutely stable. So for fever, symptomatic management, 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram of oral paracetamol was given and throat soothing agents and saline gargles were prescribed for older children. And the warning signs are uh, explained to the parents to see, to look for the warning signs, count the respiratory rate two to three times a day, look for chest in drawing, cold extremities, urine output, oxygen saturation, fluid intake and activity level in a younger infant. If anything was wrong, the child was hospitalized. So this child again came back with a continuous cough for two days. Now the physiological status assessment showed an increase in the respiratory rate and increased work of breathing. The child also had an auscultation piece and was on the borderline saturation of 94%. So this child now needs to be hospitalized 
when oxygen needs to be initiated if spo2 is less than 94% to maintain a spo2 between 94 to 96% iv fluids was advised only if oral intake is poor antimicrobials only if there is strong suspicion of superadded infection paracetamol was free for fever and mdi acetylene instead of uh, acetylene nebulization to avoid the uh, spread of the corona particles uh, ranged from 4 to 6 puffs in older children back to back and steroids only on the basis of rapidly progression rapid progression of the disease so coming to another case where a child uh, who was 10 years old treated elsewhere for covid positivity progress was referred to us for the progressively increased respiratory distress and falling spo2 levels and falling sensorium since morning now this child is uh, fitting into the respiratory failure triangle where the airway has become unstable there was respiratory rate which has increased book of breathing increased and uh, had uh, uh, added sounds on auscultation with uh, features of shock and uh, cardiogenic shock and uh, the child was pain responsive and unresponsive here resuscitation uh, should happen in the emergency room where uh, team members are restricted to two to three inside the resuscitation chamber and uh, proper ppe complete ppe with face shield n95 respirator double glove and shoe cover is advised and bag wall mask ventilation is initiated because the child is in respiratory failure and specific precautions should be taken while intubating the child uh, the chamber to separate the child from the uh, doctor who is intubating and iv ns fluid bolus as per the shock uh, whether the child is hypotensive uh, rapid uh, infusion and uh, or uh, a sl slower infusion in case of compensatory shock inotropes based on the physiological status assessment and the child is advised admission in pcu with isolation next case scenario uh, a 4 years old boy with fever of 3 days rashes and vomiting for 2 days with complaints of breathlessness since morning mother was covid positive one month back and the child was found to be febrile toxic looking At assessment we find that the airway is stable with respiratory distress and cardiogenic shock and uh, a pain responsive child Here, 100% oxygen was initiated through NRM. IV fluid NS at 2.5 ml per kg aliquots because of cardiogenic shock, and adrenaline was initiated. Antipyretics was initiated in ER, and uh, a complete blood for inflammatory markers be taken to rule out uh, the uh, MISC. And echocardiogram, if available at ER, should be performed to rule out any coronary changes or cardiac dysfunction. My, my future speakers and future uh, topics people will cover you through the take you through this MISC scenario. So basically, in uh, OP or ER situation, we had children, asymptomatic children, who were who constituted majority of our uh, uh, OP presentation, ranging from mild, moderate, and severe to febrile inflammation you know, phenotypes with MISC and uh, Kawasaki and hyperinflammation phenotypes. So treatment was essentially based on careful assessment. Intervention is should be based on the physiological status and continuation based on the clinical status estimation. So this was the course of infection from March 2022, uh, June uh, present uh, uh, till, uh, till recent uh, uh, in our OP fever clinic. So as such, when uh, before just before the second wave started, we had a uh, recently ill uh, patients uh, with COVID positivity. Combining the Chetpet campus and global campus, we had a total of 1,250 uh, children, odd children, and uh, this also followed the adult uh, numbers. So when the adult numbers increased, the pediatric numbers also increased consistently. But majority of them, as described by globally, they, they were asymptomatic. Thank you everyone for patient listening. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, moving on to our second <coughs> session, MISC management. Uh, I hereby call upon our speaker, Dr. Uh, Sandeep Kumar. Sangeeta, who... please give time for the chairperson. Ravishay has some comments to say. Sorry, sir. Uh, Ravishay, sir, please. Ravishay, sir, please uh, pass your comments. Sir. Mute, please sir. unmute, sir. Unmute, unmute. Uh, Dr. Ravishay, sir. CVR. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sir. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarada. You have told us the, the vivid picture about uh, the COVID, its manifestations, how to recognize clinically, all that. Very nicely said. Uh, my comment is uh, uh, nothing I am going to add. I am just going to tell you about uh, 
the practical problem what we have as you have said around 90% of them may be uh, may require only home quarantine around 5 to uh, the remaining 10% or uh, less than 10% may need hospitalization and only 1% of them may need uh, icu care okay picu care okay uh, my concern is those parents who are covid positive and having their children the problem for them they think their uh, child is asymptomatic and uh, when their child is totally asymptomatic they consider they are uh, covid negative they have tendency to send their children to the grandparents or to some other caretaker so this creates lot of uh, problem in uh, uh, in spreading this infection so the parents has to be properly advised and they ha- have to be imparted with proper knowledge i think so they should even uh, if the child is with them for all purpose we consider their children also covid positive covid positive whether uh, they undergo the test or not as you have said the pre symptomatic child and the asymptomatic children are highly infective so better to keep them with the parents with the regular uh, uh, method sms method as you have said the soap mask and social distancing has to be ma- managed at home itself there should not be any problem instead of sending these children to other caretaker or to the grandparents this is the major problem i am seeing in the community okay in fact i tell the grandparents to go for uh, uh, reversal of quarantine reversal quarantine the grandparents must go for quarantine from this uh, pa- this children okay uh, this is only the added comment i like to add and the red flag sign as you have said the red flag sign if it is there it is better to uh, bring the, those children to the hospital and the daily communication may be useful to manage them in uh, uh, initially they may be ne- needing the uh, uh, clinical uh, 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 they must be, come to the clinic and see them in the clinic and we can assess and subsequently we can follow them up in the uh, telecommunication methodology i think that's all just to add this point the reversal of quarantine is one of the thing that i have seen in my clinical practice thank you thank you sharda you have nicely depicted the whole story of uh, covid infection in the op as well as in the er thank you thank you sir thank you everyone thank you sir now uh, moving on to our next topic mis management i hereby call upon our speaker dr sandeep kumar who is a pediatric intensivist in pediatric advanced critical care center metha hospital the session will be chaired by dr annamala vijay raghavan sir senior consultant pediatrician metha hospital hello uh, good evening everybody i take the pleasure to share my slide and uh, start on with my presentation Uh, ah yeah. ya so today my talk of dis- uh, topic of discussion will be multi systemic inflammatory syndrome in children post covid 19 uh, infection mm. uh, briefly we are going to see the uh, definition of the disease epidemiology brief pathogenesis clinical features and uh, followed by management uh, mic as we all know was described since the first uh, covid 19 pandemic and has gained considerable interest seeing that the previously uh, normal healthy children are getting disproportionately sick even as compared to the covid-19 infection itself an initial case has been reported in uk italy subsequently from other uh, european countries and india also and most commonly we have seen this uh, children and adults and age group although various case reports are there uh, from the young adults as well as the newborns um, the case uh, definition uh, as per who says any individual more than a uh, younger than 19 years of age with having fever of more than 100.4 degree lasting at least 3 days with two of the following features like mucocutaneous involvement as rash bilateral non purulent conjunctivitis uh, hypotension or shock uh, myocardial dysfunction pericarditis or uh, coronary abnormalities evidence of coagulopathy acute gi problems along with elevated inflammatory markers like esr crp procalcitonin and others uh, no obvious other microbial cause of the uh, inflammation and the evidence of covid 19 infection uh, or uh, any contact positivity in the uh, 
known uh, any known contact positive with a covid-19 infection uh, as per epidemiology is concerned we don't have any uh, exact numbers of uh, exact incidence how uh, how the mic has uh, come across now but it is almost uh, one and a half year we are seeing this it has been said that it is a rare complication and it involves only 1% of the children who has been confirmed uh, who had confirmed information uh, infection by covid-19 uh it is still a rare uh, rare and it varies from race to race and ethnicity most of the study showed a lag of at least 4 weeks uh, from the starting of covid-19 case peaks uh here we will see briefly the pathogenesis uh, the main uh, uh, the main problem is here hyperimmune response which can be triggered either by the macrophages activation or by the macrophages activation which will lead to the activation of t helper cell followed by cytokine uh, followed by cytokine activation leading to cytokine release from and which will cause to which will which will cause hyperimmune response or or it can be due to the b cell activation uh, which will produce antibodies and hyperimmune response leading to multi systemic involvement in children this is the most acceptable uh, uh, theory uh, given so far so Uh, so far and uh, but it has not been proven yet this slide says that predominant involvement of cardiovascular system uh, around 2/3 of the patients respiratory involvement is also seen in uh, half of the patients skin and muto- mucocutaneous uh, involvement like rash uh, perianal erythema uh, conjunctivitis has been there uh, in up to 2/3 of the cases renal involvement yeah, gi symptoms are also seen in major of, uh, majority of the cases Uh, but these can be milder symptoms on presentation M- musculoskeletal system like uh, involvement like arthralgia myalgia or arthritis and some of the children they may present uh, up to 10% of the children they may present with headache irritability subtle changes uh, and subtle confusion seizures also is more commonly noticed uh, this is the cartoon which uh, which uh, shows the multi systemic involvement and now we can go into the clinical pictures here we can very clearly see the involvement of the oral mucosa con- uh, conjunctival bleed uh, polymorphous rash strawberry tongue uh, conjunctival bleed and in infants we can see polymorphous rash uh, all over the body also uh, so far we know there are various presentations uh, in mise most commonly seen in three categories ad like illnesses where the children may be having complete uh, maybe the criteria meeting to the complete or incomplete kawasaki disease and they do not usually develop shock the other group is febrile inflammatory state where the children may have mild symptoms with persistent of fever and they may have mild to markedly in, uh, elevated inflammatory markers uh, and the other group is which also makes a major group uh, that is severe mic here we can see uh, the children they may be having markedly elevated uh, Uh, markedly elevated inflammatory markers severe multi systemic involvement cardiac involvement and shock is very common and this group will involve toxic shock syndrome uh, acute covid-19 infection as well uh, and somehow they will be having features of secondary hlh also uh, this picture says the first uh, the top two pictures are uh, taken from one of our patient who was having a uh, normal ejection fraction uh, seen here but despite that he was having dilated coronaries uh, and it was more than z score of 2.5 which is significant uh, on the same on the same uh, uh, in a, in a same unit we have seen the other uh, group which has a good eject a poor ejection fraction of only 35% and dilated chambers uh, so they may present direct uh, to icu in or er in shock uh, so uh, since the uh, the more most of the understanding has come from our uh, one of the well known disease that is kawasaki will just go through this slide and see how these are two different from each other in mic the age of presentation is usually older kids like uh, mean age may be around 10 to 11 years however in kawasaki the mean age is uh, around 2 years of age here in kawasaki on on the contrary of mic the gi symptoms are less common uh, the liver the uh, inflammatory markers triglyceride crp d dimers are with markedly elevated in mic however it is not seen in kawasaki disease myocardial dysfunction and myocardial is very common in mic and in kawasaki disease uh, the coronary involvement is uh, more common
uh, here we can differentiate by seeing the plated count also the plated count which uh, may be low on the lower side which usually recovers with the recovery of the disease itself in mic and however uh, there's a thrombocytosis seen in uh, kawasaki disease uh, in this slide which will uh, the previous slide was about the differences in the kawasaki disease and mic the current slide shows the similarities how they both are similar so basically they have done a study which says that the cytokine levels which has been compared between three groups kawasaki disease mic and the healthy uh, healthy uh, controls they have showed that they are significantly elevated in kawasaki disease and mic which is not seen in healthy controls only few were the exceptions like interleukin 2 tnf alpha mip1 alpha and one mip1 beta this is the picture <clears throat> Uh, now we can come to the uh, how to uh, how to investigate and how to confirm the diagnosis so basically the children who are coming to icu with the low uh, with a, a, a low uh, index of suspicion they definitely should go through the first air investigation uh, which will tell us uh, uh, either they will be having lymphocytopenia or neutropenia in around 80 to 90% of the cases mild anemia is seen thrombocytopenia is very common uh, elevated Uh, inflammatory markers like high CRP, ESR, and DRIMERS, which will tell us indirectly to go for the second tier investigation. Also, uh, unless they present at, in shock at the first instance itself. The other uh, in, important values which we can uh, come across is high troponin values. Uh, VNPs are very high, uh, which will tell the cardiac involvement. Electrocardiograph, uh, echocardiography, which will uh, uh, on. Um, is is one of the important findings may be shown as depressed liver fun uh, depressed lv function left ventricular function coronary artery dilation z score of more than 2.5 and biochemical parameters may be having uh, hyponatremia hypoalbuminemia elevated uh, ldh and others mm -hmm. uh, the management here is uh, uh, we have to understand that most of the uh, kids who are coming without any uh, prior comorbidities or having uh, or they have been uh, all well prior to the illness they may show full and com uh, complete and uh, complete recovery both short term and long term that if, uh, the 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 mainstream of the treatment remains immunomodulation corticosteroids uh, and in some cases immune biological agents also others are supportive treatment like anticoagulation uh, uh, one to one basically we can decide on the remdesivir whether uh, can be used or not Uh, some uh, uh, basic antibiotics. Uh, this is one of the recent study which has pub been published uh, in JAMA, which uh, they have concluded that um, uh, they have concluded uh, that they do not, they did not find any difference in the outcome uh, when they have used IVIG alone, a combination of IVIG and uh, uh, and glucocorticoid or glucocorticoid corticoid alone. So they did not find any difference. However, the next study came uh, at almost similar timing, which has also studied the similar group, and they have told that uh, it was associated with the persistent, uh, uh, with the lower rate of persistent cardiovascular dysfunction as compared to IVIG alone. So, why the differences uh, here? We can see uh, they, these both study were done at a different places with uh, people having different genetic background, which can actually uh, differ their dis uh, immune response. the study was uh, done at different timing uh, in the first pandemic and the second the other study included both cases in the first and second pandemic here the difference in this regular here the difference can be there because of the dip, somebody scratching on my screen different strains are possible which will lead to the disregulated immune response um, re exposure prolonged exposure and repetitive exposure to the same or different strains are also possible the statistical methods which were used may also uh, lead to a, a variable results um, the one important thing which we should note that both of these uh, authors both of this uh, group of people they have not studied the long term outcome they have studied only the short term outcome uh, and this is one of the study which said that if we have given uh, a combination of methylprednisolone and ivig alone um uh, the better this is better for the fever in mic they have not spoken about anything else apart from the fever so how to proceed with the treatment part uh, basically we can categorize in two groups milder cases of mic and moderate cases of mic moderate to severe 
uh, in milder cases we can start uh, we have to admit them and send the investigation set of uh, send the tier 1 tier 2 set of investigation uh, empirically we can uh, consider starting of uh, broad spectrum antibiotics the uh, we have to cover for tropical infection especially in the country like india and considering ivig 2 grams per kg according to the ideal body weight over 12 to 24 hours the maximum dose being 100 grams uh, uh, gi prophylaxis uh, like proton bomb inhibitors are also recommended uh, here when we start steroids uh, in cases uh, which have still persistent fever but improving other uh, uh, other organ function uh, we may start with methylprednisolone of 1 to 2 kg gram per kg per day 1 to 2 mg per kg per day and the maximum dose is 60 mg per day which has to be tapered over two to three weeks uh, however on the other hand if the case if if we have got a moderate to severe cases uh, 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 who who are on oxygen support who require ventilation multiple progressive organ dysfunction we have to start from the same point from a to e we have to consider here here what how we have we are doing differently is IV IG 2 grams per kg along with the metal condition 2 mg per kg per day has to be started at the same time. Uh, for the refractory shock or the progressive multiple organ dysfunction, if it continues beyond 42 to 48 to 72 hours, uh, we have to consider first dose of methyl 10 to 30 mg per kg per day uh, uh, for a duration of maximum three days, then tapered over six to eight weeks. Uh, however, the discussion uh, goes on if the treatment uh, is uh, not responding or the uh, MIC has become refractive, we can look on the other causes also. Uh, antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation are most discussed area in MIC now. Aspirin uh, is one of the most common drug used and we can consider as using aspirin with the low dose, 3 to 5 mg per kg per day in, in the cases who, has, uh, who are having low cardiac output coronary or coronary artery involvement. The contraindication remains same if the platelets are less than 80,000 or is there any active bleed. It can uh, also be combined with the enoxaparin if required. And uh, we have to continue till four to six weeks um, until we see the normalization of the coronary artery if it was there. Uh, the second most important drug is enoxaparin. Uh, cases with high risk of thrombosis and marked elevated, markedly elevated D-dimer values and the cases having uh, coronary artery Z score more than five, some articles they have mentioned 10 also, uh, or having multiple or complex aneurysm, maybe uh, here enoxaparin may be considered. Moderate to severe LV dysfunction also remains one of the indications for enoxaparin. Now, how to plan for discharge and follow up? Uh, uh, once the child is clinically uh, doing well, if a while for more than 48 hours, no uh, more requirement of oxygen. And we have to see the biochemical parameters if CRP, D dimer, or procalcin, all of these are coming down, and there's no arrhythmia on ECG. Uh, and taking feeds well, we can plan for discharge. The follow up is usually uh, 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 there should be close follow up initially uh, at one week of discharge. Uh, we, uh, along with uh, the follow up, we have to get CBC and CRP done to decide on tapering dose of steroids. Uh, repeated echocardiography at one week uh, is required for all cases, uh, especially for those who has coronary involvement or LV dysfunction. And if it is normal and improving, subsequent, uh, subsequent follow-up may be at one and three, three months till uh, it is usually recommended till one year of age. Uh, so uh, previously we have discussed if there is no, uh, the cases presenting with no comorbidities, uh, but uh, many of the cases they may come with some comorbidities like uh, obesity, uh, 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 chronic lung disease, asthma, or some other cases. They may have something called long COVID disease. Uh, here, the basic thing is the if the duration of illness, starting from the uh, infection or onset of the disease till the recovery, if it is a prolonged duration, around 12 weeks or more, they may go for long COVID disease also. It is similar to MIC uh, uh, because all the manifestations remain the same. They may have neural uh, neurological involvement. They may have some neuropsychiatric behavioral issues. They may have uh, pro prolonged organ dysfunction as well. Uh, so with the next slide, we can just see uh, what are the diagnostic criteria. We may not go into so much details, but it's important to know that uh, uh, these, are, these are the cases uh, which may be having 
trouble in managing. They may require long-term follow-up as well as uh, monitoring. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. We call the chairperson to add the extra points. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandeep, for the excellent talk. You have talked about the MIAC, which is a new disease. You have given the definition, the epidemiology, the pathogenesis, clinical features, how to diagnose the condition, the investigations. You have touched upon the investigations and uh, the management also, and how to follow these children. And also uh, some a uh, slide about the long COVID, which is now seen even in children. Actually, MIAC, we have, uh, all of us, have seen children getting admitted with COVID only as MIAC because children with mild COVID, they were not getting admitted unless the parents have to be admitted, both the parents and the child also is positive. In such cases, those children were just staying in the hospital without any treatment just as, because there was nobody to look after them. But most of the experience which we had is only by seeing MSC, MISC cases we have seen about the COVID. And uh, you have touched upon the differences, the different phenotypes of MISC, which we should come across. And this is not the end. The last word is not yet told about MISC because many mimics are also there. We have to know about that. And uh, of course, any fever in our tropical country, we have to rule out the tropical infections and before we label them only as MISC, sometimes even both can occur together. That is what nowadays we are finding. And uh, children who experience severe symptoms or multi-organ system failure or severe symptoms due to this MISC, they should be managed in the PICU as rapid deterioration can occur. And the therapeutic approach and these guidelines are only to just help us, but they should be tailored depending on the patient's condition. Long-term follow-up is necessary for all these, as you have told. And of course, long COVID, one of the studies, they have shown that symptoms like insomnia was present in about 18%, uh, chest pain in 14%, nasal congestion, fatigue, muscle and joint pain in around 10%. So these things, uh, that study they had done after 60 to 120 days. So we should think about this also. Thank you all for the opportunity given. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep, for the talk. Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. Thank you, sir. It was an informative talk. We kindly request all the speakers to share a write-up of the presentation, which can be circulated to the delegates. I would like now to move on to the next talk, which is Spectrum of COVID-19 Infection in Ward or PSU by Dr. Muttaya Periyakarapan. He is currently the pediatric intensivist in Advanced Critical Care Center, Meta Hospital. This session will be chaired by Dr. Manoj Kumar, who is a consultant pediatrician at Meta Hospital Global Campus, Velapanchadi. Over to Dr. Muttaya, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jambi. Uh, next 15 minutes, I'll be walking through the experience of uh, managing these uh, acute as well as post-COVID uh, pediatric presentations in ward or in PIC. Uh, my agenda would be to deal with the usual presentation associated with hospitalization in acute COVID infection. COVID infection. Not the uh, like I'm, I will not I will not be dwelling into the severe spectrum the ARDS spectrum in acute COVID infection, as well as in the post-COVID MISC, the, the very severe patients, which uh, we don't see that commonly, which is out of the scope of today's talk. And even in post-COVID situations, there can be specific, which is MISC, as well as uh, there are many non-specific post-COVID associations. Some are known, some are unknown. And age or presentation-based clues, uh, we'll be uh, seeing that too. And the syndromic approach and the clinical dilemmas will be trying to solve the unknown questions. What helps in clinical decision making and the miscellaneous spectrum of what we see and the differences between the first and second wave. This heat map from a paper in uh, Nature uh, Journal shows us the symptoms with which acute COVID uh, patients present to hospital pediatrics. So we can see fever is common in all the in most of the age groups. 
but uh, coming to other symptoms like body pain uh, or uh, nasal symptoms are less in, seen in children cough is seen in many of the children in most of the age groups uh, and again headache is commonly seen in the elderly age group you can see around 15 years and in many of the uh, covid positive children we just they get just get admitted for severe headache so that is to be noted and uh, some children do have loose motion and uh, vomiting in all the age groups especially the younger one and the older one also uh, as far as breathing uh, trouble is concerned they are predominantly bimodal age group younger age below 3 years and uh, the uh, where it presents like a bronchiolitis or predominantly an airway disease and in the older age group uh, like rarely they may have lung involvement like adults so coming to the uh, case discussion so i have uh, discussed uh, some of the interesting cases which we saw uh, in this second wave predominantly so the first one was a 2 month 2 and a half months old male child which was referred as rt pcr positive to us a child had fever for 3 days and came with fast breathing and decreased in uh, decreased feeding for a day and the room air saturation was 94% at admission child was tachypneic had a uh, minimal work of breathing had bilateral wheeze and crepes and auscultation investigations revealed crp being uh, was negative x ray showed bilateral hyperinflation and ct uh, revealed focal ad trapping with atelectasis treatment this child received was high flow nasal cannula for uh, respiratory support for 60 hours followed by low flow oxygen for 24 hours nebulizations iv steroid dexamethasone and remdesivir as the child was hypoxic and was on oxygen support the length of stay was 6 days and in every case i have also tried to put some learnings from these cases because that's what is more important so what we learn from this child is like we remdesivir can be used in children with lower respiratory tract or significant parenchymal disease with hypoxia and always better to use remdesivir early in the course within the first week to 10 days of disease onset and this is a another uh, child how and this is actually is a confusing uh, scenario where we have a, a pneumonia in this covid era like a one and a half year old female child had a contact covid close contact grandmother and mother positive like one month back and also had a recent contact a week back who was a housemate now the child comes with a fever for 5 days cough cold for 7 days and fast breathing for 24 hours now uh, the investigations were non specific crp was uh, 32 was positive but rt pcr was negative and the ct chest suggested a core ad score of uh, 4 and a severity score of 9 by 25 that is 30% of lung involvement probably the diagnosis initially was viral pneumonia child received nasal prongs oxygen a remdesivir and other supportive measures the interesting thing is since the rt pcr is negative uh, do we take it as false negative or since the ct had similar uh, covid fine covid uh, suggestive of covid how do we go about it so what we do is we do an antibody in these patients because uh, that will tell you whether it's an acute that may reasonably maybe you know uh, like uh, help us to rule out acute covid like in this child covid antibody total and igg were positive and uh, the subsequent respiratory viral panel suggested of human metanemo virus so in this case what we learned was antibody levels help us to rule out acute infection and the pcr testing for other viruses and bacteria may help us in evaluating and coming to a final diagnosis and not only helps in uh, it also sees space to it, it, once the covid comes negative and antibody becomes positive we can move them out of isolation you know isolation beds are scarce at least in pediatrics now so ct is not routinely done for all the patients but in situations where there is severe hypoxia to prognosticate or to determine the course or in cases where you have to make a differential like uh, in this case like uh, it is very similar to many other viral pneumonias but sometimes it clearly tells you this is bacteria this is virus so that it also with that uh, we can take uh, help from the ct scan otherwise ct is not routinely done with pediatrics so yes now uh, coming to the msc presentation the post covid uh, which we are all interested in which was uh, in detail dealt in the last lecture so the classical and the commonest way how msc presents is with a negative pcr and with a positive antibody total and igg mainly uh we see that another subgroup which we are seeing nowadays in the second wave is the acute covid risk like 
where the child is covid pcr positive and just subsequently at the end of two weeks only becoming a uh, misc like having features of mis inflammatory excess so where the pcr and the antibody can be positive and another least common uh, group is the pcr and antibody negative but having all the clinical features and a a uh, recent covid uh, close covid contact which is the epidemiological link this is also rarely seen and the other interesting subgroup is the covid plus where uh, there is a undifferentiated febrile illness where in acute covid it can be a co infection or a mixed infection with some other uh, say bacterial infection or some tropical infections which we see where the pcr can be positive or in a post covid state where the antibody can be positive along with a new infection which the child has acquired post covid and this is interesting because many children don't behave the same way after a viral infection right add on infection behaves little in a, can be a bit severe so that's an area of interest now in the second wave so the spectrum obviously it has been dealt it can be a febrile inflammatory state it can be managed in opd uh, 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 a kd like illness which is more common in the younger age group less than 5 years shock with lv dysfunction with or without multi organ dysfunction predominantly in the older age beyond 5 years and another hyper inflammatory state uh, which is associated post covid which is like uh, have which can be uh, you know fitting into the criteria of hlh also so the common scenarios post covid like uh, the mase a 12 year old child having a close contact father positive 45 days back comes with fever for 5 days uh, pain abdomen severe pain abdomen for 3 days Uh, and some gi symptoms a uh, conjunctival uh, redness transient rash associated with fever they classically tell when the fever comes rash comes and goes off macular papular for one day the child uh, presents uh, presents with uh, uh, you know weak, weak peripheral pulses and hypotensive shock investigations revealed a platelet count of 1.2 lakh high crp procal ferritin was moderately elevated pro bnp was high trop i positive low albumin low sodium and here again rt pcr was negative antibody was positive the classical misc echo shows a global lv dysfunction uh, hypokinesia with ejection of 45% mild mr ultrasound revealed gallbladder wall edema ileal thickening with inflamed appendix so treatment yeah like any other shock we give fluid bolus but we we we, we are cautious here we don't give lot of fluid because there is associated lv dysfunction so uh, here we advocate early anotropes the child and uh, the good thing about uh, misc is although they progress very rapidly for mods uh, they with fluid bolus and early anotrope the you know, response is quite good within 24 hours most of them do well the anotropic requirement is usually between 24 to 36 hours uh, we also give ivig and uh, iv mps uh, for the uh, mase and heparin infusion for this child in learnings in this child is mase can present as acute abdomen but with multi organ involvement and some kd like features so usually this child if you isolated see it can be like a appendicitis also but usually appendicitis children don't have this other uh, you know uh, system involvement they may have high inflammatory markers but they don't have lv dysfunction unless you know there is a appendix which is ruptured and going in for uh, you know septicemia and something like that you don't see this uh, eye congestion or uh, lymphadenopathy or reddish tongue you know so that is a differentiator here which we have to be aware of so another uh, 13 year old obese 70 kg bmi 26 uh, child having a recent covid contact got admitted with a fever of 8 days all the other features of misc low urine output for 2 days presented with hypotensive shock again here the investigations had a normal uh, slightly raised wbc count low platelet high inflammatory markers uh, il6 of 286 urea creatinine in the child was very high like uh, he was having oliguric aki uh, low sodium and liver uh, involvement with low albumin also here uh, interestingly in the child rt pcr and antibody was positive and echo showed dilated coronaries with a z score of about 3 in the lad and ejection fraction was normal by uh, the echo was done 24 hours later uh, the official echo basically so the learnings from this case was sin infectious mis is possible like the second subgroup acute going into mis is possible obesity higher inflammatory parameters later presentation to hospital uh, low lymphocyte count below 10% thrombocytopenia below 1 lakh low sodium below 130 uh, 
hypoalbuminemia are associated with severe illness in MIS. And interesting thing is, EF improves rapidly post fluid bolus and iron flow. You don't uh, have a, like in this child also, you can see initially the EF was below 50%. Within 24 hours, it became 70%. And we can't even see a cardiomegaly in this X ray. But the coronary branches can be uh, still dilated for a longer time. That's why they need a follow up as highlighted in the last talk. This is another nine year old female, had a recent COVID contact, had fever for five days, pain abdomen for two days, another um, eye redness for one day, but no rash and no shock at presentation. CBC showed uh, low normal WBC, low platelet, high inflammatory markers, IL6 of 850, very high. Usually in MISC, we see below 500. Albumin is low. Peritin, interestingly, is very high. Usually in MISC patients, we don't uh, get above 2000. But here, the ferritin was very high, 22,000. Triglycerides were high, elevated, fibrinogen was low. Echo was normal. Ultrasound revealed uh, hepatosplenomegaly. Here again, RT-PCR was positive and antibody was positive. Another infection workup was negative. So this child, again, uh, it could be a, mostly a post-COVID uh, HLH, secondary HLH. That was the initial diagnosis. And learnings here were HLH is possibly a sequelae post-COVID infection in this child. Ruling out, the most important thing is we have to rule out other autoimmune and uh, conditions like lymphoreticular malignancies in such presentation. Because you have organomegaly, you have bicytopenia, you have, uh, you know, uh, many other features which could be like, uh, you know, uh, uh, mixing uh, like features of hematological malignancies. So only thing is inflammatory markers are quite elevated in such a presentation, which is a uh, important thing. And uh, interestingly, uh, like, like in the last talk, usually MASC patients require one to two mg per kg steroids, if at all they require. But here they require high dose steroids, like we may go up to 10 to 20 mg per meter square of dexamethasone or 10 to 30 mg per kg of methylprednisolone as, as per like, the patient needs. So coming into this MASC in the mix, one is the classical MASC which we saw, like having all the features, recent COVID contact, antibody positive. But what we learned from these cases is RT-PCR and antibody alone is not sufficient to rule in or rule out MAS. There are other interesting, uh, you know, infections, like an interesting group where, especially in our country, we have a lot of uh, other co-infections, which clinically mimic MISI. They can be infections, autoimmune conditions, or lymphoreticular malignancies. So in those cases, it's important to go by the natural course of the disease based on the day of illness, the response to the treatment, and Sometimes revisiting health history also helps. And also inflammatory markers or just CBC may or may not help. Disease specific investigations for uh, sepsis, tropical infections should be done in such cases. I, and in the bottom line is IVIG is safe first line treatment in whenever MISC suspicion is high, but in a critically ill child, especially when we see a lot of uh, clustering of MISC, no harm in giving one or two doses of uh, steroids. But before, you know, because most of these in, uh, like, you know, infection workup has a turnaround time of say 48 hours in most of the cases. Now this is a mimic one. I have three to four mimics before I wind up. So there is a nine month old uh, child male infant coming with no recent COVID contact, having fever for three days, GI symptoms uh, and lethargy, poor feeding, decreased urine output for a day, macular rash over the lower limb and abdomen. And at ER he was presenting with shock and severe dehydration with normal BP and low urine output. Investigation shows metabolic acidosis with bicarb of 13 and AKI here with a urea of 62 cleared of 1. Again, total leukocyte count was 25,000. Platelet was normal. High inflammatory markers and echo being normal here. Albumin is 4. The differential at the presentation could be like, you know, acute COVID abdomen or MISC or gram-negative sepsis with GIS focus. Differentials again, uh, like the treatment was initially dehydration correction with antibiotics and IVAG because suspicion of MIC was high. During the course, the patients, uh, you know, RT PCR and antibody came negative. Uh, the abdomen, you know, USG abdomen just showed bubble wall thickening. The final diagnosis was GI sepsis, but uh, we couldn't, the, the urine culture and blood culture were sterile, though. How do we arrive here? Because RT PCR and antibody is negative. There is multiple episodes of blue stool, which is uncommon uh, in MISE or acute COVID. There is, say, like, you know, 20, 30 episodes of blue stool. Severe, presenting with severe dehydration. Shock on day three of illness is a bit unlikely for MISE. 
high leukocyte count normal platelet normal echo normal albumin and no other kd like features uh, also helped us in coming to this diagnosis and also there was no anticipated fever developments to ivh the second case is a 8 year old child with no recent covid contact had fever for 4 days loose stool vomiting and pain abdomen for 3 days now the child was afebrile at presentation child presented with complicated shock decreased urine output lethargy had no uh, missy features as such clinically investigation showed cbc hemoglobin of 16.7 uh, low leukocyte count with a platelet of 25000 crp was negative and ferritin was 4000 and uh, other investigations were pretty normal lactate was poor some metabolic abnormalities were there usg showed uh, hepatomegaly gb wall edema interestingly in this child also both rt pcr and antibody were positive so could it be misc but actually it was not because i didn't give you this dengue ns1 report which was positive on day one only we we initially thought this could be dengue but actually is her rt pcr also subsequently came positive so the learning here is the clinical course difference like just fever for 4 days and child has already become afebrile which is not common with missy missy they, the fever continues uh, till we give ivg or steroids they don't come afebrile and during the afebrile phase child's clinical condition worsening which is also classical with dengue and hemoconcentration 16 hemoglobin negative crp which is unlikely to be missy and very low platelet count 23000 high ferritin Uh, and a shock with an arrow pulse pressure or suggestive of dengue cardiac involvement is usually not seen at presentation in dengue it is usually seen after giving fluid analysis and also in x-ray in many of the cases we can see right pleural effusion in dengue but not in dengue so antibody positive alone doesn't mean dengue we have to look at the clinical course also the third is a 6 year old child uh, had no recent contact fever for 6 days again having gi symptoms generalized rashes eye redness presented with complicated shock clinically fitting into all you know missy criteria uh, again investigations 11500 count platelet uh, low normal high inflammatory markers you know all l il6 555 a pro bnp of 2600 you know everything was suggestive of missy in fact rt pcr negative antibody positive echo showed moderate lb dysfunction eof of 40% mild mr normal for weeks what next we all were happy missy was uh, the diagnosis uh, and ivg mps was started simultaneously because he had lb dysfunction but in the course when we see the child fever was persistent and subsequently the scrub igm report came positive doxycycline was added on revisiting the history there was a significant travel history to a rural area near chennai it's tirutani and uh, the child had gone for goat rearing in the scrub in the in the bushy area so uh, what we learned is it is very difficult to distinguish scrub typers from missy always so we make it up uh, like you know like a unit protocol to send scrub igm for many of these cases adding doxy in when we are in uh, you know a significant suspicion and another important thing is revisiting the history like in this case uh, some some pa- patients may have a clear cut history also and and we all know escar and lymphadenopathy may be uh, difficult to find and uh, only only in 30 40% will be able to find and lb dysfunction is common in many conditions septicemia can have lb dysfunction uh, dengue can have lb dysfunction scrub can have lb dysfunction so it is a non specific finding but coronary changes are more specific for missy third is a, like last one is a 10 year old uh, which we recently treated a girl girl child with having a uh, fever for 6 days gi symptoms uh, epidosplenomegaly but no shock this child had normal uh, leukocyte count plated of 4.6 lakhs high inflammatory markers high dd dimer and a high ferritin also usg had hepatomegaly ileal wall thickening rt pcr was positive uh, subsequently antibody was negative and scrub was negative is this missy uh, we have some inflammatory thing going on febrile inflammatory uh, uh, infection going on clinical picture with rt pcr positive but antibody negative this could uh, this can be missy but uh, yes we also thought so but the blood culture after 48 hours came as salmonella type b positive so uh, the important thing is the course again this child again had persistent fever spikes despite the appropriate antibiotics which was complicated with a significant lower gi bleed so the final diagnosis was a uh, complicated enteric fever with acute covid a uh, covid infection so here the rt pcr positive was a innocent bystander uh, and antibody was negative and she drew salmonella type b so this is not missy 
So this is actually a COVID plus scenario where we have a co-acute COVID infection with a co-infection like enteric fever in this child. So the learnings is we have to start antibiotics, empirically in broad spectrum antibiotics in all MISI patients. And especially in this child, there is a normal platelet high lymphocyte count, which is both rare and MISI. So yes, and in this child, since PCR was positive, uh, we have to isolate this child also. And the CT had, uh, you know, findings of lower GI bleed. Uh, there is a contrast leak here in the ileocecal area. Uh, the radiologist told it could be a, a because of an ulcer or because of a, a mesenteric duplication cyst. But actually, we couldn't proceed further in evaluation because of the PCR positive state. You know, because it, the PCR positive state uh, kind of you know uh, becomes a, a problem in today today's clinical practice. We have to wait since this patient's lower J grade also settled. We have uh, kept them in follow up to evaluate later. The miscellaneous. This is another uh, interesting child. What are the miscellaneous post COVID patients which you commonly see? Yeah, two minutes. Yes. Yeah. So a ten-year-old child, obese child, having fever and uh, severe pain abdomen, presented to uh, casualty, having high counts, high inflammatory markers, severe pain abdomen, uh, made us do this amylase lipase, which came out to be a highly uh, like very high. USG had bulky abdomen. CT had features of necrotizing pancreatitis. This patient had a normal lipid profile and a normal uh, biliary tract anatomy. And other infections were negative. COVID RT-PCR was negative and antibody was positive. IgG was negative, suggestive of recent COVID infection. So the learning here is a commonly a single organ involvement. It doesn't mean it is missing. Uh, it is just a post-COVID association, post-COVID infection. The patient had pancreatitis, which many uh, of the uh, practitioners do report, like a lot of pancreatitis incidents, as well as type 1 diabetes incidents. In this child, obesity was made in high risk to have pancreatitis. So having a left pleural effusion and necrotizing, you know, pancreatitis here. You can see the uh, heterogeneous thing here with fluid collection. Other missing present, other miscellaneous presentations which we see with, with acute COVID are febrile seizures, uh, wheezing in a known asthmatic, head injury sometimes coming COVID PCR positive, paracetamol overdose coming as positive, and uh, just headache as I told you, intersusception uh, sometimes and other uh, like commonly and in infants and acute abdomen in older children and post COVID we see. DKA, uh, GBS, uh, some people have also seen leukemia, encephalitis like presentation with meningeal, meningeal signs, autoimmune encephalitis, and also myocarditis. So, what we have learned you in the second wave is we have become more wiser in treating acute COVID as well as MISI. High zero positivity in population makes MISC diagnosis difficult and making other like mimics also uh, are uh, creating a confusion here. Due to better awareness and early presentation, there is quicker recovery with lesser support okay. of ICU and reduced length of stay. Why do we have more respiratory involvement in this way? Probably overall cases were more and there is a immune escape mechanism due to mutation of strains and vaccination in the older age groups. So my take home would be there is a wide spectrum of pediatric uh, COVID uh, infections and the post COVID states, which is COVID plus, which will be dealt in detail in the next, uh, next talk probably. And there is a lot of missy mimics we have to be aware of the autoimmune conditions, hematological and infections we should not miss, understanding the age-based uh, symptoms, body habitus, comorbidity-based morbidity is, helps most of the time. PCR and antibody testing has become a routine in IP care for all children nowadays, both for deciding treatment and for deciding isolation principles. And the most important thing is COVIDology apart. We are all filled of COVID information. We should not forget what we know before 2020. When in doubt, ask the experts and go back to books from journals. Thank you. Uh, we call upon the chairperson, Dr. Manoj sir, to add on to the valuable points. Thanks a lot, Dr. Janvi. Thanks a lot, Mutaya sir, for the extended presentation. I think you covered everything in Sorry, uh, I overshot MIS. <laughs> Extendedly on uh, COVID, the MIS, COVID spectrum actually, especially, especially on uh, antibiotic necessity in COVID positive, most importantly on various disease manifestations uh, that COVID can do, importantly on the remdesivir, that the usage in early phase of disease, which was very important, and uh, not all pneumonias during COVID uh, pandemic is uh, due to corona, that is very important. Uh, on the importance of sin infection with the MIS. 
uh, it's very rare we have not seen but uh, it was nice sir during covid infection people presenting with mis and then post covid mis just to add on a note uh, we did see a few children who were admitted for just to for a poor oral intake and supportive care developing an unusual rash over the shin and elbows something like a vasculitis or a paniculitis rash settling very well with the disease process itself and with their topical steroids that's all sir thanks a lot sir thanks a lot for the excellent presentation thank you sir for the very in informative talk a uh, kind request for all the delegates to please mute their mics when the session is on and uh, all the speakers to please refrain from using any drawing tools on the screen chat uh, now moving on to our next session covid 19 in children new challenges i hereby call upon our speaker dr k sasidharan sir head of the department advanced pediatric critical care center meta hospital and uh, the session will be chaired by dr s tangvelu sir senior consultant and director pediatrics meta hospital over to you sir Geeta, stop the screen sharing. Close, close the screen. Dr. Sangeeta, Dr. John B. Close, stop screen sharing, ma. No, sir. Uh, sir, uh, have started sharing screen, sir. Sasudan, sir, has started. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Sir. Sorry. Uh, sorry for the delay. So. the previous speakers had set the stage uh, for uh, clear cut discussion on misc and what we see routinely in uh, uh, mild acute covid presentation in er and a very good review about the clinical case scenarios in pediatric covid so now we are going to discuss about the new challenges so this will be a clear continuation topic uh, to what has been already dealt by dr muttayya in the case scenarios so the new challenges i particularly put the date 256 because the new challenges may dynamically change because it's a very very new disease to all of us so what are all the clinical challenges whenever we discuss about pandemic there are two type of challenges you expect one is clinical challenges another is public health challenges i just focus on clinical challenges because uh, discussing about public health challenges may be much beyond the scope of today's discussion so why the clinical challenges happen in a new disease first of all it is a new disease all possible clinical presentations are not understood all possible disease trajectories are not understood and another most important thing is the long term complications of the disease nobody can even speak about it the evidence is currently evolving and an another denominator which is a commonest problem for any disease management the all guidelines have evolved from the experience of the west so uh, we may need to uh, concentrate on our own problems and we have to uh, create our own guidelines so the covid in children uh, next 15 minutes i am going to discuss about the clinical presentation and disease trajectories based on available evidence experience some amount of logical prediction and accommodating the concerns of a tropical country so when i say about uh, challenges there are many challenges we are going to concentrate discussing about the four questions and uh, we will try our level best to get into the answer how to manage undifferentiated tropical fever in post covid era uh, don't you think it is a million dollar question so everybody has already started asking questions related to this so when we say when we say undifferentiated tropical fever so we will start with a case scenario so 11 year old male child fever of 8 days duration noticed to have petechial spots all over the body for last 24 hours platelet at admission is 8000 and covid pcr is negative antibodies are positive De dengue igm comes positive in the pre covid era we don't have this covid antibody titer and we can comfortably diagnose this case as a dengue even clinically but now this covid antibody titer 
gets it all sent to a puzzle that whether it is a misc dengue or mix of misc and dengue same thing if you see the case scenario 2 9 years old girl child fever biphasic high grade um two days of fever 48 hours afebrile followed by five days fever treated with paracetamol im amikacin two doses in last 48 hours shock at presentation hepatomegaly evidence of free fluid in the abdomen and intermittent abdominal pain antibody titers positive we are started treating like misc and the culture shows salmonella typhi at the end of 48 hours these are all not the uncommon presentation nowadays so in this scenario how do we approach undifferentiated tropical fever so it becomes a little complex so we will try to uh, make it uh, uh, as simple as possible when there is a covid exposure in a child after some weeks of normalcy when the child develops fever uh, more than 24 or 48 hours no localizing features or non specific abdominal symptoms the pro- problem started happening the child may be having the denominator that is covid antibody positive state on the top of that the child may be having any kind of uh, undifferentiated tropical fever the so called it may be a mp smear positive vivax or mp smear positive for falciparum dengue igm positive that's a primary dengue disease or a scrub igm positive which uh, already dr muttaya has discussed about the case scenario and typhoid igm positive or salmonella typhi culture positive fortunately or unfortunately we have already seen uh, almost all of these combinations so in this case it uh, it becomes a little difficult and different to work up the patients for example whenever we look into a protocol the protocol says tier 1 investigations tier 2 investigations but unfortunately the thin line of tier 1 tier 2 merges within each other and it becomes a complete conglomeration of investigation you have a mandate to do otherwise you may not be able to differentiate these things what becomes a mandatory subset the tropical infection workup based on the epidemiological conglomeration of cases in your area some places scrub typhus may be more um, and some places typhoid may be more some places malaria may be more so based on that you have to create your tropical infection panel workup and you may need to do those in these patients to identify what is the mixed infection status the child is having can you leave misc that is again a problem we do not know the longevity of immune dysregulation followed by uh, uh, covid exposure so in that circumstance we may need to do many of the intensity assessment tests like ecg echo uh, bnp ferritin ldh fibrinogen d dimer pt apdt based on the criticality of the child at least if the child is admitted in picu most of the time the intensity assessment test may need to be done so in this case can we uh, still dwell on the diagnosis of misc or we need to move further to a uh, little um, uh, more insightful uh, uh, ap- approach on our undifferentiated tropical fever uh, this is a terminology we ca- we use uh, but it is not a standard terminology as of now by but i uh, strongly believe that uh, we have to start thinking in this direction so what is plus f this is a post covid less or undifferentiable syndrome with fever so this undifferentiable syndrome can be a severe dengue fever in a post covid state severe malaria typhoid fever scrub typhus or post covid immune or infection related uh, cns disease uh, so why it, why it is so important this is so important because this has already become so confusing and uh, uh, initially we thought that severe dengue is going to be quite confusing with covid misc but actually what has become more confusing is typhoid fever so many people who are listening to this presentation may might have felt already yeah truly in our area also the same thing happens so we all share the common thought process and uh, um, we have tried to give a little nomenclature and systemic approach method for the same thought process scrub typhus in post covid state that is also not uncommon post covid state immune or infection related cns diseases are not at all uncommon and uh, what we are trying to uh, uh, say uh, trying to co- convey by saying this misc versus tropical infection may not be a binary differentiation anymore whatever guidelines we have come across or we have been seeing it is too good that everybody try to accommodate tropical infection but everybody or every guideline directs us to differentiate misc versus tropical infection 
may be post second wave we may not be in the situation to differentiate mis versus tropical infection we have to move further from this binary differentiation and uh, more and more children are co positive now that is a very important reason that we have to move further so what are all the critical challenges in management we have to start understanding mis e as a post covid viral systemic vasculitis and with long term implication we do not know the longevity of the immune dysregulated state and there is a variable host response in this case antibody positive state with sirs we should move away from equating that from mis e at least for tropical country countries we may fail very badly if we continue to do this indications for mps plus f the plus f is post covid less or undifferentiable syndrome of fever need to be studied because the problem is for example if you have a child uh, like what i have discussed you are thinking that it is mis e the child is enough unaff- the parents are unaffordable you think that you give empirical mps and after 48 or 72 hours the blood culture comes salmonella typhi positive if the child develops a complication of um, uh, gastrointestinal uh, perforation what will happen so these conditions may not be very uncommon so it is better to understand and direct our investigations on these directions before empirically uh, treating many people on uh, steroid relook at iv mps empirical initiation before getting tropical infection panel report is very important at least the current guidelines clearly say that if you are not having tropical infection work up negativity in your hand better do not start on steroid and another very important thing maybe it is a different perspective and everybody has right to discuss on this it is time to work on reducing the tropical infection panel report turnaround time what is happening actually the two years old disease covid we can had uh, take uh, the pcr report within maybe 4 hours 5 hours in uh, metro cities and antibody report we uh, get in 5 hours 6 hours time period but the tropical infection panel um, we do not have such a short turnaround time every investigation come at a different timeline maybe in total if you want to get everything it may take uh, even 48 hours or more so it is high time to work and explore on some tropical infection panel pcr with a very short uh, turnaround time which will help in managing our patients properly this may not be the problem of the west uh, so it is very important that we have to start thinking on this direction okay the fever itself becomes such a big problem so what happens to childhood pneumonia so childhood pneumonia it is a very simple case two case scenarios as a platform to create a discussion it is a four month male child fever of two days rapid breathing of 24 hours vz at presentation to er after neb we have found the scattered crackles when chest x-ray says of pneumonia on sfnc the child is maintaining more than 96% rt pcr negative covid antibody is positive respiratory rt pcr panel rsv positive and strep pneumonia positive it is not negligible it is moderate positivity means that if it is clinically concordant it has to be taken as significant positivity so it is quite relevant so this child has a post covid state but the pneumonia which is unrelated to covid and case 4 is 7 year old male child fever of 5 days rapid breathing for 48 hours progressively increasing bilateral air entry good scattered crackle saturation in room air is 91% on a face mask it is 98% covid rt pcr negative antibody positive similar to your previous child and respiratory rt pcr panel says metanemo virus positive state so these kind of situations are not going to be uncommon so this is similar covid exposure has already been there after some normal time maybe 2 weeks or 3 weeks or 4 weeks the child develops respiratory symptoms <laughs> and respiratory distress the chest x ray shows evidence of pneumonia and in this case what happens is the covid antibody positive state uh, prevails so we are getting misdirected whether it is covid pneumonia or not when we do a respiratory viral or bacterial uh, viral plus bacterial panel pcr it yield the diagnosis so what we have seen in the subset till data is in our unit we have in our two units we have seen rsv infection metanemo virus infection strep pneumonia infection and klebsiella infection the spectrum may grow further and when h1n1 comes it may be uh, completely get twisted so we have to be prepared for that 
So in this case, we think that it is better to uh, use this terminology that post-COVID lesser undifferentiable syndrome with pneumonia, which is plus P. So the VC presentation may be in a viral pneumonia under five age group, just like pre-2020 scenario can happen, continue to. So the viral workup becomes very important. Mixed infective etiology may not be uncommon. And another very important thing is the specific subset patients, the patients who are um, uh, having a nephrotic syndrome or a chronic renal ailment or uh, medical technology dependent children, children with hematological or mineralogical or rheumatological ailments, post-solid or liquid transplant children, these children may have post-COVID state, develop immune dysregulation, and they may get predisposed to multiple viral or bacterial infections. So all these things require a different look to understand better and evaluate them better. So what will be the critical challenges? So our investigation panel is going to increase. That may be the major concern. So getting viral bacterial RT-PCR panel in all children is not very easy and it is not very cost effective. So we may need to find way out to do that um, or how to, uh, how to do that or at, at lesser cost. <clears throat> the third challenge what we will discuss is what will happen if acute COVID in children evolves to be severe? the million dollar question, the Delta plus issue, or whatever the variant which can cause the third wave. So if it happens, what would be the issue? This is very important, but uh, I think uh, this may be a relatively uh, comfortable question to answer because we have a very significant experience from adult. So acute COVID pneumonia, mild to moderate disease, which we have been um, uh, by God grace uh, seeing quite often in children, we have never, we have not seen very many severe disease cases, but if it happened so, what would happen, the trajectory? COVID pneumonia plus ARDS, acute COVID plus MODS, acute COVID MISC, these will become the clinical trajectory of the severe disease. What will be the critical challenges? Advanced respiratory support. Uh, but the support system and our protocols may not change much. Fluid optimization and pediatric shock management. Because of the cardiogenic component, we have to be very fluid sensitive in shock management. Other than that, there may not be major changes. Organ support uh, as uh, we do in a critical care, management of complications as we already do in a critical care. Me, sir, 15 minutes uh, over, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So two minutes. Uh, the fourth question, the final question, what we want to answer is, what is unknown in MISC spectrum disease? It has been very well covered in previous presentation. So uh, you know that post-COVID at any time from two to 12 weeks, now the timeline has been revised, two to 12 weeks, the patient can develop MISC. So uh, two to 12 weeks means acute COVID MISC is also positive. That's what the case scenario Dr. Mutaya has already discussed. And other scenarios, you know very well, um, COVID PCR negative and antibody positive, PCR negative, antibody not, not, uh, negative, but there is a strong contact with COVID. What we are worried is this, uh, the new condition, what we uh, started seeing uh, uh, commonly, COVID PCR positive, COVID antibody positive and contact with COVID. This um, is a little different. Uh, there is a pre-existing question whether uh, we need to use remdesivir here or not. The question is, uh, uh, as of now, not clearly answered, um, no, but this is a, a, re a remaining concern. When we see MISC, we all know it has already been alluded. Uh, the spectrum is progressively increasing. The meningitis like illness, atypical CNS manifestation, multi-organ dysfunction, these kind of spectrum, um, uh, maybe a life-threatening spectrum. So this need to be specifically concentrated and studied further. What is the take home message? COVID disease can lead to acute COVID disease or post-COVID systemic vasculitis. I would wish everyone to understand this as a post-COVID systemic vasculitis because it may be a long-standing issue. MISC versus tropical infection is not a binary differentiation. Plus F, that is post-COVID lesser undifferentiable syndrome of fever needs further evaluation. And plus P, that is um, we may have more issues in coming months if uh, H1N1 or other viral infections increase. So we have to get oriented to that to treat the patients properly. All post-COVID zero positive state should not be considered as equivalent to MISC. 
so uh, this is um, um, i i know that m- many of the listener might have felt that you are creating more confusion uh, to the already prevailing confusion but our intention is not to create for the controversy in the nomenclature but it is just a sincere effort to understand the next layer of information uh, in the the stirukural if you understand tottanai thoorum manatkeni maandarku katranai thoorum arivai means in sandy soil when deep you dwe- uh, delve you reach the springs below the more you learn the freer streams of wisdom flow this is a mandate that tropical country associated thought process we have to inculcate in the available knowledge which we derive from the west thank you uh, thank you dr sasidharan covid is inevitable trikural also for clarity thank you for uh, raising the future concerns of course it's not a today's concern it's definitely a future concern uh, uh, covid 19 is a pa- is a democratic disease unlike uh, typhoid and dengue which affects only the developing countries it is also affected both developed and developing countries that is why we got a vaccine within one year dengue still we are not able to get even after 20 years so it's a democratic disease it has affected other developing developed countries also but uh, problem is covid india may not be similar to covid usa or covid uk because we have our own problems couple of the tropical in which are the closest mimics for uh, um, mic and covid disease probably the time has come that we have to evolve our own guide lanes rather than looking upon the west that's what probably dr sasidharan wanted to raise and uh, show the concern so we have to bring out our own guide lanes rather than completely depending on western guide lanes thank you very much uh, sasi thank over you, to sir. the comparers thank you sir for giving us an insight into the future challenges i would now like to go on to the next topic neonatal covid 19 infection i'd like to call upon dr b arun krishna consultant neonatologist at metha hospital this session will be chaired by dr b lakshmi head and consultant neonatologist department of neonatology at metha children's hospital Good afternoon, sir. Shall I start, sir? Yes, Please, sir, you can start. You can start. <laughs> Uh, okay i'm going to talk on covid in neonates so the my topic is going to be divided in the following subheading initially by delivery room management postnatal care and epidemiology of the disease and what to do when the infant gets or the neonate gets uh, infected so not much of a change between the nrp 2020 and uh, guidelines and what to do with the mother with the covid positive except for a few tweakings like uh, delivery room should have a negative pressure isolation and uh, mother should wear a triple layer mask And, um, and there is a small confusion and uh, delayed cord clamping some countries uh, going for it and majority of the association are supporting it and infant should be transported in a separate incubator uh, preferably the resuscitation corner should be in the separate room in, in case if it is in the same room of the um, operating on the mother like it should be at least 2 meters uh, away from the uh, the mm-hmm. mother then uh, like uh, strict personal minimal personal sick pp and other things as usual for any other uh, uh, infectious disease we are handling here then uh, when to test a neonate and whom to test all these concerns like mostly all neonates born to the covid positive mother should be tested if the mother is positive within 14 days uh, prior to the delivery and we take a nasopharyngeal swab and all symptoms uh, symptomatic neonates who wear alternative diagnosis is not uh, uh, possible or uh, entertain should be tested irrespective of the mother status uh, why do we test uh, because to isolate the neonates uh, from the other uh, um uh, neonates and for the healthy uh, care means uh, um, healthy mothers and neonates and uh, the caretakers and family should uh, take for special precaution while handling the neonate and to also have a better understanding of the covid uh, in neonates so we do take test at 24 hours of life if the um, neonates is born to a covid positive mother and then repeat the test if needed uh, at 48 to 72 hours uh, if the first test is negative and asymptomatic neonates we can just skip the second test and there are some small changes in uh, guidelines by the nana <clears throat> all neonates who are symptomatic with the disease uh, 
which uh, suspected to have covid should be uh, with their alternate diagnosis not possible and the mother even though the mother is covid negative should be tested immediately and the repeat test should be done if the symptoms are strongly suggestive of covid postnatal care no, there are a lot of guidelines uh, most of them are similar except for few changes uh, ap strongly prefers to room in the neonates with the mother but uh, canadian guidelines says that we have to discuss before uh, the risk and benefit before uh, the shifting the baby to the mother side chinese russian uh, literature or like uh, strict separation of mother and the neonate till the mother is considered non infective breastfeeding and express breast milk like um, if the mother chooses to breastfeed after discussing uh, with the possible benefits and uh, disadvantages uh, the mother should uh, allow to be breastfeed with proper precautions uh, and in case the mother doesn't choose we can have a, a express breast milk and that can be given by the healthy caretaker so these are the three possible days mother uh, wishing to breastfeed the baby can breastfeed in the room um, and she can separate from the baby at least 2 meters uh, when she is not be uh, feeding during feeding she can just do uh, proper precaution like uh, mask gloves and other things and uh, feed the baby in case uh, she doesn't wish to have the baby in the room we can uh, she can express the milk and give it to the caretaker who can just feed the baby if the mother's milk is not available we can go for pasteurized donor human milk duration of isolation or protective precaution for the mother uh it gets uh, somewhere between 10 to 14 days from the onset of symptoms or uh, rt pcr positive and cdc says 20 days if the mother is severely affected and uh, she should be at least 48 hours uh, uh, a febrile uh, if she is uh, stopping the isolation or protective precautions repeat rt pcr for the mother for stopping the protective precautions is usually not practiced so isolation uh, for the uh, baby uh, is also needed like infant born to mother suspected of a confirmed covid should be isolated from the healthy mothers and the neonates and um, in some places a uh, nic may be the suitable environment so cdc says that uh, best place of placement of the neonate uh, for a baby born to covid positive mother is should be they, they taken at the facility base level so previously thought uh, since uh, neonate are not going to transmit the disease because they have a very uh, low tidal volume so they don't have adequate uh, um, ability to uh, cause case and uh, aerosol generation so there are case reports where they have uh, significant viral load and this is uh, from manicule based study assessment from a university of nottingham where they can just show the, the significant aerosol generation by a, a, a mannequin of size of a neonate um if the neonate is roomed with the covid positive mother and the other neonate is covid uh, positive they should be isolated for 14 days and uh, caregivers should take protective precautions and if needed for a nic admission for any other reason covid or non covid causes uh, should be put in a separate uh, isolation modes of transmission um it can be like either a intra uterine post uh, in, intra partum or post partum okay, all three these thought possible so vertical transmission is reported as early as in december 2019 and the rate of transmission is very low so the detection rates and since most of them are asymptomatic this may not properly tested vertical transmission somewhere between 2 to 3% and incident of covid neonatal uh, neonatal covid in uh, is around 5.2 per uh, 10000 live births and these are the various studies available somewhere between uh, a baby having a covid born to have a covid positive mother the somewhere between 3 to 10% chance the baby is going to be covid positive the clinical manifestations are uh, very overlapping with the general uh, diseases of neonates of prematurity can be temperature instability respiratory distress gastrointestinal symptoms lethargy poor feeding and it's been shown associated with perinatal asphyxia and prematurity so symptoms again onset of symptoms varied some uh, the cohort says is less than 7 days some of the cohort somewhere between 9 to 14 days yes uh, it varies uh, with the cohorts and we are not very sure when it's going to present and uh, 15 to 30% of the neonat may have uh, may require some sort of positive pressure ventilation so laboratory is as like any pediatric or an adult case like they can have lymphopenia leukopenia thrombocytopenia elevated inflammatory markers all those things are possible elevated pro bnp dimers and there are few other parameters like uh, in fraction shortening less than 10% is showing as such a poor prognostic factor tap c less than 3 or dilated coronaries are poor uh, prognostic factors and a role of remdesivir in neonates uh, very less studied but uh, it's not fda approved but few case reports are available for now optimal timing and dosage of remdesivir it seems to be relatively safe in neonates there are uh, two doses available one is like any uh, baby less than more than 3.5 kilos uh, 5 mg per kg on day one followed by 2.5 mg per kg for four days and another alternative uh, thing for any baby is less than 3.5 uh, based on three cases 
that's like uh, 2 kilos 2.4 and 2.8 they have suggested they have suggested uh, a 2.5 milligram per kg on day one followed by 1.25 milligram per kg for four days uh, but other uh, there are other few case reports they have used uh, the full dose like 5 milligram per kg followed by 2.5 milligram per kg for four days even for smaller babies we have used uh, for on two babies remdesivir 5 milligram per kg uh, followed by 2.5 milligram per kg even for a baby which is less than 3.5 kilos uh, seems to be relatively well tolerated. Not much of a drug-related side effects have been noticed in all of the cases. Neonatal uh, inflammatory syndromes uh, is quite rare. A few case reports are available. No clear uh, criteria, mostly adapted from the CDC and WHO pediatric guidelines. These are the following um, case reports available. So roughly around, uh, say, uh, four to five, uh, uh, maybe six case reports are available in the literature. So management is like, um, very uh, varied uh, if it is RTPCA positive, just try on the, mostly they have tried on the compassionate ground or uh, for this, uh, they have no other way. So they have tried remedesivir uh, with whatever existing dose they can be available on the literature. The steroids like dexamethasone or uh, medicine always has a um, varied uh, discussion because dexamethasone has been used for a lot of other various usage uh, indications in unit. So neonatologists are more uh, you know com comfortable in uh, using dexamethasone. And the, but in our unit, you use methyl prednisolone at the rate of 1.2 uh, 1 to 2 milligram per kg uh, per day. So one case from Kochi, they have used up to 5 milligram per kg per day. IVAG around 2 milligram per kg per day for so two days. Again, anticoagulants, heparin or tocenoxaparin. So again, not very well defined. Heparin is used between uh, 10 to 15 units per kg per hour and anoxaparin between 0 0.75 to 1.5 milligram per kg per day. Uh, duration of steroids variable, most reports somewhere between 7 to 10 days and tapered with oral pregnancy over 7 days. Yeah. Uh, size of steroids are also uh, controversial as I've discussed and uh, uh, methyl prednisone seems to offer better uh, benefits based on the RCTs in adults. Now, again, choice of anticoagulants, separin versus uh, anoxaparin, not much, very much, and duration of anticoagulants also not defined with a newer onset of uh, arterial thrombosis later in the course of illness and also bowel ischemia has been reported. So how long to continue the anticoagulants? Should we add uh, aspirin or should we just keep uh, what to do when there is a discoagulation like bleeding along with gangrene? And there is one case report which they have used when there is a gangrene along with the bleeding. Uh, they have continued uh, anticoagulants along with FFP and inject, uh, uh, vitamin K injection. So not very much uh, well defined these areas. These are the pictures not from our unit, from the other case reports like uh, arterial thrombus in the hands, and uh, arterial drum uh, causing uh, skin gangrene and other things. So they have even tried uh, injecting uh, nerve blockage for uh, blocking the sympathetic activity to save the lymph. These are things that have been tried in other units. So in our unit, we had 113 units born to COVID positive mother. 11 were positive and uh, 10 vertical transmission and one postnatal. Six were uh, symptomatic and two had uh, COVID-related uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And three units, they were RTC, RPC and negative, but they had um, antibody positive with some neurological manifestations like asphyxia, neural seizures, and grade one IVH. So these are the neonatal manifestations that are slightly different in infant bonds to COVID positive mothers in second wave. Uh, so uh, we had around 10 cases who had a different uh, presentations like uh, unexplained uh, high drops, unexplained LV dysfunctions, cause seizures for which we could not find a cause. They were all uh, born to COVID positive mothers. And uh, these happened very early in the year, like around uh, Jan 2021, December 2020. So we were really didn't look into the antibody uh, per se in these babies. But uh, retrospectively, after seeing few cases now, there is a possibility because these things are, babies are born to COVID positive mothers. They can be associated with it. We are not very sure. So we have changed our unit policy in testing aspects. And uh, we had uh, around the three cases of uh, neurological manifestation in neonates with the COVID positive mothers. Like uh, one with the, uh, and, uh, like uh, one, one had a seizure at uh, uh, three, four hours of life. One was an asphyxiated baby where which, uh, there is no perinatal event uh, happening with the normal uh, CTGs and other things. They were severely asphyxiated, uh, went on to have therapeutic cooling. And one had an, a late preterm having a uh, grade one IVH, which is also very rare. Uh, so these are the pictures like uh, all these babies are born to COVID positive mothers and the babies are antibody positive, but not very high. It's like somewhere between three to 10. So we don't know if it's just an innocent bystander or uh, just an association with a COVID positivity or it is just really uh, causing all these things. And uh, there are two cases of uh, neonatal MIC. Uh, one is a fetal MIC and one is a neonatal one. 
both of them had 90 percent lung involvement and uh, elevated ele inflammatory markers which treated them with the remdesivir uh, methylprad ivig and heparin infusion followed by anoxaparin so this is the first case uh, which changed our perspectives in uh, uh, testing all other babies so this baby was an iugr 1.3 kilos uh, a twin baby uh, it shifted here for uh, hypoglycemia baby mother was covid positive the other twin was covid positive this baby was covid negative uh, on day one and uh, got discharged at uh, day three against medical request got admitted on day four uh, where, um, because it was lethargic uh, suspected to have a late onset sepsis but all the other things are uh, this one covid was also negative on day four so the way we had an acute kidney injury and pds so we are treating symptomatically the baby continued to be on uh, ventilation um, so we again tested the baby on uh, covid it turned out to be positive with, a, with elevated inflammatory markers and the uh, ct was showing 90 percent lung involvement requiring very high pressure ventilation so uh, after three four weeks uh, we were not able to save the baby and um, this baby led to uh, more uh, awareness about uh, mic in, uh, units, in our unit so this is the other one where we had a baby, uh, baby on day one with mother was covid negative but uh, a 37 week are requiring two doses of surfactant unusual presentation with a very bad lungs and 100 percent fao requirement on mechanical ventilation uh, maybe we thought uh, we should be looking into covid uh, in this baby which turned out to be positive and uh, we retrospectively we looked into the mother again uh, mother was rt pc and again negative but antibody levels were elevated so 36 hours we came to the conclusion of uh, baby is covid positive with lung involvement and with the elevated inflammatory markers so we started on the ivag heparin uh, and steroids so and baby was also positive but it's positive for igm most of the other case reports says igg but baby has its own uh, uh, probably baby got infected in utero and produces own inflammatory response so d dimer continued to rise and we Discharge the baby with oral prednisone and anaxaparin on day 11 of life. Baby is doing well on the follow. Uh, these are the two CT pictures. The one, this is the first baby. First one is for the first baby, and second one is uh, for the second baby. Uh, both are having severely uh, affected lung. And uh, this is uh, for the second baby. The coronaries are normal. Uh, one is uh, showing the LAD and the LMC, left main and left anterior descending. So our unit policy has been slightly different from uh, what it was in the beginning of the year. So the babies are uh, roomed in, uh, born to the COVID mother are roomed in and after uh, getting a proper consent from the mother, we just asked the parents regarding the rooming and tell them about the ad uh, advantages and disadvantages. The sick babies obviously is going to go for the NICU isolation. For the mothers, uh, COVID reports are available. We have to discuss with them. If they want to have a temporary isolation, till the reports come, we do that and then room in based on the reports. All babies bought, uh, bought from outside are obviously taken as uh, highly suspicious. So uh, they will test them, we isolate them till the reports are negative. So uh, regarding antibody testing, based on the previous uh, like list of 10 cases which we have discussed and uh, the new uh, two MIS, MISC presentation in our unit. So we have tested, uh, started testing babies who are having atypical clinical cause in neonatal disease or unexplained LV dysfunction, dilated coronaries, or unexplained high drops or elevated inflammatory markers for which we could not find an alternative. Explanation, we started testing for antibody levels in both baby and the mother. So, thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope I finished on time. Thank you, Arun, uh, for an excellent run through all the aspects of neonatal COVID, which we face from the labor room until discharge. Though he was in a very fast forward mode and somebody had commented a little bit slower would be better. Yes, ma'am, because I was trying to yes, put it in because the, of the time constraint and we had to pass on the message of everything concerned about COVID. Having said that, things are very not very discreet and clear cut as we think it is and there are a lot of grey areas which we are learning from the second wave. First wave, neonatal wise, we did not have any trouble and all the babies behaved very well and all the babies were asymptomatic and we got a very uh, nice feeling. Whereas with the second wave, we are totally caught off guard with a myriad and a variety of symptoms from the delivery room, from the mother being positive, from the mother being negative and baby behaving weird. It's like Arandavan Kanna Kirindadalam Pei. Anything, everything now we are only thinking about could it be COVID, could it be COVID. Having said that, we should not miss the regular things. So delivery room criteria is very, very important and we, it has to be in a separate room. If not, at least two meter gap. That's very, very different. And regarding when to test, what is the transmission you're suspecting? If you're suspecting an in utero transmission or a vertical transmission, within 48 hours, you can do the test. If 
no in utero transmission or if the mother is positive in the last 14 days and it, you think it is a peripartum transmission you wait for 5 days and test or any time you feel the child is symptomatic please don't go wait go ahead and test your rt pcr still that is the gold standard then rooming in has to be practiced even if the mother is positive we have to room in the baby with the mother of course we have to talk to them and explain to them get a consent there should be uninterrupted breastfeeding should be practiced with all due precautions like triple layer mask hand sanitization surface cleaning etc if you have a good covid negative attender very well done so the breastfeeding should be uninterrupted if the mother is sick or if the baby is isolated you can get a donor milk or if the mother can express and give breast milk that has to be continued so if the baby is asymptomatic we are no investigation is done other than covid rt pcr if you suspect perinatal transmission transmission 5 days or if the covid had already occurred before delivery then within 48 hours or if the baby is symptomatic any time otherwise asymptomatic baby we do not do any testing we try to room in with the mother if not with the mother baby can go home early by 48 hours or get discharged along with the mother so for symptomatic baby any time you feel the baby is symptomatic please go ahead and test an rt pcr there is lot of gray areas like how you say in adults this first 5 to 7 days is viremic and then you get the miss send we call it miss send in unit which may take at least 2 weeks following exposure to covid this sort of discrimination we are not able to come across so when a baby we had a baby first covid test mother positive first test negative crashing in fifth day again rt pcr negative but 48 to 72 late hours later as the symptoms worsened the baby became positive but at the time all features of missen was classically there we are not sure this baby is in viremia or in missen so whether to use steroids in the viremic phase or hold back steroids whether to use remdesivir in this thinking it is a viremic phase or wait thinking it is a missen phase again these are the two gray areas in differentiating the viremic and the missen phase in between all that there are all the routine problems of a neonate like an rds needing ventilation surfactant a huge duct causing a problem a persistent pulmonary hypertension causing a problem how to differentiate this from missen is again a big challenge for us the role so always if you are suspecting missen despite all this IVIG has been standardly used steroid has been standardly used and thrombolytics have been standardly used remdesivir there are very very few case reports where they say on compassionate ground if you still suspect this baby has got a strong correlation with positive rt pcr and if you still suspect on compassionate ground remdesivir can be given one important aspect which he has been touched is the immunization all babies can take their immunization as per their routine chronological age even if they had received a short course of steroid or a short duration of ivig so we are still learning a lot from the second wave is much more different from the first wave most of the answers will be getting later so many babies with myriad of presentation we couldn't explain we go ahead and do an antibody the mother does not even report an infection but the babies are having high antibody positive presenting with asphyxia presenting with fetal growth restriction presenting with adverse pregnancy outcome so we still have a long way to go and we keep learning with uh, every baby and i thank uh, the department for giving us the opportunity to present questions are welcome thank you ma'am thank you ma'am so for your interesting and informative session Now moving on to our next session COVID-19 in adolescents and young adults in ICU I hereby call upon our speaker Dr S Jagannathan sir head of the department intensive care in Meta Hospitals this session will be chaired by Dr N Kanan sir consultant pediatrician and medical director Meta Hospitals over to you sir thank you sir
Can someone share it? May audible? Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. Okay. Uh, no, get it shared. Sorry, one minute. Yeah, thank you. I'm getting it. Is it there? No, sir, not yet there. Sir, can, no, sir, you cannot see the slide. Though. Still not there? No, sir. Sir, you can send the PowerPoint. I have sent, you, I have sent it to a mail. Already sent it to a mail. How it is there? Yes. It is there? No. Sir, I'll share it to us. Okay, fine. Sir, you can stop sharing soon. Okay. Is that fine? No, so we are still sharing. Wow. Sharing, Jagan. Jagan, you are sharing. Uh, you have to stop sharing. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Oh, no. Stop. No, okay. Jagan. Good afternoon all. I would like to thank the Thangabel sir and the entire pediatric departments for giving me this entire opportunity. So this is about adolescents and young adults in COVID ICU. Why this topic is very important? As we all know, first wave, we still remember the first wave, only elder patients with multiple comorbidities had mortalities. The second wave, almost elder patients are not that much affected. The younger ones have been the one most commonly affected. If at all, we would like not, the third wave should not come. If the third wave comes, probably the age may come down. Almost all 15 to 17 year old children are now more than 60 kgs. So they will all behave like young adults. So that is why it may be important in the coming future. Okay, next slide. So young adults, so the young adults coming to ICU, they are mostly around 25 years of age. Almost always they are obese. Most of them don't know that they have borderline diabetes. So after coming here, when we measure the glucose, it will be very high. Interestingly, almost all of them are non-smokers. Next. So presentation into the ICU has got only two variants. One, there are early presenters. The other one is late presenters. Early presenters, typically, they admit, get admitted in the ward early. They deteriorate around day five to day 10 of illness, followed by cytokine storm with elevated markers. Late presenters, they usually have home quarantine advised by some doctors. They will be at home. Suddenly on day 12 to day 14, they will have breathing difficulty. Mostly they have cytokine reactivation syndrome with elevated markers. They come to ICU, almost they come to ICU straight away from home. Next slide. So I have, I, I'm trying, I have tried to discuss two case scenarios, one for early presenters, the other one for late presenters. So scenario one for early presenter. So this gentleman is a 29 year old patient. He was obese, he is a karate master. So he had fever for four days. He took a class, karate class on day three. So day four night he started, he got admitted on day four morning because of the body pain. So he was tested positive. Day four night, I went and saw the patient. He was on two liter oxygen sitting and eating normally with a SPO2 of 96. Next day morning, that is 12 hours later, I went and saw the same patient. That patient, because they call it like patient is having severe breathing difficulty. That patient is on 16 liters oxygen with SP out of 69. So we rested the patient to ICU, we started him on BiPAP. Next. So this was a CT scan taken on day five. Next. So the clinical course is like this. So patient was started on HFNC with 60 liters, SP out of 100%. So this patient was kept on awake counting for almost 20 hours a day. He's the most cooperative of all the patients which we had. So almost for next three days, his highest SP out was 86 with 100% oxygen. So patient was started on antibiotics, idosutamine C. He was not started on demodesuit because at that particular point of time, this demodesuit was not available. 
So then patient was put on immunomodulators. These are our combination immunomodulators we use for any patient who is on cytokine storm to our unit. So we started on IVIG, Bastnib, Vivacizumab, and Uranostatin. So symptomatic improvement happened 48 hours post three days. Patient got discharged on day nine of ICU care with four liters of oxygen. Next. This is the second scenario patient. This patient is a 24-year-old female with 13 weeks amenorrhea. Patient was obese, morbidly obese with type 2 diabetes. So patient was on home quarantine till day 13. Day 13 of illness, patient had breathing difficulty admitted on the ward. This is typical late scenario presentation. Patient was on 8 liters of oxygen with respiratory rate 30. Next day, patient, I was called to assess the patient. In the ward, patient had a respiratory rate of 55, SpO2 of 95 with 15 liters of oxygen. This patient again shifted to ICU. Next. This is the CT chest of the patient. You can see like almost most of the lung has got already consolidated and very few areas have got a new active disease. Next. So clinical course, exactly same treatment as scenario one, except this patient could be put in prone hair. If she was morbidly obese, proning was not at all possible. So there was much, not much clinical improvement for 48 hours. CRP was still rising. Culture was negative. Procalcitonin is 1.8 only. So this line is the most controversial line. Probably I'll try to explain it later. Antibiotics stepped up even though procalcitonin is negative and culture is negative. With the dual antibiotic, patient was started on meropenem and lenisulate. Within 24 hours, patient improved symptomatically. Steroid continued for 10 days. Patient discharged day 10 from ICU. Next. Management strategies. We have two kinds. One is standard treatment. The other one is game changes. Standard treatment, almost all of them are put on oxygen therapy with HFNC, proning, antibiotics, sedation, anticoagulants. We also use steroids regularly and also immunomodulators. Next. So coming to oxygen therapy, so HFNC is most preferred. So we can increase oxygen 100% comfortably. It is easy to prone. This is more important. You just prone the patient for three days, you'll become all right without anything. Work of breathing is very less. Patient can eat, speak, and BiPAP is usually preferred only in the presence of cardiac failure because it can provide more PEEP. We all know like HFNC can provide PEEP of maximum of 5. BiPAP can provide PEEP up to 10. Proning. So this comes the toughest part. So and, and this is the most rewarding part too. So with respiratory rate more than 45 and extreme anxiety and fear of death at that 25 years, it is almost impossible to prone. So proning and pseudoanalgesia go hand in hand. In hand. Each ICU should have individualized sedation protocol. So most important is repeated counseling. You won't believe we counsel patients every second hour for proning. We show them the monitor. We say like, this is how improvement happens. Usually most of them, they comply. Next. Steroids, we all know it is indisp indispensable group of anti-inflammatory drugs, but combination therapy with immunomodulators, immunomodulators does wonders. So we use one milligram per kg methyl prednisolone. I'm not going deep into steroids as most of the other presenters have done it. Next. So immunomodulators. So why I'm so happy about this is it is really a revolution ahead. We all know like till two years back, FDA has approved only three monoclonal antibodies for infectious disease. For infectious disease, only three have been approved. So past two years before they have approved COVID. And I can tell you a decade from now, we'll be dealing only with monoclonal antibodies instead of antibiotics on infectious disease. Next. So immunomodulators, what we use here is tocilizumab, bevacizumab, vasinib, sorry, vasidinib, IVIG, thymosin alpha, and ulnastatin. Next. So tocilizumab. So even though second wave, we didn't have access to tocilizumab, we used it regularly in the first wave. So this is a trial produced by recovery group, the same recovery group which did trial with dexamethasone. It's a specific IL-6 receptor blocker. It works extremely well when the patient oxygen requirement suddenly rises. It improves oxygenation and it improves even shock. We have used it in more than 74 patients in the previous one, and we had 10 mortalities in that. Next. So the good news is the same recovery trial group is doing trial in pediatrics for tocilizumab. The result will be there in another one month. So as of now, the trial says like pediatric patients are well tolerating tocilizumab. The doses are there. If it is going to be less than 30 kg, probably 12 milligram per kg will be the dose. Next. Bivacizumab. So bivacizumab is a vascular endothelial growth factor antagonist, anti-VEG. VEGF. So we all know VEGF is the main 
one which which increases vascular permeability in the lung. So by giving bevacizumab, it prevents pulmonary mucus exudation. It's a single dose drug with 7.5 milligram per kg. The good thing is it improves oxygenation and also yearly radiologic clearance was there. So next one. This is the study which was done in only 27 patients uh, in China. So of the 27, 26 patients. So they have published the results and day 14, most of the patients were off oxygen. At day 28, only two out of 26 patients still required oxygen. So this is the only study which is available with bevacizumab. Next. So our experience with bevacizumab is we have already used it to 30 patients in the past three months. Since bevacizumab is not available, if it started in early phase, when the ox oxygen requirement suddenly goes up, it really works well. It imp improved oxygenation, radiological recovery is much better. What we uh, experienced is most of the patient treated with bevacizumab have continuous cough for almost three to four days. And uh, we had few flare up of secondary bacterial infections, but we didn't have a choice. Next. Bosnib. This is the only paper available on Bosnib, which says like when Bosnib is given along with remdesivir, it blocks the viral replication more effectively. So it blocks the immune cascade in cytokine storm. It's a Janus kinase inhibitor routinely used in rheumatoid arthritis patient previously. Next. So IVIG, it's not only used for its uh, immune booster effect, it is used for immunomodulatory effect to prevent cytokine storm. Personally, I am a very great fan of IVIG. It has saved. Sir, yes, you are unmute now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, yeah, yeah. So, thymosin alpha is used for its immune boost effects. It causes hypermaturation of CD8 and CD4 and natural killer cells. So, when lymphopenia is very high, if you use thymosin alpha, it really helps us. Ulnastatin, we all know previously in adults, we were using it for pancreatitis. It has got wide variety of action against TNF alpha, EL6, 2, and 8. Next. So, our experience, so this is more important. Timing is everything in COVID. So if we miss day one of cytokine storm, nothing is going to work in day two and day three. So cytokine storm, we usually assess by clinical parameters that is rapid increase in oxygen requirement. Say the scenario one patient which deteriorated within 12 hours, raise in CRP, IL-6, we take everything into account. So second wave, I've got lots of changes in our treatment protocol because of non of tosilizumab. Next. So this is how our protocol works. If there is rapid increase in oxygen requirement, if the inflammatory markers are high, if procalcitonin is negative and there is no thrombocytopenia, then we'll start using immunomodulators along with steroids. So bosnib with remdesivir, bevacizumab, we give single dose 400 milligram. IVAG, we give one milligram per kg in three divided doses. You will not start in two, two, two lakh international units BD. We all give it as a combination protocol. Next. So now comes the most important and controversial part, antibiotics in cytokine activation syndrome. So one good part with the cytokine storm in COVID in adolescents versus HLH is at least in adults, it affects only lung, other than like uh, unless HLH, which affects every part of the body. So for pediatrics, you have to wait and see. So cytokine reactivation syndrome occurs late days, mostly due to secondary bacterial infection. The problem with this is almost 10 days, they'll be treated with steroids and some immunomodulators they are almost always prone for infections. So the problem with it, cytokine reactivation syndrome is, it affects the body which is already damaged by drugs, by like previous cytokine storm, and also our own treatment. So antibiotic plays a very crucial role, even though procalcitonin is negative, cultures are negative, it's a state of immune dysregulatory syndrome. So if you feel this patient has got infection, you should start them on antibiotics. Next. So this is the same patient on day 21 of illness, that is day seven of ICU. So there was no fever, CRP from 12 raised up to 34, procalcitonin negative, NT pro BNP was normal, X-ray taken showed like this, oxygen requirement increased from 50, FAO2 from 50 to 90% in the past three days. So you won't believe like antibiotic escalated to cholestine, within 24 to 48 hours, we could bring down the oxygenation to 60%, and today is day four of polystyrene and patient is on six liters oxygen. So this is how the secondary infection post-COVID is going to be there. Next, sedation. 
So sedation, we all know young patients are extremely anxious. They have fear of death. Sedation protocol needs to be more robust than ever before. So our protocol has one antipsychotic, definitely, preferably quetiapine. We have one psychiatric treatment, anxiolytic, melatonin, and opioid infusion if needed. Rarely we use remdesivir. Next. Next. Anticoagulation, what to monitor in a hospital for anticoagulation? We usually monitor platelet count, PT, APTT, fibrinogen. So this is the most important line of the entire slide. D-dimer, increase in D-dimer, progressive increase in D-dimer indicates progressive severity of infection. Then more aggressive treatment is not needed. And I'm again telling, increase in D-dimer doesn't mean we have to double the anticoagulant. Anticoagulant dose should be same, but you have to treat the disease. Next. So this is the most recent trial uh, with regard to anticoagulation done by American Cardiology Society of Cardiologists. They did around 615 patients. Uh, they did the trial for almost 60 days follow-up was there. Next. So the recommendation is this. For all patients above 18 years with COVID and elevated D-dimer, enoxoparin yeah. was given. So therapeutic anticoagulation has got no benefit compared to prophylactic anticoagulation. This is what is most important of this trial. So there is no point in increasing anticoagulation. Bleeding episodes are very high in therapeutic group. Next. So this is the uh, flowchart given by our Tamil Nadu government. It clearly says if the symptom is going to be mild, if a patient is already on anticoagulant or antipilatal for any other reason, it has to be continued. So if the symptom is going to be severe, ICU level of care is needed, then only prophylactic dose has to be given. Because if you increase to therapeutic, there is high chance patient will bleed. Next. So this is the rate of getting image confirmed venous thromboembolism. This is only 2.6%. It is almost same as anyone who is getting hospitalized in adults. So there is no need for routine post-discharge anticoagulation in adults. Next. So we use low molecular weight heparin or unfractured heparin versus uh, Novax. Uh, why? Because Novax already always have long half-life. If any procedure is planned, we can't do it. Renal impairment can be there. Okay. So antivirals, it also inhibits Novax. Okay, next. So this is what is anticoagulation myths. So high D-dimer indicates high severity of disease. Yes, it is true. But it is not a marker to increase anticoagulation. So there is no evidence to suggest routine anticoagulation post-discharge. If venous thromboembolism score is high, for example, in an immobile patient, some fracture associated, old age, some morbidly obese, then post-discharge anticoagulation with NOAX, newer oral anticoagulant is needed. For critically ill patients, still we believe low molecular weight heparin or unfractured heparin is better. Next. Take home. COVID is more than import, more than sepsis in timing. We all say like sepsis, we give antibiotic within this hour, we have to do this within hours. So, so COVID is more important than sepsis in timing. If you delay one day in starting an antibiotic, delay one day in starting a steroid, you are going to lose a patient. Obesity poses more risk, especially in awake proning. Steroids reduce mortality. Tocilizumab or any other immunomodulatory therapy works well only if started at the right time. Next. So tocilizumab efficacy in children will be out soon. It will be a good news. Late phase trauma should have a very high suspicion for secondary infection. This is most important line. Almost always you are going to face this. Late phase trauma, it is going to be secondary infection. Adequate deep sedation protocol is the cornerstone for success. Otherwise, patient won't prone. High D-dimer indicates more severe disease. Prophylactic anticoagulation is always superior to therapeutic in ICU. Next. So... This is how we want it to be, a single drug to treat the entire scenario. Unfortunately, a lot of drugs needed, a lot of manpower needed, and a lot of money is also involved. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request comments. Thank you, Jagan, for the ma magnificent lecture. There are only two observations I want to make, only two comments. One is, uh, I'll confine my comments to adolescents. The adolescents constitute 21% of India's population. And as Jagan rightly pointed out, the most important comorbidity is obesity. 
as all of you know diabetes hypertension cardiovascular diseases chronic respiratory diseases malignancy are all co comorbidities the single most important co the kannan sir you have to unmute sir kannan sir mute it mute okay. you mute it ha i'll start from the beginning okay oh th uh, thanks jagan for the magnificent lecture the only two observation i want to make one is the most important comorbidity is obesity as you all know that cardiovascular respiratory and other things are very important but the most important underlying comorbidity is obesity that is one thing and second thing all these adolescents are probably young adults who are discharged from icu long term care not only from the organic point of view from also from psychiatric illness they suffer from agitation anxiety depression agitated depression psychosis suicidal tendencies among the galaxy of the relevant literature that has come in the recent past so we have to monitor them along with organic problems with a psychiatrist consultant psychiatrist thank you jay thank you all thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir we would now go to the next talk neurological involvement in covid-19 infection by dr shivan kesavan junior consultant neurologist in dr mehta hospital this session is chaired by dr n mahesh consultant neurologist mehta hospital uh, good evening janvi can you hear me and see my slides yes yes all right thank you Uh, good evening, uh, teachers, respected chairperson, and my friends and colleagues. Uh, I'll be briefly discussing the neurological involvement in COVID-19 uh, in children as well as young adults. Uh, my overview overview of my talk would be. Why is it king? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, so, overview of the, my talk will be uh, a brief note on incidence and pathogenesis, the spectrum of clinical manifestations, that is, uh, neurological manifestations of COVID. difficulties in establishing causation which we uh, come across in our day to day case management the outcomes what i will not be discussing is management because management uh, for neurological manifestations of covid does not differ from uh, msi or acute covid in general so that will not be discussed which has already been discussed by other speakers and neonatal presentations have been covered by uh, uh, dr arun krishna Uh, why and how is the nervous system involved is a question so pathogenesis will be discussed in the next few minutes we know that the virus infects the respiratory mucosal epithelial cells the receptor is said to be uh, the as2 uh, receptor through which it enters the respiratory mucosal cell particularly the olfactory epithelium and enters through the olfactory bulb uh, through the olfactory nerves into the olfactory cortex and then to the rest of the brain so this is uh, believed to be the primary mode of entry of the virus inside the cell and uh, this is believed to to cause the most common symptom uh, which is anosmia and uh, agusia that is loss of taste and uh, smell and taste respectively which unlike other coronaviruses or any other respiratory virus is not due to the mucosal congestion involvement in these patients we have very minimal mucosal inflammation at the time of loss of smell or taste which is uh, a neural symptom there is a peripheral uh, a neuropathy symptom of the first nerve so there is also entry of the virus through uh, Uh, the cauda tympani branch as well as uh, the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve as well and these are the receptors which i mentioned so along with as2 uh, the transmembrane serine proteins two receptors also contributing internalization of the virus so what happens after this so this is a beautiful mri uh, at high resolution which shows the inset shows these two dots are uh, the olfactory bulbs which is hyper intense which knows shows that this is inflamed and the lower part of the picture shows the gyrus rectus which is the primary projection where the primary projection of the olfactory neurons takes place and this uh, is in a patient who did not have any other neurological symptoms but had agusia and anosmia so this shows that this is the primary uh, route of entry of the virus into the nervous system so what happens after that so there are two processes i want you to remember one after entering the endothelial cell there is a destruction of the endothelial cells both directly as well as by the subsequent subsequent inflammation so destruction of these cells causes two processes one is activation of inflammation which when happens inside the cns is called neuroinflammation this leads to cytokine storm and activation of the local uh, inflammatory cells that is a microglia which causes an excitotoxicity so is it excitotoxicity means it there is an increase in the excited neurotransmitters which causes a lot of positive symptoms such as seizures and hallucinations and visual disturbances in these patients in addition to that damage of the endothelium causes uh, thrombosis where microthrombi in 
inside the vessels causes uh, uh, injury to the vasculature of the brain and stroke both venous and arterial are important presentations. So these two processes should be remembered from this slide. So as I told you, endothelial injury is the primary mode of injury of uh, uh, caused by this virus. Uh, the direct effects of the virus, though we know that the virus enters through the olfactory bulb into the cortex, we do not know that uh, how much of uh, the viral damage or the CNS damage is due to the direct viral replication and destruction. So this is uh, less important in the pathogenesis. What is more important than endothelial injury and direct viral effects are, uh, are depicted in the bigger two boxes, para-infectious and post-infectious inflammation. So COVID in children is primarily an inflammatory disease. Parainfectious inflammation means the infection, uh, the inflammation which occurs around the time of infection or just immediately after the infection is set in. It is primarily due, uh, it leads to a cytokine storm and the clinical reflection is in children is in the form of MISC. And uh, post-infectious inflammation is what occurs in demyelinating disorders such as ADEM and GBS, which are classical. So this happens after a few weeks to few months after the infection is set in. So this constitutes the pathophysiology of this disease. So we know that inflammation is the most important uh, mechanism of uh, viral damage, viral induced CNS damage, and endothelial injury as well, because we know strokes are very common in this, at least in adults, but the direct viral effects are unclear. So what is the incidence of neurological complications? In acute COVID, neurological complications are a rarity. So around about uh, uh, average would be something around uh, 10 to 15 percent, but the range varies from 4 to 28 percent depending on the publication. But in MISI, you can expect up to one third of patients can have neuroscience and symptoms, though most are mild. So data from Indian literature on neurological manifestations are scarce. You can find a few febrile seizures which have been triggered by COVID and MISI. Uh, MISC with febrile encephalopathy, clinical encephalitis in about th three patients, one patient each of stroke and cerebellitis. You should remember that stroke, which had been reported to be a very common manifestation of acute COVID in children, sorry, in adults, uh, has not been reported as much uh, in pediatrics, though there are a few patients who can present with those symptoms. So what are the possible clinical manifestations? What is the spectrum? So as I told you, acute infection can have neurological symptoms as well as you can have para-infectious. In addition to that, you can have truly post-infectious symptoms. So this is very easy to identify. Acute uh, COVID with encephalopathy or a stroke, global syndrome such as an encephalitis, or it can be a focal vascular occlusion such as a stroke. So these two are the common presentations in acute COVID, though, as I told you, acute infection with neurological symptoms, particularly in children, are very rare. MISI can have up to one third of patients' neurological symptoms. They're usually vague, including headache encephalopathy. Some patients, as I told you, can have seizures, psychosis. Stroke, as I told you, can press, be present due, due to uh, direct viral damage during the acute phase, or it can be due to a para-infectious cytokine storm leading to vascular inflammation. Post-infectious, we are aware uh, that any viral infection can trigger ADEM, GBS, or in rare cases, autoimmune encephalitis. So this can also be classified. The clinical uh, syndromes can be classified as per the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system affliction. As I told you, encephalopathy, stroke are the more important manifestations from the CNS. Apart from that, you can have ADEM, true encephalitis or aseptic meningitis like viral uh, meningitis, myelitis, and intracranial hypertension are the much rarer presentations. In PNS, as, you had, as I mentioned already, anosmia and agusia are the more common presentations, you can have a post-infectious neuropathy such as uh, GBS or an isolated cranial nerve palsy such as isolated six nerve palsy. I'll be discussing encephalopathy and stroke in brief detail because these are the more common presentations among the CNS and PNS presentations put together. So encephalopathy is the most common neurological syndrome. It is said that up to 30% uh, of children with MISC can have some degree of encephalopathy that can be mild, vary from mild, moderate to severe. MRA brain can be normal or show irre irreversible or irreversible devastating changes. So I could, I'd like to show some representative images. The upper image is something which you're familiar with. You have di diffuse bilateral asymmetric white matter changes. This constitutes ADEM. This, the second image is one which you'll have to note because once uh, we get a huge spike in MISC, when the patients are, if the patients are imaged in the acute phase, when they have neurological symptoms, you can have uh, this uh, kind of a lesion in the splenium of the corpus callosum. It is due to cytotoxic edema in the corpus callosum and it occurs uh, as a part of the cytokine storm. You can also have intracranial hemorrhage in the parenchyma as well as the ventricles. And there is something called acute necrotizing encephalopathy, which I'll be discussing in two or three slides. And there, the third image is that of the acute fulminant cerebral edema, which can be a very devastating complication of uh, COVID uh, in children, though it is in general rare. CSF can be variable. When you have evidence of any inflammation, you call it encephalitis, such as you have MRA changes or CSF cells. If you do not have it, you can just name it encephalopathy associated with COVID. 
So what is acute necrotizing encephalopathy? We tend to hear it whenever there is a surge in viral cases. We uh, we heard about it in influenza. We heard about it in dengue uh, during the dengue epidemics. Now we are hearing about it in COVID-19. It is a clinical radiological disorder, meaning that you need an MRI to diagnose it. It was initially described in Japan with uh, uh, influenza and human herpes virus 6 infections. It is a para-infectious disease, occurs due to cytokine storm. So as this fourth point ind indicates, there is exaggerated immune response to the virus resulting in a cytokine storm. Storm. Clinically, you can have a mild fever or uh, any other systemic symptom according to the virus. And uh, following that, you can have a rapid dip in sensory, very rapid deterioration, which is not expected with any kind of viral encephalitis. And usually you have evidence of systemic involvement in the form of multi-system uh, inflammatory response syndrome. So there are three clinical stages. As I told you, the prodromal stage is brief, then sudden dip in encephalopathy, raised intracranial pressure. And then the recovery stage, as I told you, recovery is always uh, less than satisfactory. It is a very devastating disease with high mortality. So one one thing I want to know, uh, want you to know from this slide is that uh, among the diagnostic criteria, the most important thing is the MRI findings, which are classically involving the bilateral thalami. And because it is called acute necrotizing encephalitis, there is necrosis, as I'll show in the next slides. And there can be variable white matter, brain stem, and basal ganglia involvement. You should note that unlike encephalitis, there is no pleocytosis. CSF cells are usually very minimal. And there is elevated protein as well as pressure. And as I told you, systemic inflammation with all inflammatory markers will be elevated, usually AST and ALT, that is SGOT and PT, are elevated to high levels. So these are representative images. It shows bilateral uh, thalamic changes. There are some white matter ventricular white matter changes, there are some brainstem changes. But the catch here is that these are the diffusion. D and D uh, stands for the diffusion and the ADC map at, uh, respectively. So the diffusion images means that there is uh, cell necrosis inside uh, and there is cytotoxic edema. So D and D uh, clinches the diagnosis in these patients. And there is also hemorrhage, which is depicted with the last image. This is called susceptibility weighted images. Whatever black means that there are micro hemorrhages. So the treatment, as I told you, is very insatisfactory because it is due to inflammation. Anti-inflammatories have been tried, intraventricular, sorry, intravenous methylprednisolone in high doses, particularly when initiated within the early time, in 20, initial 24 hours, has said to improve outcomes, though it is a devastating and progressive disease regardless of this therapy, 30% mortality. And among those patients who recover, most survive with severe neurological sequelae. I'd also like to discuss about stroke. So ischemic is more common than hemorrhagic stroke. So this is the left top image is that of uh, a complete IC occlusion. You can see there is a small strip which is applied with a PCA, which constitutes a posterior circulation not involved. The rest of the MCA and AC territory are involved. And this is a hemorrhagic stroke where there is a severe intraventricular hemorrhage. And the last one shows venous thrombosis. You can see where this arrow points out, the transverse sinus and the jugular veins are filled with uh, thrombi on the right side. So since COVID infection is a prothrombotic state, one should remember that it can stroke can occur both during the acute phase as well as the uh, post-infectious inflammatory phase. Some may have underlying risk factors. Commonly in children, we have hemolytic anemias, moya moya disease, which is a vasculopathy or artery venous malformation, which can rupture. In hospital strokes are also common in this condition because these patients have vascular problems as well inside the hospital because they are undergoing multiple procedures, especially extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. As I told you, they may not fit into acute COVID or MISI criteria. Stroke can occur distant after the COVID infection without fever, but frequently you have elevated systemic inflammation, which provides a clue that probably this is due to COVID. So these are, I'm going to discuss some briefly some uh, case scenarios which we encounter in common practice. And once uh, we have an antibody or a PCR titer, uh, PCR value result, we don't know whether we, the, we can attribute this presentation to COVID or not. So these are some cases. Uh, the, the first case is that of an eight-year-old boy who presented with respiratory symptoms and fever for 10 days, then through seizures and started vomiting for two days. Rapid onset encephalopathy, very deep encephalopathy. And he also had some focal signs such as right-sided weakness. This is the image. As I had shown previously, there are bilateral thalamic changes. And this is a contrast image, which is densely contrast filling. And there are white matter changes as well. There are some basal uh, ganglia changes as well, which are depicted here. So this fits into acute necrotizing encephalopathy. And the chest X-ray had bilateral changes, hypoxemia, COVID PCR positive. So this was in the acute phase. We did not have a doubt. It's probably acute necrotizing encephalopathy secondary to COVID. This is another case where there is a, there was a three-year-old uh, child with a three-day history of fever seizures and mild encephalopathy, no other organ involvement. You can see cortical changes, basal ganglia changes, as well as thalamic changes. There are some diffusion restrictions showing there is some degree of uh, encephalitis uh, here. 
covid pcr was negative but the antibody was positive inflammatory markers were elevated uh, viral pcr testing for many viruses were negative and mog antibody was negative so this again probably we can attribute comfortably to covid infection this is encephalitis due to covid uh this patient was treated with ivig and ivmps and near complete recovery whereas the last two cases cases 3 and 4 are much more perplexing 6 year old child presenting with fever short history of fever seizures altered sensorium and rapidly dipping into encephalopathy with focal signs and isocoria raised pressure intracranial pressure uh, posturing right hemiparesis quickly intubated and mechanically ventilated no pulmonary involvement that is one thing which is to be noted and no hemodynamic instability the mri you can show has uh, uh, focal changes in uh, uh, the left hemisphere Uh, which uh, are diffusion restricting which means that there is encephalitis both the uh, gray matter as well as underlying white matter is involved but this patient had covid pcr positive without any systemic manifestations antibody was negative and csf so shows pleocytosis so only encephalitis presenting with a covid uh, test positivity we do not know whether we could attribute it to covid or not this is not very classical of uh, uh, acute covid infection as i told you neurological involvement that too in isolation in acute covid is quite rare and we could not investigate for other viruses as uh, dictated by other speakers it could be a viral encephalitis due to any of the viruses uh, which we had not tested for this is another patient which we saw in our icu 8 year old child with uh, vague febrile illness uh, six weeks back and now presented with a one week history of abnormal behavior insomnia repetitive movements loss of speech and the rest of examination was normal so clinically she fitted into something like autoimmune encephalitis but there was no systemic involvement csf was normal mri brain was normal but a high titer of anti nmdr antibodies were there in the csf and now came the confusion we tested for covid because of the one week uh, history of fever uh, six weeks back and covid antibody was significantly positive in addition to that uh, in um, in uh, In addition to that, we did for did uh, inflammatory markers as well, which we did not get any uh, positive result. We treated with immunotherapy as standard therapy for uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis, and the child made a complete recovery. So the strength of association always comes uh, into discussion. The first two cases are quite clear because they had other systemic manifestations. First in uh, for acute COVID infection, second for MIS-C, it fit into the MIS-C criteria. Case three was again borderline. Case four, we were quite sure that probably this is not due to COVID. um uh, with uh, some degree of certainty that this viral infection probably might have triggered the autoimmune encephalitis or it could be autoimmune encephalitis per se so what are the outcomes generally the outcomes are very good uh, those who report only messy report only good outcomes but as cases increase in number Uh, the larger study of from 3 and 65 children have shown that 12 percent had life life threatening conditions. As I told you, severe encephalitis, ADEM, acute ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, or the very fulminant cerebral edema, which rapidly leads to death. So among these 43, only 26 percent, that is only 11 children out of the total 365, died. This was excluding cardiorespiratory deaths, but 40 percent had deficits in it uh, at discharge. So as we increasingly see more number of cases, we will see more number of neurological cases as well as those with deficits. It is one good news is that patients who have neurological symptoms and meet MISI criteria usually have very mild symptoms and have a very good recovery. So these are some of our patients, uh, a very small cohort uh, which we encountered in the last six months, where a septic meningitis was the most common presentation in the last three children and all of them made a very good recovery and those all all five children were seen in the antibody phase of the disorder we did not see any child with pcr positivity with neurological symptoms so a quick recap or summary would be generally neurological symptoms are not uncommon as cases increase we are seeing more symptoms more uh, number of cases but generally they are mild and one thing to be noted is that neurocovid in children is an immune inflammatory disorder certain rare but life threatening presentations as i told you acute neck Tracing encephalopathy, cerebral edema, and stroke should be remembered. Exclusion of all differentials is important, and any unexplained presentation, it is useful to test for COVID, both PCR and antibody, depending on the situation. There is no special treatment for neurological patients. The standard treatment holds good, and outcome is generally good. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Shivan. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Ah, uh, thank you, Shivan. Uh, wonderful presentation. and he who knows syphilis knows medicine was the william maslow's works at the turn of 20th century and then what happened because of the advancement and all one who knows diabetes knows medicine now once again what happens post this covid once again we can say one who knows covid knows medicine especially neurology because at the beginning of this pandemic 
initial one or two months, there were no reports of COVID-induced neurological illness. They said, till now, there is no neurological involvement. Then later, they said, it was a self-limiting encephalitis. That's all we know. But as the pandemic goes on, we come to know even the COVID affects each and every cell of nervous system. So as uh, Dr. Shivat has pointed out, it causes stroke, it causes encephalitis, Adam, a post-COVID autoimmune encephalitis, and so on. So a nice presentation, well compiled. Thanks, Shivan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks for Thank those you. comments. Thank you. Over to Janvi. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have been receiving the questions for this uh, session in the question answer chat box, uh, some of which are being answered by the speakers. I humbly request the speakers to stay back till the end of the session for the question answer session, which will be discussed. Now, moving on to our next topic, lab investigations in COVID-19 infection. I hereby call upon Dr. Suganya, Registered Department of Pediatric Mehta Hospital. This session will be uh, chaired by uh, Dr. Akshit Tamaya, Head of Laboratory Services and HIC Meta Hospital. Over to you. Uh, good evening, teachers. Uh, my topic will be on lab investigations in COVID-19 infection. The objectives of my talk will be uh, when to suspect uh, acute COVID, MIS and MISE, whom to test, lab diagnosis, including the molecular testing, antigen de uh, detection, and serological tests, COVID biomarkers, case scenarios, and radio diagnosis in COVID, when and what. When to suspect any acute illness with no other explainable cause, also uh, like child presenting with, with fever, uh, with or without any respiratory uh, symptoms like uh, breathlessness, runny nose, uh, or fast breathing, GI symptoms like abdominal pain, diarrhea, and other uh, symptoms like uh, uh, anore uh, anorexia or uh, malaise, loss of taste and smell in older children. Also, pediatric uh, ma manifestation of MISE like rash, fever more than three days with high-grade fever, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Whom to test? Uh, testing is ideally recommended for all suspected cases to avoid transmission to the other household members. If the child is not sick, then why should I diagnose early? We generally uh, do uh, when, uh, only when an isolation is needed. Like if they are planning to send their child to another, uh, to their relative uh, or their grandparent, which is ideally not recommended and uh, who are COVID negative, uh, COVID negative or asymptomatic, also prior to any procedure and before hospitalization. If there is a scarce resource, then um, testing may be deferred for both asymptomatic uh, contact and mild diseases. Uh, children with mild symptoms and no comorbidities. And a known positive family member in a resource limited setting should be isolated and we presume it as COVID and treat accordingly. With irrespective of the history of uh, exposure, uh, any child presenting with pneumonia or severe uh, respiratory infection will go ahead with testing. Once again, the structure of virus here, uh, we will be concentrating on the single stranded RNA gene and the proteins S protein is a spike protein, envelope protein, M is the membrane protein, and nucleocapsid protein. Uh, the current uh, laboratory diagnoses are um, nucleic acid amplification test, which includes a real time PCR, Cephid Gene Expert, TrueNAT, and BioFire, antigen detection by rapid antigen detection, serological tests includes the total antibodies and IgG. The type of uh, samples are uh, up in upper respiratory tract, uh, we collect the nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal. Lower respiratory, this uh, bronchoalveolar lavage, tracheal aspirate, mainly in severe uh, infection and in uh, mechanically ventilated children. Real-time PCR, it's gold standard as of now, and it can be uh, done uh, on day four to seven when the viral load is high. The PCR can remain positive beyond three weeks, and it is uh, not to retest within 90 days. The cons of uh, positive PCR, it not only detect, uh, it, it has a, uh, it uh, also detects the uh, dead viruses. 
And here is the data for showing the positivity of the different samples. Bronchoalveolar uh, lavage of 93% and pharyngeal with least of 32%. This again depends on the stage of illness. When there is an, uh, during the initial stages of illness, the pharyngeal swabs will be yielding a more positive result. And also the degree of viral multiplication and clearance. Cycle threshold. In, uh, it just uh, indicates the number of cycles that is run to amplify the viral RNA. The usual cutoff is 35. The lower the cycle threshold, the higher is the viral load. And it does not necessarily reflect the virulence. The factors affecting it will be the time of sampling, quality, and the method of collection of the swab, and the method of nucleic acid extraction. This is a comparison between uh, um, RT-PCR, gene expert, and TrueNAT. Uh, target genes, uh, the basic principle will be the nucleic acid amplification for all the tests. The target genes used here, for screening, they use the envelope gene. And for confirmatory, it is the open reading frame 1B gene and RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and N gene. For uh, gene expert, it is uh, E gene for screening and confirmatory is nucleic acid gene. And for TrueNAT, it is uh, the E gene. Confirmatory will be the uh, RNA polymerase gene. Turnaround time, uh, which is essential for us to get the results, uh, it is around four to five hours in uh, uh, RT-PCR, one hour for, one hour for um, TrueNAT and GeneXpert. Advantage of RT-PCR being high precision with increased sensitivity and specificity, lot of sample can be tested at the same time. Uh, in uh, gene expert, the cross contamination between samples are uh, minimized because it's cartridge based uh, test. And the screening and confirmatory genes can be done in a single run. In uh, TrueNAT, less expertise is needed, easy to interpret the results, and it is cheaper. Disadvantage of RT PCR being its te technical expertise, time consuming, sensitivity, and specificity depends on the kit, and it detects dead viruses too. And for um, Gene expert, the temperature control and uninterrupted power supply is essential. And for uh, TrueNAT, only it can test one sample at a time. And the cost of RT PCR is uh, now 900, 3000 to 500 for Gene expert, and 1000 to 1500 for TrueNAT. Uh, the next is BioFire Respiratory Panel 2.1. Here, the BioFire this, uh, it detects a wide range of respiratory pathogens in a syndromic panel. And uh, it quickly diagnoses the respiratory infection. Uh, apart from COVID, it also uh, diagnoses the other viruses and bacterial um, organisms. The type of sample being nasopharyngeal swab, the sensitivity is 97.1 and specificity of 99.3. The turnaround time is 45 minutes. And the cost, it is a bit costlier than the rest of the investigations. Rapid antigen test. The rapid antigen test, it is uh, the antigens are mainly detected when there is an active replication and also when the antigen is present in sufficient concentration. There is high specificity of 99%, uh, low sensitivity of 50%, but the turnaround time is around 15 minutes. It is used for screening purpose, especially in the, during the interstate travel in airports where the reports are needed immediately. False positivity. Here, the uh, test interference can be due to other human non antibodies like rheumatoid factor or other non specific antibodies and is used in and when used in communities with low prevalence of SARS CoV 2. Rapid antigen test uh, algorithm of interpretation. When the test is positive, we can, it can be reported to be positive. If the test is negative and the child is symptomatic with fever, cough, and sore throat, we go ahead with proceeding with RT PCR. If the test is negative and the child is asymptomatic, and if it turns to be symptomatic, we have to proceed with either RT-PCR or rapid antigen. This is a graph showing for the serological test. Um, here, the broken lines of uh, violet is the IgM and of IgG is um, green in color. We can concentrate on that. And the timeline of symptoms, uh, the detection of uh, antigens will be unlikely in the asymptomatic phase. and uh, Antibodies will start appearing at the end of first week. Here, both IgM and IgG, they will be starting to appear in a very uh, small days of difference. And the uh, IgM starts coming, uh, coming down by the end of sixth week. 
but the igg continues to remain positive in pediatrics we uh, detect antibodies to measure the uh, host it is a measure of host immune response we uh, do for mise also for example a patient who presents after 10 days of illness with an rt pcr negative it detect uh, serological uh, tests are igg and total antibodies total antibodies include igm igg and iga for diagnosis it is uh, to uh, total antibodies and uh, igg elisa peaks around 2 to 3 weeks of illness now with the case scenario a 3 year old child brought to fever op by his mother with history of fever one day throat pain otherwise playful and active mother and father are covid positive they are in home isolation mother wants to know if any investigation need to be done uh, in a child with mild uh, asymptomatic child but with a history of fever for one day there is uh, no need of bl blood investigation or any laboratory investigation to be done except for those children who are associated with any comorbid conditions like ckd or immunodeficiency Uh, on day one, the yield of nasopharyngeal swab will also be less, so we can assume that the child will be, uh, to be positive, and we'll also explain them the red flag signs of when to uh, review to us emergency. The period of infectivity: the viruses are seldom been cultured after seven to ten days, uh, and with a mild disease, they are seldom cultured for more than ten days, and for severe disease, uh, more than twenty days, they are uh, hardly seen. the current guidelines are not to rep, uh, repeat swab in mild to moderate cases one negative swab prior to discharge in severe cases immunocompromised children transplant recipients and hiv and malignancy case 2 scenario is a 6 year old uh, master x brought to er by his father with history of fever 4 days high grade associated with excessive tiredness poor oral intake on examination his temperature was 104 heart rate of 100 per minute respiratory rate 50 per minute and spo2 of 94% bp of 80 by 50 cold peripheries and weak pulses blood investigation needs to be done the objectives uh, will be with the uh, uh, background of this history uh, the things which will be striking in my mind first will be a dengue shock the other one will be other tropical infection septic shock because of either uti or pneumonia then acute covid and mise since it, um, our country is uh, the tropical infection is more common we should always think of that at the back of our mind so the blood investigations will be covid rt pcr complete blood count smear crp blood culture liver function test and renal function test dengue ns1 and mpqbc urine routine and chest x ray biomarkers in covid Uh, they help in early suspicion of disease confirmation and classification of the disease severity framing hospital admission criteria icu criteria identifying high risk cohort rationalizing therapy assessing the response to therapies predicting the outcome and framing the discharge from icu and a hospital so the role of biomarkers in covid what is a biomarker it's a characteristic that is observe, uh, objectively measured and evaluated which is an indicator of normal and pathological process or a pharmacological response to any therapeutic intervention for diagnosis it's leukopenia lymphopenia high neutrophil lymphocyte ratio of more than 3.5 increased ldh and ast lymphopenia being increased expression of ace2 receptors on the surface of lymphocyte and also increased destruction by by the di direct viral invasion also by also uh, reduced uh, turnaround due to the cytokine injury assessment of severity we can do with the above investigations along with an increased c reactive protein procalcitonin ferritin d dimer and cardiac markers like troponin i nt pro bnp response to therapy can be uh, made by crp and interleukin 6 CRP is a very good surrogate for interleukin 6. Prognosis can be based on CRP, procalcitonin, interleukin 6, D-dimer, ferritin, LDH, lymphocyte count, NLR ratio, platelets, and cardiac biomarker. D-dimer in COVID, it is elevated, um, very frequently seen in COVID-19 patient. Prognostic, it has a good prognostic value and correlates with disease severity and hospital mortality. A level more than two microgram per liter. 
at admission predicts mortality. Prior experience with D-dimer is released, uh, limited and now being increasingly used. It can also be elevated in other conditions like malignancy, liver disease, with decreased clearance, hemolysis and sepsis. Imaging in COVID. Mild diseases, no imaging is needed. For moderate to severe, chest X-ray will be the first line of management, in, uh, first line of investigation in uh, pediatrics. We repeat a chest uh, X-ray if their child is ha having any clinical deterioration. CT chest is routinely not recommended as an initial diagnostic test. Can consider when there is a worsening of clinical course who are not responding appropriately to supportive therapy to exclude pulmonary embolism. Pediatric pulmonary CT scans are uh, mainly not done as a first-line investigation because of increased lifetime radiation risk and malignancy. So the temporal course of biomarkers, which are noted in COVID-19, are in the first seven, uh, less than seven days, the total leukocyte count and lymphocyte count may be normal or low with increased LDH, AST, and CKMD. Seven to 14 days, the lymphocyte and total leukocyte count fall still further thrombocytopenia and increased interleukin sets. More than 14 days when the above counts are increasing, it shows a, a recovery. While decreasing, it is a mortality. So the take home message will be, asymptomatic child, mild category without comorbidities, no investigations needed. Those with uh, comorbidity and moderate category, CBC, CRP, serum creatinine and liver function tests uh, will be done. And in severe category, uh, PT, APTT, INR, serum ferritin, D-dimer, cardiobiomarkers, NT-pro BNP and troponin I. And in critical cases, interleukin-6 and serum lactate uh, levels can be done. Hospitalized children on therapy, CBC, CRP can be repeated after 48 to 72 hours of admission to uh, monitor the progression of the disease. And the response to therapy can be done 24 to 48 hours after therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sotanya. I think it was an excellent presentation, very crisp. Few points I want to stress upon, especially sample collection. In sample collection, the type, time, and technique used for sample collection is extremely important for COVID results. RT-PCR is a gold standard at present, but I know the time taken for the RT-PCR test to come positive is a concern for almost all the consultants. But we are going to see more time efficient and cost effective tests coming into the market from July onwards. Blood picture, as we have seen, uh, as for the previous speakers who have said the first wave they had a different presentation and second wave they had a different presentation. We also in the lab have seen in the first wave a lot of leukocytopenia and um, lymphopenia as in the picture. But in the second wave, we had a lot of leukocytosis, especially predominated by the neutrophils. It can be attributed for the secondary infections, which we have seen more often with the adult patient. So we have seen a different blood picture and we are also learning. The third thing, uh, the last thing is about the biomarkers. The biomarkers are extremely important. They can be a guide to identify the early high risk cases, which will require uh, hospitalization. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful talk. We would now go to the next talk, CT chest in adults and children. I would like to invite Dr. T. Anand, consultant radiologist at Dr. Mehta Hospital, and chairperson Dr. K. Gopinathan, who is currently working in Stansford. Over to you, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. You are audible. Am I audible there? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Hello. Okay. A uh, very good afternoon to everybody. I want to thank uh, all the good hearts for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, to throw some perspective on how <clears throat> COVID-19 
uh, infects uh, the lungs and the, how it's seen on the CT scanner. I want to kick off this presentation by asking uh, this question. Why do we do CT scan COVID-19 infections? <clears throat> we do it because pneumonia is indeed the hallmark of moderate and severe cases of COVID-19, and CT is extremely sensitive in picking up even minimal lung injury. Today, we're going to see many different imaging patterns on CT, the CT chest, chest protocol, standardized reporting methods, and choice and timing of the imaging itself. <clears throat> Protocol other two would be non-contrast plain uh, chest CD. There's no need for HRCT here. Low radiation dose protocols to be followed. Post-contrast chest CD is only done when you're trying to rule out pulmonary embolism. And there are very many type of uh, imaging patterns which are typically seen in COVID-19 infection. The list include ground glass opacities, crazy paving pattern of opacities, halo sign, uh, reverse halo sign, patchy consolidations, subpleural lines, fibrosis, parenchymal bands, etc. <clears throat> There's a key pattern in the evolution of the images itself as the disease progresses into its different stage, stages. Knowledge about this pattern is important to understand the disease behavior, the severity, and the stage where we are sitting in. There are four stages radi radiologically. The first stage is called the early stage up to fifth day, and the second is the progressive stage until eighth day. The peak stage is between 9th to 13th day, and then beyond that is the late stage or the dissipation stage. Now, there's a we'll go, we'll see the images as we move along this presentation to understand how the disease progresses through the uh, course. Now, that's an example of a ground glass opacity. Okay, that's an example of a ground glass opacity there for you, a hazy opacity in the right lung. This is the most common and the earliest finding of COVID infection in the lungs. This is seen in the first stage of the disease. Now, what is ground glass opacity? Is every opacity in the lung a ground glass opacity? Of course not. There are two opacities here, one over here and one over here. If you watch them closely, there's two stark difference. This one is less dense than the other one. And you also see the vessels traversing through them over there. So this is the definition for a ground glass opacity, a hazy opacity in the lung with the background vessels clearly seen through them. Whereas this is more dense uh, opacity and you don't see the background vessels, you only see air bronchogram. This is a case of uh, low bar consolidation. Here the alveoli are completely filled with the exudate. Over here, the alveoli are partially filled with the exudate and therefore this is the difference. The classical example of how ground glass opacities uh, present itself in COVID-19 infection, they are multifocal, bilateral, close to the pleura, and they're round or oval in shape as these. More examples of ground glass opacities, they can be as faint and as difficult to discern like this, or they could be so overt and obvious like this, the more confluent and extensive in this case. Then as the disease moves into the second stage, this is a progressive stage beyond the fifth day, you begin to see slightly different pattern of uh, opacities. Now, if you watch this opacity, you have some ground glassing there. We also see some short lines going through the opacity. These are all the thickened interstitium. Now the inflammation has entered into the interstitium and therefore you see these short lines giving a crazy paving opacity. This is ground glass opacity, overlapping with thickened interstitium. More examples of diffuse crazy paving that you see in the later part of the disease. You also get focal consolidations like this. This is called a halo sign where there's a consolidation and a halo of ground glassing around it. This is focal consolidation. This means they are moving into the later part of the second stage. Now it's just opposite. It's far more dense in the periphery and less dense in the middle. This is called reverse halo sign, uh, which indicates this is an organizing pneumonia going on. Now, this also means that we are in probably the second to third stage somewhere there. Excuse me. You also get to see opacities like this. These are irregular linear opacities close to the pleura. These are also seen in active stage of the disease. Yeah. 
Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Anand. We can hear you. No, you are not audible. Screen slide doesn't move. Sir has come out of the connectivity. Wi-Fi disconnected, I think. Yes, sir. Sir, yes, sir. I'm not able to contact him now. Yes, yes, sir. Trying to come back issue. again. Maybe another two, three minutes we will wait. Yes, yes sir. sir. Probably got disconnected or Wi-Fi is interrupted. We'll come back. We'll wait. Thank you, well, sir. Wonderful, sir. Wonderful. Right from the two o'clock even now, we are not even a single second missed. Yeah, all the speakers have delivered very good message. Very good, sir. Thank you for Thank you. providing us a very good information on COVID. Thank you so much, Shekhar, for your appreciation. It's well said at the appropriate time. I concur with you. Good evening, Srinivasan, sir. Good evening. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Yes, uh, Spellbound. Spell Not even <laughs> single second I wasted, sir. Yeah, this. spellbound. Yes, yeah. sir. Very good. Very good. And you can contact me. Even on the reach there. Sir, I'm just uh, online with Dr. Anand, sir. I'm just speaking to him. He's got disconnected. He's just trying to join back, sir. Wait for him then. We'll wait for him. I'll ask, I will ask IT to go and help him. Hospital is working, Anand. Inform IT. IT will be able to get IT. Okay, we will go proceed with the next talk. Next talk, you can Okay, right. Okay, right. Sir, we'll, he said he will call the IT for help. Meanwhile, he wanted to proceed with the next talk. He will then again rejoin, sir. Okay, okay, Janvi. Next, uh, Janvi, you can call the next uh, speaker. Sashidharana, Prema. Sashidharana. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Moving on to the next session. Therapeutics in children with COVID-19 infection. Calling the, the here we call upon the speaker, Dr. K. Sasidran, sir, head of department, PICU Mehta Hospital. The session will be chaired by Dr. L. Subramaniam, sir, consultant and pulmonologist, uh, Mehta Hospital. Chen. <coughs> Sorry for the time lag. It was, uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So uh, next 15, 20 minutes, we discuss about the therapeutics in children uh, with COVID disease. So uh, what we are going to discuss extra, we have already discussed about MISC management, mild disease management, moderate disease management. I'm just going to give you a perspective of putting everything together and giving a, a systematic approach 
and i hope it will help us to understand a little bit more about the management and therapeutics the preamble is covid 19 is a new disease and uh, whenever there is a new disease there is a nascent knowledge base especially in pediatrics um therapeutics most drugs used are repurposed medications we know what is repurposed medication it has not been invented for this purpose except the designed designed monoclonal antibodies nothing else has been um, um got for this purpose uh, though the public interest is towards specific therapy we all know that supportive therapy is the backbone covidology in adult versus pediatrics there is a significant difference in manifestation though we say 1 month to 18 years as pediatrics the different manifestation within this age spectrum itself uh, has been more and more appreciated over time so whenever we say uh, it is a new disease the what what is the problem so when we think about what is the problem in a new disease we do not know what is the disease model disease model is natural history what is the clinical presentation what is the disease trajectory what will be the prognosis what will be the outcome what are all the variations in the presentation what is the atypicality in the presentation so we less understood about the disease model so to uh, discuss about the therapeutics i will start with the disease model this is one of the models so i don't say that it is a solid uh, um, a model it is a evolving model what we are, whatever we have understood till now based on that i have uh, put together everything so we can say pcr positive covid disease and pcr negative covid disease why i want to say that is pcr negative covid disease is what predominantly we see till now in children and discuss which is mise pcr negative mise when we go about pcr positive covid disease um, acute covid pneumonia mild moderate severe acute covid with complication that is a covid pneumonia with ards or acute covid with mods will come into this classic category and there is an addition in the recent time that is covid mis which is pcr positive antibody can be positive or negative so this concludes the pcr positive cause of covid disease as of now so what is the pcr negative covid disease as you all know the mis which is antibody positive or antibody and pcr negative only the contact will be there as a history and as we have already discussed there is a entity called post covid less or undifferentiated syndrome of fever where the denominator is antibody positivity but the pre 2020 diseases will behave with a um, maybe a, a different kind of clothing <clears throat> the next one is plus p that is the post covid less or undifferentiable syndrome of fever there is an one another which is more uh, more of a myriad presentation that is a typical manifestation a typical manifestation which can be a cns manifestation like dr uh, case uh, uh, shivan has already discussed it can be a miscellaneous manifestation like acute pancreatitis or something else like dr mutaya has discussed so with this we will go and discuss about covid in children um, therapeutics i will first part uh, discuss about pcr positive covid disease so pcr positive covid disease can be already as i told it can be acute covid pneumonia it can be acute covid with complication or acute covid mis where the pcr is still positive so uh, somebody has scribbled the screen yeah so uh, clinical scenario so we have two clinical scenarios to discuss here it is just to make people uh, to uh, come into the same platform Uh, so the case one is a 3 years male child unpredisposed means no previous admission no illness in the past fever of 4 days plus rapid breathing for 2 days covid pcr positive requiring sfnc support to maintain saturation more than 94% there is nothing odd it is an acute covid with lung involvement the case two is a 15 year old obese girl no illness in the past 4 days fever 2 days afebrile again 36 hours of fever rapid breathing covid rt pcr positive chest corats um uh, grade 4 and ct severity 8 by 25 on day of admission that is the day 8 of illness on face mask oxygen for 12 hours change to hfnc in view of poor response to maintain saturation above 98 so in this scenario uh, how do we approach so uh, the uh, approach starts from asymptomatic child which is a very common presentation asymptomatic child or mild disease this is very common luckily till now we have been um uh, encountering more and more of 
uh, mild uh, the cluster testing positive patients that's what fall into this category when it progresses to moderate disease it means the pneumonia is there no signs of severe respiratory distress saturation maintained more than 92% so this case also may require a hospital management for a, but it is a minimal supportive therapy subsequently if there is a imaging worsening or and the clinical worsening and worsening the organ function scoring system along with cytopenia and elevation of the inflammatory markers like ferritin d dimer crp ldh and transaminases then the patient is going to land in severe covid disease then there are three arms to the management one is targeted medical therapy which we call remdesivir and anticoagulant and then medical therapy which includes the immunomodulation that includes corticosteroids ivig tocilizumab or nikindra and the major stem of the treatment is support to therapy protocolized respiratory support lung ultrasound monitoring and guided fluid therapy and nutrition support infection control uh, to prevent secondary infection and other organ support as and when needed so protocolized respiratory support 10 therapeutic concerns we are going to discuss here one is protocolized respiratory support i am not going to go into the protocol i am just uh, going to reiterate that the protocol is not much different from the routine protocol of the unit where a patient or under 5 year under 18 child comes with a primary respiratory issue to your er so what you do routinely if the child is having a bc presentation you will give a nebulization or a equivalent mdi and uh, if needed uh, you will uh, start oxygen and admit the patient based on the saturation and uh, if the child is falling into the very severe or hyperacute presentation category not maintainable airway or not improving perfusion and hypotensive shock directly patient may get intubated and invasively ventilated uh, so this is a very important thing with the ctas uh, levels of respiratory grading this is a canadian triage assessment scale which you can use in your er just to categorize the severity of respiratory distress the green one is normal if you move on the right it is a tachypnea spectrum move on the left it is the uh, bradypnea spectrum based on the age of the patient why it becomes important if really the third wave happens the manpower becomes an issue the pediatrician may not be assessing every pediatric patient even an anesthetist may be assessing in that case these kind of simplifications may work very well so if the child's hypoxemia and respiratory distress dr gunavathi uh, please uh, don't scribble on the screen sasi sasi the 80% told that the tools the speaker uses makes the mark probably uh, something related to the pointers oh I, it is not probably uh, i don't think so sir it's okay sir so child with hypoxemia and respiratory distress uh, there is a need for continued uh, respiratory support poor or no response to the trial nebulization or sfnc uh, in that case we may end up in starting the high flow nasal cannula so the high flow nasal cannula when we start uh th there is a one important thing uh, you just concentrate on this weight banded flow rate this people may not be knowing so less than 2 10 kg it is a 10 uh, uh, 2 liter per kg per minute and beyond that there is a, a strict uh, value which is now reasonably standardized and this can be followed and beyond that if the patient is not improving uh, we may end up in intubating and ventilating the child one important point which i want to highlight here is um usually we put all non invasive respiratory support methods including high flow cpap and bipap in the same strata that's what we need to understand uh usually we do not put it in the sequential order unlike in adult so from hfnc switching to cpap switching to bipap may not be a right idea so uh, you choose one method if the method fails you may end up in giving a very a little time based trial of bipap and progress to um, uh, invasive ventilation so the second therapeutic modality is uh, a remdesivir in children with acute covid so what we wish to know is um, whether it can be used in children so children on invasive ventilation and severe disease uh, that is the admission spo2 less than 90 percentage requiring oxygen support or children on ecmo there is a clear indication that this can be used um uh, and there is an another confusion whether it can be used only if the patient is presenting within 72 hours or it can be used uh, till 7 to 10 days we, uh, we wish to reiterate that up till 7 to 10 days of symptom onset it can be used 
because one of the guideline uh, started saying that it is to be used only within 72 hours. The contraindications may be um, ALT more than five times the limit, or once you started ALT increases more than 10 times, then the REM test to be stopped, just like in adults. Estimated creatinine clearance less than 30 ml per minute per meter squared um, may be a relative contraindication. Dose, as we know well, there is a standard dose, which is a US FDA approved dosing guideline, five milligram per kg on day one and 2.5 milligram per kg on day two to day five. And there is one important thing is it is extendable to 10 days if um, the response is poor and based on the disease status and intensity of the child. But the bottom line is there is no high quality evidence favoring the usage. As of now, it is used based on the very, very low quality evidence which is available. Anticoagulant profile access in children with acute COVID. This is an another very important part. So uh, already my previous speakers have touched upon that. Yeah, but uh, I just want to give a pediatric perspective to it. You know that the, in chemostasis, we have taken one component, there are multiple components are involved. When we take a von Willebrand uh, factor protein, you know that it is a high, um, uh, ultra high molecular weight protein. Uh, and uh, this has a high prothrombotic tendency to avoid that it has to be cleaved by Adam TS13 to cleave von Willebrand factor. When there is an endothelial uh, cytokine uh, release, uh, which happens in the inflammation, there is an excessive release of von Willebrand factor and the inhibition of Adam TS13. So henceforth, the, uh, 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 getting into the neutrophil extracellular trap, it will cause thrombus and thrombus will progress. So we should know there is a, um, a tendency for thrombosis. But at the same time, what uh, the adult guideline says uh, hold true, based on D-dimer value, saying the severity of the uh, uh, prothrombotic state may not be the right thing. Uh, it may indicate only the severity of the disease state. Um, uh, this is a risk screen screening checklist, which will help you to identify uh, whether the child who has been hospitalized has a add-on risk factor to develop the venous thromboembolism. Uh, if you uh, apply this checklist um, and have some idea, then you can decide the um, uh, anticoagulant therapy based on the guideline I'm showing now. So this is a hospitalized child with COVID-19 related illness. For example, the D-dimer is more than five times of normal limit. Uh, the previous lab investigation session, it has been told that more than 250 nanogram itself is a concern. But when we say here, it is like uh, more than 500 we take. So more than 505 times the normal, that is more than 2.5 or 2,500. Uh, if the child is hospitalized, non-COVID-19 risk factor screening, the previously shown uh, checklist, not available or one or more is there, uh, then anticoagulant profile access may be suggested. Um, in uh, asymptomatic children, uh, only if multiple risk factors are there, the same anticoagulation is subject, suggested, otherwise it is not. Obviously, we should know the cause and for anti, uh, caution for, to be executed for antithromboembolism profile access. Uh, we may not consider that in platelet count 20 to 50,000 scenario, fibrinogen less than 100, when already on aspirin 5 milligram per kg per day, um, any fast major bleeding, we may not consider that. Options in children, um, uh, what we consider this as a very common uh, thing, what we can use is mechanical thromboprophylaxis, that is a sequential compression devices, at least in adolescent children admitted in PICU. The low dose versus therapeutic dose, a low molecular weight heparin, I am not going to deal into detail because it has already been uh, very clearly told the low dose in children two months to 18 years, the dose is 0.5 milligram per kg per dose, uh, Q12 hourly, the max, uh, uh, maximum dose will be 40 milligram OD. So that may be the um, uh, dose which we suggest uh, in children. Um, uh, if you have an anti-factor 10 year level estimate, uh, then based on the factor level monitoring, you can titrate. So going to the immunomodulation therapy, you know the uh, immunomodulation therapy has come up as a very big, uh, um, uh, very big therapeutic uh, paradigm in COVID era. So there are some drugs available for pediatric use, including steroids, IVIG, tocilizumab, anakindra, and blood purification therapy. Mm. Uh, so when we go to steroid, we know that um, uh, here I'm discussing not about the steroid in MISC, I want to make it clear I'm discussing about the steroid in acute COVID. So acute COVID is predominantly lung presentation. That's why I've told dexamethasone. 
dose of 0.15 mg per kg per dose q12 hourly max 6 mg the aims protocol says that 5 to 14 days we prefer to curtail it to 5 days you know the mechanism of corticosteroid is a non specific in inhibition of pro inflammatory and anti inflammatory cascade so shorter duration may be better ivig ivig have a numer a numerous um, uh, mode of action so um, you know that uh, there is an fab and uh, a fc fragment fab fragment has multiple mechanisms that is like uh, neutralizing cytokines and uh, antigens and antibodies and um, Uh, FC mediated mechanism includes multiple that is like dendritic cell differentiation down regulation macrophage activation down regulation mm -hmm. and, and uh, 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 some um, adaptive immunity enhancement so the indication is moderate to severe ARDS progressive multi organ dysfunction syndrome and cytokine storm the dose here is high dose that is uh, 1 to 2 g per kg maximum dose used is 100 g Again, I want to reiterate that I am saying about IVIG dose in acute COVID pneumonia with a moderate or severe ARDS or progressive mods, not in MISC. Beyond IVIG, yes, you all know there is tocilizumab. The action is IL-6 uh, receptor inhibition. What we need to know is it is a non-selective, that is a cis and trans-signaling pathway inhibition. So the trans-signaling pathway inhibition inhibits the um anti inflammatory arm as well the regenerative arm so what happens is there is a long time issue of immunosuppression and there is a possibility of increasing um upper respiratory infection as well other deep seated infection so that is why we have to execute caution while we choose to use the drugs like tocilizumab blood purification therapy this is an adult a, um, acute uh, 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 acute kidney injury dialysis quality initiative guideline published in 2020 what i want to concentrate uh, here is there is a role for dialysis in two stages one is moderate to severe disease where hemoperfusion total plasma exchange or therapeutic plasma exchange can be done and multiple organ failure where the hemoperfusion or adsorptive methods of technology can be used in this scenario when we go and see the data which is available the data is not a very robust data so there are four five papers saying about experience in adults and this is a borrowed evidence from adults which i need to uh, disclose up front and uh, the observations say that tore filters or cytosol filters or oxirus filters can be used in adults with a severe disease some studies like the study which is published with 36 cohorts in critical care medicine critical care this study is a italian experience it shows 8.3% reduction in the mortality so there is no high quality evidence or definable indication that is an issue but there is some scope to use blood purification in extreme situation so and now we have completed the pcr positive covid disease the next will be the most familiar pcr negative covid disease i am not going to the depth and details of pcr negative covid disease because the important one will be misc and the other one will be post covid less or undifferentiable syndrome of fever where the complication happens with a coexisting or undifferentiable tropical infection which can either be dengue typhoid strep typhus lepto depends on your area epidemiology so skipping this clinical scenario we will directly go into the principles of management so if it is a asymptomatic child to begin with short self resolving febrile illness further there is an asymptomatic period after that the child can develop misc and misc treatment therapeutics we all know that ivig corticosteroids aspirin so if it is a refractory misc that is misc which is refractory to these kind of therapy there is a role for anakindra tocilizumab infliximab and kanakinumab kanakinumab is nothing but a il1 um, anti il1 monoclonal antibody so uh, <clears throat> if there is an another pattern so means it is not uh, specifically behaving like misc it is a post covid antibody positive state but the fever is having a some other etiology um which may be mixed or independent etiology so there we have to concentrate on specific therapy that is antibiotics and disease specific support 
Um, now we had few questions in this regard in the chat box also. So why not in severe or a sick typhoid, um, uh, we should uh, uh, give the steroid. Why not we can give the steroid? So nothing is going to happen. So that may not be the real case because the complications may take a different route and it can become life-threatening. So we have to be very careful about specific therapy in this subgroup. The plus P is uh, with pneumonia, where the predominant treatment is going to be a supportive therapy. <clears throat> this is a very important question. Um, IVIG plus or minus steroid in children with MIS-C. I think it is uh, very um, uh, useful to give a, um, a, re a reasonably clear uh, flow chart um, uh, I have gone through multiple flow charts and I think uh, this is what we follow and um, uh, this uh, seems to be a most reasonable flow chart. If the child presents with shock or organ threatening disease, I know that the child with MISC need not always present with the shock or organ threatening disease. Many children can be managed in the ward itself. For those children, the ACR guideline, this is American College of Rheumatology guideline clearly says the first line treatment need to be IVIG, two gram per kg without steroids. If they are presenting with shock with steroid, which is a low to moderate dose steroid. If it is a refractory disease, you may end up in giving the high dose steroid, which is 10 to 30 milligram per kg. And uh, if the steroid is contraindicated or still the patient is refractory, you may consider anakintra. What is anakintra? Which is an IL-1 receptor antagonist, currently not available I in Indian market. Sir. Yes. Time is uh, 20 minutes. Sir. Yeah, this is the last slide. So, Anakindra, recombinant IL-1 receptor antagonist. Uh, so, it may be used in refractory MISC. Currently not available in Indian market, but it, it can be availed on one-to-one -one basis based on the patient need. Um, used after IVIG in steroid contraindicated patients. The dose, we call this four more than 4 milligram per kg per day, up to 10 milligram per kg per day as a high dose. And uh, the exact duration, nobody knows. Based on secondary HLH and MAS experience, it may be used for five days. So the, this is very important. No high quality evidence favoring the usage. But if MAS or secondary HLH presentation is predominant, the disease is refractory, anakindra may be a better choice. The take home message uh, is childhood COVID can manifest as PCR positive disease or PCR negative disease. I think that is the major important message. What is little different from adult? PCR positive disease predominantly remains silent and not requiring high intensive therapy till now. That is by God's grace. But uh, if severe posit co PCR positive disease happens, though it is uncommon, it is wiser to be prepared to face it. But uh, most probably it may mimic um, adult or young adult COVID. COVID MISC, common clinical presentation requiring hospitalization in childhood COVID. IVIG plus steroid refractory MISC luckily remains uncommon, at least in our, our cohort of uh, two hospitals, uh, including two hospitals, we had close to 75 patients. So in that IVIG plus refractory steroid refractory MISC uh, luckily remains uncommon. Thank you. <laughs> I'm audible? Yes, sir. I'm audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sachidharan, for a brief outline about the therapeutic uh, value in uh, COVID-19. Conveniently, you divide it into two things. One is uh, acute COVID and another is a uh, MISTI. And a lot of trials has happened uh, in the last one and a half years. Most, um, uh, most of the studies, they tried different uh, antivirals. Uh, I think what out finally everybody is dependent upon uh, MDs. Well, coming to sick children, severe uh, acute COVID as well as a MST, we stress about the support therapy, not specific therapy. Support therapy, we are told step by step of oxygen therapy, low flow, high flow, and CPAP, BiPAP, like that. And uh, finally, as far as well, we are avoiding ventilators. That's what we have stressed about that. At the same time, support therapy, uh, again, um, fluids and electric balance also we have to think of. And uh, again, your uh, stress about uh, immunomodulators, particularly anti-inflammatory like glucosteroids, particularly I mentioned DEXA and uh, 
methylprednisolone. And uh, again, suppose, suppose uh, again, you also mentioned about uh, uh, anti-IL-6 and anti-IL-1, still is not improving. And suppose you also stress about the value of immunoglobulin. All these immunomodulators, either singly or combination, particularly with shock, with shock that also I mentioned. Finally, you have mentioned about uh, uh, blood purify therapy also. And, uh, and you have touched about the monoclonal antibodies also. So almost we have covered everything. And I think uh, in malnutrition, malnutrition with the COVID, micronutrients, vitamins may be helpful. So with this, uh, I'll conclude and I'll hand over to organizers. Thank you, sir. Uh, as Dr. Anand sir is now available, we will now go with CT chest in adults and children. Sir, over to you. Hello, am I audible there? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yes, sir. My, my sincere apologies for the interruption. I think my Wi-Fi let me down a bit here. I'm going to uh, restart from where I left. Okay. Well, somewhere there. Okay. So uh, we'll be getting opacities like these also in COVID uh, infections, the linear irregular opacities close to the pleura. These kind of opacities are also seen in COVID-19 severe infection. And then you get to see more dense opacities like these, like this with air bronchogram. These are all consolidations. Now we know for sure that we are getting into the peak stage of the disease, which is the third stage. <clears throat> this was a patient, a pregnant lady who had come with severe disease. And uh, this is the CT chest. You can see the lead apron covering her abdomen while this CT scan was done. Uh, the, ch the patient has got multifocal low bar or sub -low bar consolidations with air bronchogram. Now this parallels with the acute lung injury or ARDS. This patient is, uh, is still in the hospital and struggling to make a recovery. This is a follow-up CT recently, follow-up chest X-ray, which was done recently. And then as the uh, this, uh, disease moves into the last stage, which is the uh, late stage or the dissipation stage, the ground glass opacities and the consolidations begin to disappear. Then we start seeing more of fibrotic changes like these. Now we know that this is in the late stage and probably we are in the stage of recovery. Courage. Courage has become a household name, isn't it? Courage is COVID reporting and data system, which is used to predict the probability of COVID infection and not the severity of the disease itself. And it's also a method to standardize the report description. What does it mean? Courage 1 means it's a normal scan where there's no abnormality at all. Courage stage 1 when the infection is absolutely unconnected with COVID-19 sort of infection. For example, if the patient has got uh, bilateral bronco, uh, bronchiectasis or cavitary lesions, then we are dealing with some other disease. Courage 3 is indeterminate. For example, if there's just one patch of ground glass opacities, we're not sure whether it's COVID-19. Therefore, we call it as Courage 3. 
we're not sure whether it's COVID or if it's not COVID. Corat four is highly suspicious of COVID. When you get uh, more of the uh, usual findings that you see in COVID, you call it as Corat four. And when you get all the classical signs or pictures of uh, COVID nineteen, then you call it as Corat five. And Corat six is one where the RT PCR has already been done and it's turned out to be positive. May I re-emphasize here that Corat is not a method to measure the severity of the disease. It is just to predict the probability of the disease on CT being COVID. So therefore, for example, a patient can be um, Corat's five, yet can have a very mild disease, might just have 10 or 15 percent involvement. A patient can be in Corat's four, can have more severe disease. It's possible. So it predicts only the probability of COVID and it doesn't measure the severity of the disease. To measure the disease, uh, the severity of the disease, we have a method called CT severity score. What this does is it just measures the quantum of lung that is involved by the disease. Here we take all the five lobes and give a score between one to five according to the percentage of involvement of each of those lobes. For example, if all the lobes are involved between zero to five percent, we give a score of one to all the lobes, add them up and call as five out of 25. That's the way we make the CT score. Here, there's no, there's no detailing about the pattern of involvement. It only measures the quantum of lung parenchyma that is involved. If the score lies below eight, it's a mild disease. If the score is between nine to 15, it falls into the moderate category. And if it is more than 15, we are dealing with a severe disease. Good CT report must have a detailed description of the various imaging pattern that we described, uh, we, we went through recent, uh, just now. It should also include the CORAT staging and the CT severity score. CT's advantages because it picks up very minimal disease and the percentage of the lung involvement and the pattern of the lung involvement can be ascertained, which can help in predicting the outcome of the disease itself. The disease severity on CT precedes a clinical state. This is what the experience has taught us recently. And this is also the reason why there's such an enthusiasm to do CT scan uh, among the adult population. The messages that can be carried today are that CT as a screening modality is not advisable at all. The best time to do a CT scan is close to the seventh day of illness. Disease estimation prognostication can be very good with CT scan. Well, our experience thus far have been predominantly been among the adult. We only had a handful of pediatric patients coming for CT scans. And I would like to share some of this, uh, a few of the CTs that we uh, had to handle recently. Now, this is a, this was a newborn uh, patient. Okay, this was a newborn patient who um, uh, got uh, contracted the infection from a COVID positive mother and uh, the CT shows extensive infections. Extensive infection in both lung field and the corresponding chest X is over here. They're also quite valuable. They're also throwing a lot of valid information. This child had a stomach course in the hospital and unfortunately, didn't survive to live the day. This was another child, an infant two months old, who was COVID positive again, who was symptomatic. You can see the patch of opacity there. There was a patch of consolidation right upper lobe and this, and the rest of the lungs were normal. The corresponding radio opacity was also seen in the chest radiograph. So in this case, this radiograph itself was quite informative. Now, this was another adolescent uh, patient who was COVID positive with mild symptoms, whose radiograph was absolutely normal. He was asked for a CT scan and uh, you can see those opacities there. Those are the ground glass changes over there and over there. So this was a mild disease on a CT scan and clinically also he had a mild disease and he recovered well. Okay, 
the existing uh, pediatric experience uh, in the literature says that many of the findings that we see in the adults are also seen in the pediatric age group, especially among the teenagers, is, uh, except that uh, it, it was much less severe among the pediatric age group than that was seen among the adults. And chest radiograph was very informative among the little children. The radiation factor, I would like to spend some time on this uh, uh, slide. Now, radiation is an important factor, isn't it? We work, we the radiologists work on certain technical parameters to keep the radiation as low as reasonably achievable. We keep the scan time and tube current very low. We use a small field of view, small focal spot and higher pitch, all this to keep the radiation reasonably low. Well, it is possible to substantially reduce radiation applied if a concerted and a very committed effort is made at the time of scan. And the modern, uh, the new age machines actually enable us to tailor all these factors much easily. The modern equipments are extremely fast. Therefore, the scan time to do the CT scan has significantly dropped in recent past. For example, a CT chest can be finished in three to four seconds of exposure time. Compare that with a chest radiograph, which takes one second of exposure. One second of exposure for an X-ray, three seconds of exposure for a CT of the entire chest. So that's how quicker the machines have become. The, the shorter the exposure time, the, uh, the lesser the radiation it's going to be. So if you're asking me what the quantum of exposure itself will be during a, a CT chest, it, is, it would be around three to four MSV. MSV is millisieverts. That's a unit for effective dose that the, uh, the patient um, takes in. So CT chest would be about three to four millisieverts, as in here, and a chest radiograph would be about 0 0.1 MSV, right? So that's about, you can calculate, it's about 40 or 50 uh, chest X's add up to one CT scan. So there was this recent claim by a famous doctor uh, uh, saying that one chest CT is equal to 600 X-rays. I think that is a claim which is absolutely unsubstantiated, uh, cannot be accepted. So 20 millisieverts is the quantum of radiation that is accepted for occupational uh, exposure. For people working in hospitals or anywhere, the occupational accepted exposure is 20 millisieverts. And according to the International Commission for Radiation Protection, for medical usage, they allow up to 100 MSV for medical usage, people undergo scans. So therefore, we are very much within the limits of uh, uh, the maximum extent. So if there is an absolute need and a clinical indication for a scan, and if we really believe that a scan will positively impact the decision making, and if the benefit exceeds the risk, I think there should be no hesitation in doing a CT scan provided all the precautions and the tailoring of factors are done in. Ultrasound chest also can give a lot of information, isn't it? We all know that very well already. It can show the interstitial edema, subplural consolidations, lobar consolidations, effusions, pleural thickening. It cannot see the ground glass opacities, but it can see many more things. So to conclude here, I feel if in case, God forbid, if in case there is a pandemic hitting the uh, uh, children more harder, I think CT chest will definitely play a significant role even among the pediatric age group, at least among the bigger children. And radiograph, chest radiograph will play its part in the little kids. And uh, there is this possibility of a prospective promising role that this ultrasound chest might play among the children. Thank you for the opportunity. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Uh, thank you, Anand. It's a very nice, comprehensive presentation. Uh, the, the, as you rightly pointed out, it's a, the radiation dosage is a myth. I think the radiation dose calculation is so very much based on the atomic uh, bomb explosion uh, reading only. It is not a, uh, any randomized control trial, anything like that. Okay, so it's a uh, if you do uh, a pediatric CT, it's a, it's a well uh, uh, well manner. We can finish the CT at the at the rate of ten times of X-ray. Okay, at the rate of ten times of X-ray, we can finish the one uh, diagnostic CT using the all those maneuver. So you can use uh, CT uh, 
uh, judiciary listed in any any suspected patients and also you can uh, sometimes uh, you, the ct can be also used for the triage so when you are having you are not having the uh, the medical lab uh, diagnosis uh, Im- immediately uh, and the patient is in the in the uh, severely sick mm-hmm. at the time we can use the ct for triage not only for the prog- and also you can use for the prognosis the prognosis as you told is a mild moderate severe and importantly you can use the uh, ct based on the ct finding we can choose the diagnosis uh, you can choose the management it means that when you having the organizing pneumonia so organizing pneumonia it st- states within 7 uh, to 8 days after the initial in- infections so you can uh, the organizing pneumonia is there you can you can start the patient with steroids so you can based on the ct imaging you can tell the what uh, uh, stage of patient is there the based on this we can choose the correct medication and also when you follow up this is patient with ct uh, chest some patients Uh, if the deteriorating we can if the any uh, lesions the, any lesions is coming within the any cystic lesions coming within the consolidation we can start think of any development of the uh, super added uh, infections like a fungal and a gram negative infection we can uh, think so uh, this is the thing i want to tell first one is the radiation it's a myth it's not a proven uh, thing and so you can use the uh, cd just judiciously to all the patient but the only thing is you should not use too frequently it may scientifically speaking if you are if you are any dna damage happens uh, after the ct scan it will be repaired within 24 hours so the basically you should not take uh, uh, repeat the ct within 24 hours so this is the latest uh, recommendation okay <clears throat> thing Thank with you. this uh, uh, we conclude this uh, uh, ct uh, Uh, role in uh, uh, covid-19 thank you sir so uh, i kindly request you to uh, turn off screen sharing now i would like to call upon dr nc gaurishankar sir to enlighten us about uh, available vaccines during this pandemic he is the head of clinical operations and pediatric pulmonologist at metha multi specialty hospital The chairperson is Dr. K. Venkatesh, uh, President IAP Chennai City Branch. Over to you, sir. I need to share my screen, ma. Sir, uh, Anand, uh, sir, please uh, turn off the screen. Yes, sir. Is the screen visible, ma? Yes, sir. We can see it, sir. good evening all i will just give a birds a birds eye view of covid vaccines what is available throughout the world too we know that in covid 19 there were many issues when they were developing the vaccine finding the most effective vaccine candidate and the production process which can increase to the scale needed to cover the entire population of the world so these were the main issues the next two were logistic issues storage requirement and how many shots will be needed for each for getting an op- uh, optimal immunity so everyone was convinced among the vaccine manufacturers and vaccine developers they need to focus mainly on the spike protein and try to induce an immune response against the spike protein you know spike protein s1 and s2 the most external domain the receptor binding domain this is the one which allows high affinity binding to the n terminal domain of s2 receptors covid-19 has got this peculiarity there are more number of vaccine candidates in pipeline than ever before for any other disease except for covid you know that more than 50 vaccines are in the pipeline or undergoing trials too fda has approved way back in december 2020 three vaccines two mrna vaccine both from us 
and a viral vector vaccine in UK, in US and UK. Before going into the vaccines, you need to know the categories of vaccine because vaccines are developed in certain particular formats. One is whole viral vaccine. Another one is nucleic acid vaccine, which can contain either DNA or RNA. Viral vector vaccine, protein subunit vaccine. What the vaccines do in viral vaccines, they try to smuggle the antigen into the body or they try to use the body's own cell to make a viral antigen. These are the two mechanisms by which the vaccine tries to induce an immune response. We'll see one by one, the whole viral vaccine. We know that viral vaccines can be live attenuated or inactivated. You know, our country's Bharat Biotech Covaxin is an inactivated whole uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. The advantage with whole virus vaccine is it is more stable, especially it is, I'm talking only about the inactivated whole viral vaccine. It is more stable. That is the biggest advantage. But are there any shortfalls? Yes, they have a short duration of immune memory. Along with that, they also induce a weaker immune response. So to offset the weaker immune response, either you need to give a higher dosage of vaccine or use an adjuvant. And it can be easily handled. That means storage is easy. It's supposed to be less expensive, much safer. And you have two vaccines. One is Covaxin, Bharat Biotech, and next one is CoronaVac, Sinovac Biotech from China. We'll come to the nucleic acid vaccines. It is a relatively new technology that the genetic material uses either DNA or RNA. They provide instruction to the cell for making specific protein from COVID-19. The specific protein is the spike protein. Once they are inserted into the host cell, the genetic material is read by the cell's own protein making machinery. So this helps to manufacture the antigen. Once an antigen is manufactured, it triggers an immune response. DNA-based SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is only by Zydus Cadilla and it is instilled in trials. It's one of the six. Zydus Cadilla is one of the companies which is in the hunt for DNA-based SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Because till now, DNA vaccines are commonly used only in veterinary medicine. No DNA vaccine has been registered for human use. Then, most of the time we have RNA-based vaccine in virus. So, again, the same for SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Here, they encode antigen of interest in the messenger RNA or self-amplifying RNA. So, there is zero risk of it integrating with our own genetic material easy to synthesize. That means it can be done chemically from a template in the lab. It can be relatively quick to formulate and easy to design. You have to know that Moderna's mRNA vaccine, the vaccine which is being used in USA, the clinical trial started within two months of sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 genome. We have two mRNA vaccines. One is Pfizer and another one is Moderna, both from US. The RNA can be transported in various ways to enter the human cell. It can be encapsulated with the nanoparticles. It can be carried by lipid microvesicles, or it can be driven into the cells using techniques developed for DNA vaccines. Once they enter, they temporarily induce the cell to produce the antigen protein coded by this messenger RNA. So here it is mainly the spike protein, very rarely it's fragments. So the Pfizer vaccine, it is named as BNT152B2, but it is a nucleoside modified messenger RNA vaccine. It encodes this receptor binding domain antigen, two doses, which is given 21 days apart. The efficacy is 95% against the original SARS-CoV-2 at seven days after the second dose, there are no serious safety concerns. 
except fatigue and headache. But the main drawback is it requires ultra cold freezer storage between minus 80 to minus 60 degrees centigrade. And it comes in a multi-dose vial. It is an off-white sterile preservative free frozen suspension. You cannot use it straight away. It must be thawed to the room temperature. It should be diluted with normal saline before administration. It is a multi-dose vial. It is 88% effective against the Delta variant and 93% effective against the Alpha variant. Then we have the other mRNA vaccine, the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. The brand name is Spikevax. This also encodes a spike to protein antigen, which is encapsulated in the lipid nanoparticle, two doses at 28 days interval, not 21 days. The overall, uh, the overall efficacy is 94.1% against this original vaccine strain, not for the mutated strain. And the recent study says, in those who have been previously vaccinated clinical trial participants, if you give a single booster dose of this Moderna vaccine, it increases the neutralizing titers against two variants of concern. B1.351 and P.1. So once you have already taken Moderna vaccine, you give a booster, it is able to take care of the variants also. It needs only about two to eight degrees centigrade. It can be stored up to 30 days in this temperature. If you're going to store it at minus 20 degrees, you can store it for up to four months. Now we come to the third category, viral vector-based vaccines, which is the commonly used COVID shield, comes under this category. Here, they use modified virus to deliver the genetic code for spike protein into the human cell. By in infecting the cell, it makes the cell, it instructs the cell to make a large amount of antigen so that it can trigger an immune response mimicking a natural infection. Once it mimics a natural infection, you know it is going to be strong cellular immune response both by T cells and production of antibodies by B cells. The non-replicating virus vectors, they usually like uh, use only the primate virus, why? The pre-existing immunity against virus vector can affect the vaccine efficacy. So we use primate viruses from chimpanzee or gorilla so that you don't get, you don't affect the vaccine efficacy. Using chimpanzee adenovirus, you have our AstraZeneca, Oxford University vaccine, the gorilla adenovirus by Raithera uh, Italy and human adenovirus, which is uh, the, which the Sputnik V, that vaccine uses. This is what we are going to get. We had already got in India. And there are uh, many countries which is trying for a nasal spray using adenovirus. Now we'll come to the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, which is an using adenovirus serotype 26. It is a single injection. This is among the uh, COVID vaccines. This is the only vaccine which can be given as a single injection. It is 100% effective against COVID-19 related hospitalization and death at day 28 after the vaccination. It gives consistent protection across race, across age groups, including older and 60 years and older across all regions in the world. It has to be stored between nine to 25 degrees centigrade. It can be stored in this temperature for up to 12 hours. And in a standard refrigerator, it can remain viable for months together. And a phase three trial shows that it protects against moderate to severe critical COVID-19. And the onset of the protection starts 14 days after administration of the vaccine. Now we'll come to the COVID shield, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the COVID shield. It was named AZT-1222. It is 
a replication deficient chimpanzee adenoviral vector vaccine. Two dose series, 28 days apart. 66% effective against alpha variant, 60% effective against delta variant. And you have the phase three trial going on in UK to assess the safety and immune response in children and young adults between six to 17 years of age. You have many dosing regimen during the trial, vaccine trial, many dosing regimen. One dosing regimen, they said, Vaccine efficacy is 90% when you're going to give half a dose initially and then full dose after one month. Another dosing regimen, which use a full dose between like two doses uh, uh, with one month interval, it showed only 62.1% efficacy if you're going to have only one month gap. This is what we all had. In another trial, they administer a second dose three months after the first dose. They found out the vaccine efficacy was 76% and the antibody levels were able to maintain till 90 days after that, it started to wane. And they found out the group that received two doses, two doses, that means standard doses, 90 days apart. That means a primer and a booster, three months. They said that uh, higher efficacy of 82.4% compared to uh, around 55% if the second dose is given less than six weeks. Probably this is the reason for the Government of India expert group to modify the dosing schedule in India. And during this trial, they also did the nasal swaps for the trial participants, regardless of their symptoms. They allowed this allowed assessment, that means the overall impact of the vaccine on the risk for vaccine uh, infection. That means it is a surrogate for potential onward transmission. What happens is a single standard dose reduced the PCR positivity by 67%. After the second dose, it reduced to 49.5% overall. So it may have, this vaccine may have substantial impact on the transmission by reducing the number of infected individuals in the community. Yes, we do have some complications, cases of thrombosis or thrombocytopenia. The FDA even temporarily paused the use in mid-April to evaluate, but then finally gave the order. But now, emergency use authorization includes a warning. That means rare clotting events may occur after vaccination, especially in women aged between 18 to 49 years. Because the risk for death and serious outcomes of COVID-19, they far, far, far outweigh the risk for thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. And the mechanism for this TTS is not fully understood. It appears similar to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. What are the criteria to diagnose? The patient should have received the vaccine within four to 30 days previously. It should be venous or arterial thrombosis. What we see commonly is cerebral or abdominal with thrombocytopenia and a positive PO4 heparin induced thrombocytopenia by ELISA. What else is in store? We do have reports of Guillain Berry syndrome and even death. Governor of India also had uh, reported only one death in the AAFI. Now we come to another vaccine, vector vaccine, Sputnik V. This has got two separate uh, uh, vector virus. That means the first dose has adenovirus 26. 21 days later, three weeks later, you give the uh, vaccine, which is based on adenovirus 5. Because if you're going to change the vectors between the two doses, it is found to boost the immune response. The vaccine also comes in two ways, ready to use solution in water, which is a frozen liquid formulation for large scale use. It is cheaper to manufacture, easier to manufacture. That is why it is in a ready to use solution. Also, they have manufactured freeze dries powder, which can be stored in a temperature of two to eight degrees centigrade. The only thing it has to be reconstituted with water before use. Why did they produce the freeze dries powder? Because even though it will take more time, it will uh, need more resources, but it is more convenient for storage and transportation. It 
is mainly developed for vaccine delivery to hard to reach regions in Russia. Probably this can be of help in India too. Really? A lot subunit vaccines. They contain purified frag. They contain purified fragments of proteins and or polysaccharides. Fragments are incapable of causing disease, so they are safe. Risk of side effects are minimal, cheap, easy to produce, more stable than those containing whole viruses. But because they lack the um, pathogen associated molecular pattern, they elicit a weaker immune response. To overcome that, they are delivered along with adjuvants and booster doses may be needed. And all subunit vaccines are made with living organisms, bacteria and yeast. So when you're going to use this, they require substrates on which they can grow the organisms. You need to maintain strict hygiene to avoid contamination. So it's going to be more expensive than to produce chemically synthesized vaccine. For example, RNA vaccine. You have a vaccine by name Novavax, which uses insects uh, cell culture to produce the spike nanoparticle and combining with matrix adjuvant. Two doses, 21 days apart, they have an overall efficacy of 90%. And you have another vaccine by GSK, which uses tobacco plants to produce the spike protein aggregated as virus-like particles. They combine with GSK adjuvant, and this is the trial is going on. Now we'll come to the last few slides. CDC recommendation. If you are already infected and required, do you need vaccination? Yes or no? Yes, you need to have the vaccination. Why? Because vaccination enhances the T cell immunity. It enhances the antibody secreting memory B cell response and it enhances the neutralizing antibodies, which is effective against the emerging variants. And when should you give that? After recovery from acute illness, if you are symptomatic and meet the criteria to discontinue isolation, if you had used monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma, you need to wait for 90 days. How did they make out that? You need to give vaccination even for COVID affected patients they found out in mRNA vaccines, a higher antibody titer, up to 10 times higher antibody titers than uh, the antibody titer in convalescent plasma from donors who recovered from natural infection. This made the CDC to give a recommendation like this. What about adolescent and children vaccine? From April 2021, vaccination from 16 years has been approved. In May 10, the FDA extended the emergency use authorization for age 12 to 15 years. In June 10, the mRNA vaccine, they have given a report of 100% effective, uh, effectiveness, efficacy of this vaccine after two doses in adolescents. Probably by this week, we will be able to know whether this also will be approved for 12 years. Now, the last but one slide, many unknowns. Knowledge gap is there in COVID vaccine because of the fast track vaccine development. We still do not know which is the best vaccine, which is the best optimal schedule and the best dose. We still do not know whether it is safe for the next generation kids that is from newborn till 12 years. Efficacy, every vaccine study has given the efficacy but the effectiveness data is yet to gather momentum. Whether we can interchange the vaccine from one brand, mRNA vaccine to viral vector vaccine or like subunit vaccine, we still do not know. Whether we need an annual vaccination strategy for the high risk group, that also we still do not know. So I'm leaving you with more questions than answers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gauri Shankar. You have given a comprehensive talk on vaccines and which has cleared the lingering doubts in the minds of many and, of course, answered many questions regarding vaccines. Maybe some questions are left unanswered. That will be answered in the future, I think, for some time. I thank the organizers of the CME for asking me to chair this important session on COVID vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the excellent session.
Now moving on to the uh, next topic, third wave, what to expect? I hereby call upon our speaker, Dr. L.K. Prem Kumar, sir, consultant pediatrician, Meta Hospital. This session will be chaired by Dr. S. Srinivasan, sir, ex-director and head of department, Jipma Hospital, Puducherry. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Correction, director, professor, it's a different thing from director. It is the same designation, but not director. Only the senior most will become director. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Is it visible? Yes, sir. very much. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, good evening. Now, uh, just one good news for all the participants here. This is the last talk I'm going to do after a long exhaustive sessions, which we had a very, uh, uh, very informative and very useful discussion. So, uh, for the last three and a half hours, we have been talking uh, about the clinical aspects and uh, what are the, for the what we have learned for the past one and a half years now, and with what we have learned. And uh, and what? How are we going to approach it in the future to prevent the third wave? So, having unlocked being released in most of the states in India, where are everybody rushing to after the lock towards the third wave? I guess because that's probably uh, it all depends on how the public reacts. So, whether are we going to get a third wave or not? Not only on the public, it also depends on the viral mutations. Now, before uh, going into why why is it called that? Uh, uh, it's called a wave actually. Now, what is the definition of a pandemic wave actually? So it's because of the crest trough pattern of the spread of an epidemic of a pandemic is called a wave. And the pandemic wave is identified on the basis of certain characteristics. It just came into use during the 1889 to 1892 influence outbreak where there were multiple waves. And the wave pattern is based on the R factor or the R naught, which is nothing but R uh, denotes the reproduction number, which is nothing but average number of people infected by one infectious person. If R is significantly more than one, then it indicates an upward curve. And if R is uh, less than one, it indicates a downward curve. Sorry. Hello. Hello. Can you an audible frame? Yeah. Screen is visible and you're an audible, yeah. sir. The, I yeah, don't not. Know. yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm just I'm just stuck up this slide, sir. I'm just moving. Okay, okay, okay. Slide. Sorry. So suddenly second. you became <laughs> silent, so you're wondering. Frame, if you double click, it will move. So what have we learned in the past one and a half years, like during the first curve in the 2020 and now the second curve in the 2021, did we really learn from the first curve? I don't, we, of course, we have learned a lot about the scientific aspect, but how much did we apply to prevent such severity of the second curve? See, but this curve will definitely uh, denotes us how rapidly the second curve, there is a rapid increase in the number of cases with increased mortality and morbidity. And of course, there was a rapid fall too. Again, so what are we going to learn actually? What was the relevance of the second wave and what have we learned so far from the second wave was compared to the first wave was in the second wave, we find that the incubation period was, was much shortened with more of positivities with high infectivity. And we came across seeing a lot of whole entire family members getting affected, including majority of the children too. And there were more symptomatic children Compared to that, more children affected in the first wave. Of course, there were a lot of atypical presentations, as like all the other speakers, so there are a lot of neurological presentation, and especially in 
pediatrics, we had different presentations more than the respiratory symptoms. We had even have a lot of acute surgical emergency cases which uh, with COVID positive cases. So the severity of disease was more in the second wave compared to that in the first wave. As Dr. Jagan pointed out, the younger individuals were affected even without comorbidities, unlike in the first wave where the elderly people with comorbidities were severely affected. So as a result, there are more number of admissions in the hospital requiring more number of beds throughout the world, actually. And of course, in children, they are coming across more than the acute COVID cases. They are coming, they are seeing a lot of MIC cases, and of course, which is more expected to happen in the near future. So what is the possibility of a third wave in India? The pandemics generally tend to occur in waves and each wave causes a large number of cases. So either people become immune by asymptomatic or by symptomatic infections, which in turn develops a herd immunity. Over the time, the disease may die out or may become endemic with low transmission rates. And probably if the immunization coverage among adults is not increased, then there is an increased possibility of third wave India but overall, with all that's a hype crea being created by the media and by all the epidemiologists and virologists that pediatric population is going to be affected in more in third wave India. But from the pediatrician's point of view, there is a possibility of third wave, but it is difficult to predict its timing and severity. So this was a study conducted by the IIT students in Kanpur, which they have projected in the last week, actually. See, there were three scenarios which can occur following the unlockdown, which has been happening throughout this, uh, uh, probably throughout in India. Now, each, see this, each three curves, which with the different color pre uh, presentations, probably I'll uh, show it in the next slide, where the scene, scenario one, where everybody is back to normal, assuming that India is fully unlocked. We know that all these states are being unlocked, like probably by, if we expect full unlock by the second week of July, so what happen, happen is people will get back to the normal routines if, it, if, if they don't follow proper uh, social distancing norms and other things and another COVID appropriate biggest third wave could peak in October, but probably a lower spike height than the second wave. But of course, if the virus plans to attack in a different way by, with its mutations, then probably the peak could occur much earlier in September and probably the peak could be much higher than the second one and probably we went result seeing more number of cases and more mortalities too. And of course, if you follow the strict COVID appropriate behaviors, the peak of the wave could still be delayed until late October with strict social distancing here, the peak will be lower than the second wave. So it all depends again on the public behavior as well as on the viral mutational behavior. Of course, the most important thing is how are we going to prevent the uh, prevent ourselves from increasing the third wave actually. So one of the most important thing is vaccination. So the vaccination is known to break the transmission chain. At present, of course, the model does not include vaccination, especially for the pediatric age group less than 18 years, at least in India. And if at all, if vaccination is promoted or if it, as uh, Gauri Shankar has said, if it is probably available for the age group about 12 years, it should decrease the peak significantly and probably sooner than expected, we would expect a revised model of vaccinations and with more recent data on the same is being worked out actually. So why are we more concerned about the third wave? No, but because all of us are talking about the really the children that will be more affected. That is why probably you're all sitting here and talking about as pediatricians, whether children are at greater risk actually. If you look at the last two waves, the first wave predominantly affected the elderly and individuals with comorbidities, where only 7% of the children were affected. Whereas in the second wave, the younger age group, young adults were predominantly affected even without comorbidities. In the second wave, approximately 12% of the children were affected. And the third wave projection, probably everybody expects 25% to be affected. Maybe as pediatricians and with other doctors, we let's just work it together to reduce it to 0.25% to have healthy children across India. But one thing is children are as, as susceptible to adults uh, in getting the infection. But one good thing is they don't develop a severe disease. There's no clear data to indicate that majority of the children develop severe infections compared to that of the adults. 
And one more positive news, which we have come across, the latest zero survey done by AIMS New Delhi, especially which was released in the first week of uh, June, showed that 55% of the children less than 18 years um, showed zero positive antibodies and compared to 63.5% in adults, which was not totally significant, actually not statistically significant. So what it indicates is that equal number of children have been equally affected, probably most of them have become asymptomatic. So that is a good sign. This, this study was done only in Delhi. Maybe throughout India, the study is done, we will know exactly what zero surveillance prevalence is available among children less than 18 years. If so, it is not statistically significant compared to adults. Probably that is a good sign that most children will not be affected in the third wave. So, so what are the factors for and against increase in children in the third wave? The children have been relatively less affected so far due to several factors. Probably the most important reason being the lesser expression of specific receptors to which the virus binds to to enter the host and also the immune system. On the left side of the screen are the factors which are for favoring more children will be affected in the third wave because the percentage of children affected were less compared to adults in the first and second wave probably. So that is where people are expecting more children to be affected in the third wave. And maybe again, because of the virus mutation, we had newer Delta virus which had high infectivity rate and probably of late we are not talking about the further variant of a Delta virus, maybe Delta plus variant, which again people are talking about there is increased transmissibility and high virulence, but of course there's not much of study about that, the newer Delta plus variant. And of course, one important factor has been the unimmunized group because children have not been vaccinated less than 18 years. So probably that is why they are more prone to develop these infections. And of course, one Again, whatever be, whether immunized or unimmunized, and if people are not following the COVID appropriate bigger safety measures, mainly the mass social distancing and hand hygiene. So every anyway, any time in the near future, any third wave or fourth wave are always going to happen. What are the factors against the increase in children in third wave? So one thing is there is no reopening of the schools, colleges, and any play activities or any social activities. So probably that is one factor that has got a decreased rates of transmission among the children. So anytime schools opening or colleges opening, probably children rushing to them. And if the parents have not been vaccinated or if the teachers have not been vaccinated, and maybe that could, again, there is a possibility that there's an increased rate of transmissions in the school actually. One, there was a recent study which was released last week by the BMJ College of Pune where that uses of measles vaccine in children, probably, which we have been routinely using in our national government immunization program, which is about any uh, measles vaccine, live alternative virus vaccine, which is to be supposed to provide a non-specific immunity against the, any virus also. So probably the final result of the study is yet to be released, but this is one positive aspect that which we can uh, be more comfortable with because we have been routinely immunizing children with measles and BCG vaccine. Another positive thing, even if the children are affected, most of them are asymptomatic. So we don't routinely test COVID RT-PCR for all children unless and until they become symptomatic, either moderately or severe. So all these factors probably are more favorable that children will not develop uh, much uh, symptoms during the third wave. But if at all, preparing for ourselves, if at all the children do develop, how do we prepare ourselves for the third wave actually? So what are the management strategies? So it is not a single person's role as pediatricians. It's not only our role to treat the patient. So we meet, they need hall lamps and deck. Or, for example, like even we as pediatricians, we were helping out during the second wave with all the general physicians and adult physicians and at least in the basic handling of all the out, outpatient services. So probably, we also expect the same from other things. So roping more family physicians and not just pediatricians to identify the problem and just maybe give them more what needs to be taken care and how to monitor and when to refer to a pediatrician. Design a role for paramedical staffs. Again, tell them what are the basic things that they need to look after, how to monitor the ch children at home, especially in home isolation. Now, of course, tell them that most affected children only get a mild disease with fever. So maybe tell every uh, uh, members like family physicians or tell paramedical staff that day one, day two fever, no need, no need to panic and no need to rush to the hospital. They just need a supervised home care with monitoring. And of course, IAP has released guidelines on the management of COVID and children and all pediatricians probably would have gone through it and they had a better idea on the COVID management. Now, 
there are three types of probably one is outpatient services to where we prepare ourselves to face see more number of outpatients and of course the next will be the inpatient services but how do we prepare ourselves always we say that prevention is better than cure actually so how do you prevent ourselves from developing it maybe each and every child now coming to routine patients uh, for any complaints now coming to your clinic tell them what are the safety measures that needs to be followed and every parent will ask you definitely pediatric are going to get more affected how do we prevent ourselves so tell first tell the parents that they get vaccinated before worrying about what the child is going to get because in fact they getting vaccinated will also prevent the children from getting a, a moderate disease or severe disease and how to strengthen the outpatient services there should be 24 by 7 outpatient services in all the pediatric care hospitals with emergency departments with round the clock availability of pediatric doctors and especially trained pediatric staffs and encourage daily consultation on in initial phase of illness we always saw during the second wave that most of the people were rushing to the hospitals because of fear, main fear and panic actually so just tell them everything that day one day two of illness they can always have a daily consultation which has been legally approved now so we can always talk to the parents keep periodically monitoring them and if necessary you can refer them to the hospital so have a separate triage area and op and emergency room to minimize the crowd so that don't people not do not crowd much there in fact we have been seeing that there's a lot of vaccination crowd which increased through the surge of the uh, cases doubtful cases probably refer to the hospital services and of course in the out, uh, hospital service we should have availability of adequate medical medical equipment and drugs in all pediatric op training of junior doctors and staffs and early identification of the sickness of the child should train them what are the red signs which they need to monitor the child and when they ref, need to refer to the hospital or when they need to admit the child in the hospital of course again training the parents regarding the care of the child at home and encourage covid vaccination among parents so that that decreases the infectivity to the child and also the other routine vaccination so probably we are all seeing like lack of vaccination among the public because of the fear of covid now they didn't bring it so we encourage them to get a vaccination and especially the flu vaccination because because the change of the weather again in the next two months probably are going to get a lot of flu cases which again can present as severe acute respiratory illness which can mimic like a covid infection then probably we need to admit them in an isolation mode and then again need to uh, check for covid which is an, uh, probably unnecessary uh, delay of time to actually so probably encourage all the vaccinations in children as much as for early as possible how do we strengthen the inpatient services like probably we had a experience from the second wave where most of the hospitals have converted majority of the beds to the adult strength probably this time this is a reverse to where we have to increase the bed strength to cater to the pediatric services especially uh, mainly for children alone where we increase the uh, strength of oxygen beds and increase the strength of uh, h2 and pac beds to cater more to the acute covid cases and especially anticipating more of mic cases of course in inpatient services availability of adequate me medical equipment and drugs especially oxygen uh, availability and the basic drugs like iv ig and iv methyl prednisolone and other basic medications with increase in the number of medical staffs attending to inpatient services especially in pac and hdu training of doctors in primary care and training of nurses for the inpatient services and of course we need to have an adequate well equipped transport facilities where we need to transfer the child from one hospital to other in case the child becomes sick and uh, transfer them to a well equipped hospital where they have good intensive care facility so the infrastructures have already been created should not be scaled down and deficits identified during the second wave should always be filled actually so whatever we have learned from the first wave and second wave what we have learned from probably we didn't learn much from the second wave that's why there was a great increase in the second wave maybe we learn much better from the second wave so that we don't want the third wave to be as severe as the second wave oh you see what all we have is not only these uh, probably the preparations not only needs to come from us it also has to come from the community also so we need to educate all the public and the private actually so organize and execute public awareness program through the public awareness program allay the fear and panic among the public continue reinforcing the covid appropriate behavior now it is a simple thing masking sanitation and social distancing keep reinforcing again and again to whomever see to all the patients that we see in the outpatient basis parents 
should also be an ideal role model to the children. They should follow the COVID appropriate behavior and automatically the children will follow the parents too. Continue to keep children isolated from other groups. Just because the, there is an unlockdown, do not take the children to play activities. Do not take the children to outings where they come in contact with a lot of other people. In fact, that will in increase in the infectivity of the, among the children. Of course, vaccination of children, probably we all expect that it is readily available soon. That will prevent children. And of course, educate the parents regarding the illness and warning signs and different platforms and TV medias and YouTube channels and other all channels and video consultation, inquiring about the child status, advising about the nutritional status. As we talked about, Dr. Jacken said, one of the risk factors in young children being predominantly affected in the second wave was obesity. Now, having children being in the lockdown for past one and a half years, I think we are seeing most of obesity cases. So again, that nutritional status of the child also should need to be explained to the parents, like telling them what physical activity needs to be done even though they are at home, because obesity is one of the risk factors, major risk factors for the morbidity or mortality of COVID-19 infection. Of course, children above the age of two to five years can be trained to use a mask if the adults follow it properly. And utilize all the corporate sectors and uh, NGOs uh, to help in the uh, dissemination of knowledge and training in COVID care. So it is not a, a, a medical practitioner's uh, role alone. So it has to be a partnership between the public and the private and also from the uh, government sectors so that we are all stay healthy. And of course, uh, the new variant, so now we have been, a lot of people have been talking about the Delta variant actually now last to one week or so we have been uh, seeing a lot of news about the Delta plus variant. So for the latest news is over 40 cases have been detected till yesterday across the country. Is it really a variant of concern of the total sample sequenced of all the viruses in, in the genetic sequencing done? It was the Delta plus variant was only less than 1%. So probably the study indicates it is not a much of a variant of concern. So it's not only the Delta plus variant, any Delta strain that exists anywhere in India. So we must be concerned about the second wave ending before we worry about the third wave. So we have not even the end of the second wave. Still, there are a lot of cases across the country. Still, there are a lot of uh, cases in other states where still we have not completely released the lockdown. So before we, uh, we, I think we should take measures to end the second wave before we start worrying about the third wave. So one, one good thing is the Delta plus variant has not been of a various concern. Of course, we need still a lot of studies to know whether it is really of a concern or not. So what is the summary is, the, as usual, it's let's just like a masterly inactivity with a watchful expectancy, the best policy to need to follow in pediatric COVID. We'll just prepare for the worst and hope for the best. We'll just be ready to tackle any crisis if there is any pediatric uh, increase in number of cases. Simple thing, reinforce again and again the COVID appropriate behavior. And let's not panic. We as medical practitioners, let's not panic and let's all not allow the public also to panic. So let's pray that we all stay healthy. So on a lighter note, probably this is the slide actually. So we pediatrics, let us prepare ourselves for the third wave, whether it is going to come or not, we should be prepared to face all things. Thank you very much. So for hearing, the previous speakers have made the cake, but you have put the icing on the cake. That's as important as the cake itself. So your talk has been up to the point and it has summarized everything which is known about the third wave and from various talks on third wave from various platforms we have collected that it is not going to be more severe and it's going to be about 20 percent and less okay so there is no need for panic and you have really summarized each and everything i have nothing more to add thank you so much it was a wonderful talk i understand why tangevela has put you the last to talk about this in your usual calm and the very forceful tone you have given all the points but one important point when you are having public campaigns campaigns to find out you know to teach but we must not create a panic we must put it in such a way that they don't get unnecessary fear and uh, all the educational input should be done 
on the positive aspect and never highlight that it is going to be very uh, this thing. So they should not develop a fear complex and already tension is there. That's the only point I wanted to make in addition to what you said. Because in the last slide you mentioned, you know, community awareness and all the positive things you have stressed. That is to be mentioned and of course about the behavior and the use of masks between two, two to five years child. And they have to be an example for them, for the child to follow the this thing. So it's a wonderful talk. Thanks uh, Dr. Tangavelo for giving me an opportunity to chair this session. And uh, as Thank people you, I Thank can you. see from of course, there's no question for this talk. And as I can see from the responses, everybody has appreciated all the speakers and your input in channelizing all this and then uh, giving appropriate assortments to the appropriate people. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request, uh, Prem, can you stop sharing your screen? Excellent, Dr. Prem, particularly the last slide. I look at the eyes of Kaundamani. <laughs> we are exactly in the same, same state. So we always, saying that. <laughs> yes, sir. We always go with a uh, uh, gun and whether we, do, whether we find the tiger or not, we are not sure. Actually. We don't know. So we probably, have to carry gun. Uh, yes. Kaundamani is Vadivel, sir. Vadivel. Vadivel. The main <laughs> person is Vadivel. The man in the center is Vadivel. <laughs> the important discussion is going on now. Okay, sir. <laughs> sir, I request, uh, we are much grateful to all the faculty, chairperson, the speakers, chairperson, all. It was a very, very interesting uh, session. When we started, we were really worried because 12 talks, how to control the timing, it is going to extend all. Very, very, we got a very, very positive response from many, many um, viewers. So thank you all. It is about 314, totally 314 in the uh, Zoom platform. Maybe in uh, YouTube also people may be viewing. I sincerely thank everyone. I want you to switch on the video and appear on the video screen. And all the questions have been sent to you. So, right, uh, shall we start with Dr. Sarada? Most of the questions, most of the faculty have answered in the chat box also. So, you can select the question, read the question, and uh, uh, request you to deliver the answers for a live yeah. session. We will also take this opportunity to take a group photo also. Sir, LSR and others. <laughs> All of you, please uh, request it to appear in the screen, sir, so that we can have a group photo also. Yeah. Starting with the say no to Dr. Tangavelu's request. Pardon, sir? We <laughs> cannot say no to Tangavelu's request. It's very important. Everybody's request, sir. It's not me. Yeah, yeah. Just voicing it, everybody is yeah. requesting through me. Thank you, sir. No, it's a great uh, event and very apt topic selected and... Uh, given to the appropriate persons to talk about it and they all did full justice. Thank you, sir. Sarada, uh, Sarada, please. Yes, start sir. You can select uh, your questions and you can answer. Sir, role of antibiotics uh, in acute uh, COVID. Um, usually, we do not uh, require any uh, COVID, um, antibiotics as such for uh, COVID coverage. But in case if a child comes down with a, a shock or a hypotensive shock or a cardiogenic shock where uh, 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 we need, we, need, we have not localized the reason for the shock. Covering the child with antibiotics take priority uh, than the reason. So that is the only situation where antibiotics have some role. Otherwise, uh, in acute COVID management, if you are sure that the child is not having any secondary infection, there is no prophylactic uh, antibiotics. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sharada. Next speaker, Dr. Muttaya. Yes, sir. Please, yeah, I think many questions are there for you. You already <laughs> answered a few. And then we can select your questions and uh, answer them. Uh, yes, sir. There is, uh, the, there is one question I think it is already answered in chat box also. Role of uh, cardiac MRI in MISI. Uh, that was actually, uh, we don't do um, cardiac MRI in all MISIs. Only uh, where there is a doubt of, you know, uh, like post viral uh, consequences, like dilated cardiomyopathy. Or the LV dysfunction is not improving, but to prognosticate and uh, look for fibrosis or still edema, and in those situations, we may do cardiac MRI. Otherwise, not routinely uh, done because most of the MISI patients they recover very fast. Uh, that is one. How many weeks post COVID should MISI be considered in DD? Uh, this is a good question. Uh, usually, two to twelve weeks is what uh, has been told in guidelines. So, any fever coming within three months post COVID. 
we need to consider messi in the dd as of now this is the uh, evidence which we have beyond 3 months we can uh, maybe uh, you know think of alternate cause more likely what is the maximum time that's actually the same uh, and uh, doxy uh, safe age limit actually we are using doxy uh, frequently in uh, all the pediatric age groups uh, starting from infancy i think 5 to 7 days if you use doxy uh, doxy cycline uh, there is no risk of any epiphyseal uh, injury or anything in the growth uh, in most of the children so i think short course of doxy should be okay uh, without any major side effects uh, another interesting question what is the explanation for post covid missy immune dysregulation 4 to 6 weeks after prim- primary infection while in adults they get hyper inflammatory state during primary infection only actually there are these are two uh, different uh, pathogenesis mechanism in adults that is the, there is a pri- primary cytokine storm because of the excess of ace receptors in the lung and endotheliopathy which uh, is seen in some patients so in adults it is the uh, extension of the primary infection they have cytokine release when the uh, infection is active only in the second week commonly but in uh, children because of reduced ace receptor or because of innate immunity because of exposure to other viral infections naturally they they have less of this pulmonary phase they go for this delayed hyper inflammatory state which is sometimes called as a third stage which happens after like you know say 2 to 4 weeks in some genetically predisposed in uh, children who have a, a like uh, inflammatory excess there uh, predominantly it is a super antigen theory or the antibody dependent enhancement there is a super antigen theory to which antibody excess happens and uh, predominantly t t cell uh, mediated uh, cytokine release and b cell mediated auto antibody release predominantly constitutes the delayed uh, mase so these are two different things we should not confuse them like acute um, acute covid going for lung uh, pulmonary uh, complications cytokine release is different yeah no. that is more common in adults in children we have uh, post covid mis that is because of uh, like like seen in other autoimmune conditions like adam gbs we know uh, certain you know uh, like you know itp many other conditions where we have immune mechanism as a predominant factor not the related to the infection related to the infection so that is what is uh, uh, the difference between missy and uh, uh, covid uh, acute covid in adults i think that sums up i think thank you mutaya uh, because you had very interesting and nice uh, pre- to the questions i thought you are going to announce an award for the questioner is it so uh, maybe sir we can <laughs> it's possible okay that sandeep uh, that sandeep is requested to appear in the screen and answer the questions uh, you can select the questions and answer sandeep Yes, sir. I have I have been directed uh, the question. Uh, the question says, when to suspect secondary HLH, and is there any uh, difference in the treatment uh, uh, for secondary HLH? So, sir, uh, I would say that both the clinical parameter, the clinical findings as well as the biochemical parameters will raise the alarm. If the child is very sick with multiple organ dysfunction, like liver dysfunction, and uh, uh, requiring multiple organ supports, progressively worsening, uh, it should definitely raise the alarm. we can go with the biochemical parameters as well sir uh, the uh, the 2004 criteria will hold true here also hyperferritinemia uh, uh, tri- hypertriglyceridemia triglyceridemia uh, hypofibrosinemia uh, bicytopenia all this will uh, give us a clear picture and as far as the treatment is concerned treatment uh, if we have not started on steroid probably the child will be required to start on steroids also um uh, methylprednisolone prednisolone or uh, maybe sometime some of the physician they uh, tend to start on dexamethasone uh, 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 dexamethasone uh, instead of methylprednisolone uh, so ivig and uh, steroids both will be considered in the treatment if it has not been started already uh, sir i see only this question was there uh, is there any other question sir uh, that's all uh, sandeep thank you very much your talk was excellent also your shirt thank you sir <laughs> thank you very much sir the next is uh, can i ask that jagan hello Jagen, sir, Jagen, sir you sir, are in the forest i think no so no 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 sir i am in my home not so in the forest like, okay, okay i will change the background sir yeah. i am audible sir yeah. nice audible yeah. audible jagan yeah sir okay so incidence of fungal infections in adolescent covid so uh, this is going to be a different phase itself like post covid fungal infections so the prospective 
of us dealing with fungal infection has changed even now itself so adolescent the problem is most of them have a bit uh, sugar in the higher end and they have been treated with steroids the incidence in fungal infection is more when the steroid is given for more than 12 days that is what the observation is so if the steroid is given for more than say 15 20 days almost always they land up in fungal infections this is one and if the patient is being given immunomodulated therapy say tocilizumab or bevacizumab in the context if steroid is given a long term then definitely the possibility of some fungal infection has to be seen only extra point what i can, what I can tell is usually our routine cultures detect fungal infections to a lesser extent so detection of fungal infection by routine cultures is always tough and it takes 5 days sometimes more than 3 days so for fungal infection alone if you really suspect this patient might have a fungal infection then you should go for fungal pcr that will give results in 3 hours and it saves life so if a patient has got a uh, systemic fungal infection you miss for 24 hours the mortality becomes double so it is always better to suspect fungal infection the second question is with regard to ddmr uh, what is the normal value of ddmr and how we can interpret post covid ddmr so the normal value of ddmr is less than 0.5 we all know that so if the ddmr value goes above 1 the chances of mortality is slightly high if it is more than 2 it is really high so one interesting observation what we found in this ddmr is previously in the sense like uh, when tocilizumab is not available during the starting of second phase and we don't have any other immunomodulators other than ivig and steroids so in those era what happened is if a patient has got a ddmr of more than 7 usually the mortality rate is so high we will decide like okay definitely this patient is not going to survive it was it used to be to that level so after this combination with immunomodulators steroids and ivig last three patients with ddmr more than 7 all three of them recovered so this ddmr increase in ddmr increases mortality especially if it is more than 7 and 8 so more than 2 itself the mortality rate is high and uh, the last question asked is post post discharge so there is a recent study done which shows even after 4 months after post covid ddmr value used to be more than 0.5 so it doesn't uh, and they have done uh almost some 50% of the patients they have followed up for 50 days and they have done an ct angiogram none of them had pulmonary embolism so the study finally says like there is no correlation between d dimer post covid and venous thromboembolism so you just follow venous thromboembolism protocol if the patient is obese old age uh, immobile then you give them on uh, anticoagulant that's it i think i have answered all the three questions thank you jagan nice yes, of you an adult uh, intense wish to join tall adult intense sir, to join the sir, kids like us thank you very much sir, yes, thank, thank you sir thanks a lot sir now we call upon dr sasidharan who played a dual role in this movie double role movie double acting sasi you yes, also sir. have a lot of questions i think you can select your question and answer yeah yes sir i'll um, i'll start with the first question can we discharge child when uh, child improves symptomatically even when the inflammatory markers are still elevated so the uh, uh, i am trying to give a practical answer um, uh, there are two components we have to monitor in it's uh, related to classic mise so um, we have to see two things one is fever defervescence uh, second is inflammatory defervescence so the inflammatory defervescence obviously you need to look at inflammatory markers if the fever defervescence is consolidated more than 48 hours the child is completely febrile absolutely doing well no progressive organ dysfunction every organ function has completely improved then you are completely comfortable that clinical defervescence has started happening immune inflammatory defervescence is the crp is still 10 um, uh, so something like that it has come down but it is not completely normal at that moment if you ask whether it can be discharged i think you can discharge on the medication as per your protocol and you can follow up the child uh, the second question is most of the investigation and treatment uh, with ivig is logistically difficult in resource limited setting can we advise empirical steroid if child fits mise criteria maybe this question has been asked to wrong person <laughs> that's how i can start so the thing is um obviously we do understand resource limited and we i have i have to reiterate resource limitation is not limited to public health sector and it is limited to uh, it is extended to private sector as well 
when the cost of therapy is like ivig and when child's the weight is going close to 40 50 kg and adolescent so in that case a cost is a concern so uh, what i would say is um, tropical infection panel negative uh, highly likely to be mise more than 2 3 people so like you can you see mdt team uh, consensus so like that if 2 3 people feel that uh, it is uh, confirmed highly likely to be mise and tropical infections ruled out in that case starting uh, steroid may be okay but what i would um, like what uh, would be right is if you are starting steroids if you are in such circumstances you have uh, been encountering good significant number of patients undergoing this kind of therapy then obviously you have to start collating the data and at some point of time we have to analyze the data um, uh, to come out of this uncertainty so whether it can be used or not there are two three uncertainties whether 1 gram per kg ibig is okay or 2 gram per kg has to be used uh, second thing is whether steroid can be used as a first drug so these will remain as uncertainties till we collate our data and analyze and come to a certain decision um third question is uh, steroid absolutely contraindicated in typhoid dengue other tropical infection actually <laughs> um uh, i i have seen uh, 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 this question was appearing again and again but uh, uh, my answer will be like in two fold uh, so uh, i i do understand the context on which you have asked this question so dengue secondary hlh we say 10 to 20 mg of dexamethasone per meter square body surface area can be given um okay so any secondary hlh uh, this is the protocol now severe disease may likely to be in the secondary hlh but what i want to emphasize is typhoid typhoid because the question was um, again and again going around typhoid so that's why i'm going to the next layer of typhoid so what happened is all the sick typhoid reg regimens of steroid is based on one indonesian study so the study says uh, a shock or severe neurological presentation this is a very very old study um, a shock or severe neurological presentation you give 3 mg per kg of first dose steroid and then 1 mg per kg q6 hourly of eight doses that is up to 48 hours and they clearly say if you are giving more than 48 hours of steroid there is high chance of relapse of typhoid the concern is adjuvant steroid in bacterial infections like salmonella typhi can cause long term carrier state and relapse possibility and uh, we uh, we have to be extremely careful about it so that is why my answer is no so we should not give steroid hlh is completely different don't confuse hlh with any severe dengue any severe lepto any severe uh, malaria any severe uh, uh, typhoid that may be over simplification of signs we may miserably fail um there are few other questions um what is the difference between post disease and post to vaccine antibody titers um so basically uh, this uh, uh, question i think akshit has tried to answer and uh, there are many differences um, uh, so it is uh, like um, uh, we cannot relate these two things uh, safely as similar uh, but uh, the defense provided yes a defense provided to the individual may be similar and uh, i'll go to dr shalu's question that is can there be a false positive covid antibodies this may be related to that what i have encountered as data available is um so uh, the sensitivity of the studies based on the day of sampling was variable starting from 35% 55% then goes to 70% if you take the sample on day 30 of post covid stay but uh, specificity very interesting specificity close to 95 to 98% always so a uh, covid antibody test based on the available data what i am quoting is a cochrane review in 2020 based on the available data it is 95 to 98% specific the problem dwells only in sensitivity so a uh, false positive covid may be like uh, as of now we should not think like that any importance of titers of this antibodies what we can clearly say is there are three types of results we get 
one is total immunoglobulin report which includes igg iga and igm then separate igm report separate igg report and in this also there are methodologies are different in different labs so what eventually we understood is at least the titers are of not great use we are not able to predict the course based on titers would prior administration of ibig hamper the interpretation of antibodies in covid 19 it's a million dollar question and uh, i think uh, logically and scientifically it may interfere at least in second wave post second wave because when we say the zero conversion already happened to close to 63 percentage in adult 55.7 percentage in children polyclonal immunoglobulins are going to be the human product so they are from blood they are uh, derived so there can be too many uh, patients with a zero positive status going for donation and there is a high likelihood that every immunoglobulin what we are giving has a um, antibody to covid also so there is a high possibility um, you can interpret that so that there is a pos theoretical possibility of interference um and and this question i have to answer is this covid positive and negative approach based on our own experience alone or there are any other guidelines based on this unfortunately it is on our experience alone i don't know nedenjelian sir will curse me for this answer but that is the truth as of now uh, so it is only based on our experience i thought this will give a better perspective but it is not uh, an intent to go against the national protocol but it is just to give a different perspective to it thank you sir nadanjarian is smiling don't worry <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir okay sir see only these sort of questions only can come only from nedu person with research methodology thank you nadanjarian sir now ask dr suganya suganya was a baby of the team when all other are senior consultants she is the only registrar who for willing to talk and the she, she has excellent. done a very very good presentation sir. excellent presentation yeah, yeah. very slow excellent presentation clarity of expression some of the slides are wonderful particularly the imaging slides when to do x ray and all is excellent uh, suganya you have some questions suganya you, can read out and uh, i think uh, uh, anand yes sir uh, open reading frame hmm. yeah, yes suganya so open can, reading uh, frame was uh, one question ah uh, yeah please sir. yes sir it is uh, like others Uh, uh, like uh, other genes like n uh, nucleocapsid spike or uh, envelope gene this is one of the gene uh, which is uh, used in the diagnosis of uh, covid uh, rt pcr one sir open frame is uh, it was more of a biochemistry uh, this sir like it is um, it is a part of dna which uh, on translation finally it ends in an uh, amino acid sir that was the one question and other one was something to do with gene or anything is it something to yeah, go with the dna gene structure you know genetic or dna structure ah uh, yes sir uh, in the dna structure sir it will code for non structural proteins uh, it was mentioned like that sir apart from uh, like how uh, envelope gene nucleocapsid uh, individual proteins are there these are it is one of the gene which is uh, useful in diagnosis of covid and also in uh, other uh, mers and sars cov id ella kliyume the gene irukra mari potlanga sir different numbers that was one question sir the other one was false positive uh, covid antibodies sir had to so sir has answered that yes. thank you sugunya thank you very much thank you sir can i ask dr uh, anand anand dr anand i think you're projecting the screen i think you to unmute unmute anand anand unmute and you have to stop screening i think it is your screening hello yeah yeah yes anand you have yes, to can hear me sir ah yes all of us can hear you can we say that the absence of subplural foci uh, is very unlikely to be covid so if if i, if I can sh show an image over here sir if you don't mind ah uh, yeah yeah it's visible but it is visible for me what about others yes sir it is visible 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 anand you can okay sir. i want to just visible. want to show a yeah show a couple of images to explain this uh, thing now if you see this image uh, you see ground glassing in both the cases you see some ground glassing over here and over here 
But if you watch the second image, the ground glassing is predominantly in the central lung field, and clearly the subpleural area is spread all around. Whereas in this image, the ground glassing is uh, involving the central zone also, but the subpleural area is involved, uh, predominantly involved. So if there is no subpleural involvement at all, in spite of fair amount of ground glassing, surely we are dealing with something else. This was a case of congestive cardiac failure. You can see the heart being uh, bigger over here with uh, ground glass opacities in the central lung fields. So ground glassing opacity itself is not specific for viral pneumonia. It also can be seen in congestive cardiac failure or many other conditions. So if the subpleural area is not involved significantly, uh, I think we should consider some other diagnosis rather than think about COVID infection. So to answer this question, complete absence of subpleural involvement almost rules out COVID pneumonia. How long will it take for the lung changes to resolve radiologically? Honestly, we don't have follow-up CTs to uh, really understand and uh, be able to be sure what the answer is. But uh, a few patients have come up for follow-up CTs. What you've noticed is anyone who's had, uh, who's had less than 50% lung involvement who's had a follow-up CT after a few weeks, we almost do not see any opacity in the lung. There's complete resolution of the radiological thing. But uh, people who've had 70, 80% lung involvement initially who survive uh, continue to have some fibrosis in the lung. We've had a couple of patients coming back to us after two months or so. We've seen uh, infiltrations in them. They also throw up some symptoms. They come back to the hospital with some post-COVID symptoms. So people who've not had so we can safely assume that people who do not have any symptoms have recovered complete from, completely from COVID, probably radiologically also they would have got a complete resolution. What is the underlying pathology behind the ground glass opacity? The pathology is the fluid exudation into the, uh, uh, the air space, just like any other consolidation. Only that in ground glass opacity, the fluid exudate is partially filling the alveoli, unlike in consolidation where the alveoli is completely filled with dense fluid. And also the, the, the fluid itself might be a transudate and not an exudate or a fibrinous uh, material. Why they are seen in the periphery? Well, that's that pathogen is honestly, I do not know. Maybe one reason is, uh, um, if I can show this image, if you watch this image, you can see some haziness in the um, this part of the lung. Now this is, if and, and if you see the rest of the lung is looking normal, this is actually, what we call is in the dependent lung changes. This is a normal finding in hospitalized decubitus patient. We see very often this, uh, one of the most important learning is to ignore this and call, do not call this as ground glass opacity. Why it happens over here, when you start trying to understand this, it's because the pleural pressure in the thorax is maximum over here. Also the diaphragmatic pressure when the patient is decubitus is maximum over here along the lower lobes periphery. Therefore, the alveoli here are not fully ventilated. They're not fully opened up. Even in a normal patient who is coming to the hospital for some other illness, when you do a CT chest, you'll find this area being a little hazy. These are called the dependent lung changes. So probably these are the uh, parts of the lung where the pleural pressure is maximum. And therefore, uh, when there's an inflammation there, I think, probably the alveoli are not able to hold on to the uh, itself. So probably that's the reason why we see a lot of opacities there. Are there any specific criteria for each of the CORAD uh, category? Yes, there are specific categories. Only that in CORAD 3, there is a bit of a, a gray area. We do not know what uh, exactly to be put in there. So it is it becomes a subjective uh, from the radiologist who is yeah. making that report. Otherwise, it's all pretty clear. Every stage is clearly defined. Does a machine age factor increase or decrease radiation? I assume he's asking whether the, an old machine gives more radiation. Uh, I, I hope I, I, I got the question uh, that way. Yes, very much. An older machine obviously will have more radiation because uh, there will be more of what we call a scatter radiation in older machines. The, the, the X-rays itself do not go uh, 
in straight line. There will be zigzag movements when the machine gets older, and those zigzag radiations are called as scatter radiation. They can, in fact, go to other parts of the body. When you're trying to do a scan of the chest, the radiation can enter the head, the abdomen, the legs, and all that. So an older machine is always a risk, uh, risky proposition. Can, Anand, Anand, can I just raise a question related to that? Yes, sir. When, when, when will it declare that this machine may not be fit? Okay, we don't know whether it's old machines causing scattering. No. When will we? When will the radiologist or the team will decide this machine may not be fit for use? When we are ready with the next machine. When we are ready with the budget <laughs> for the next machine, sir. But uh, practically, <laughs> uh, no. So it's difficult to say in US. Mm. Uh, for any, example, any years, number of years. He's uh, a retirement age for a uh, mission. That's what he wants to know. Just sir, like me. We didn't know that this is so dangerous. Uh, yeah. sir, in, in the US, sir, some years back, say five, 10 years back, they would discard a machine at the end of three years. Uh -huh. In university hospitals, they will use a CT scan only for three years. And after that, they move the machine out. Now and then it became five to six years because now uh, and now because of the budgeting, they're also holding the machines for eight to 10 years now. So any time between five to seven years is a good time to have. Beyond that is, I think, a risky uh, period. Only the age of the mission counts, not the age of the radiologist. <laughs> I don't know, sir. I don't know the answer for that. <laughs> like, like for example, in the a age is the age is not on my side, so I don't know the answer. <laughs> no, if the radiologist is old and then he's not keeping up to date with uh, this thing, then of course. <laughs> he will be, he will be thrown off. Yes, he will be yeah. scattered around. It's I like know. your machine was not keeping up to date. Then he'll be useless. So it's... you are always fresh. <laughs> yes, Anand. One last question is here, sir. It says, uh, can ultrasound chest be the initial screening procedure? And if doubt, still go to the CT chest. Well, this is a big question. I don't think anyone on earth will have an answer to this. As I told before, uh, the earliest and the most uh, common finding in COVID is a ground glass opacity. And that we are not going to see an ultrasound for sure. We're going to see consolidations and effusions and collapse, etc. But those come a little later on the disease. So I don't know whether it can be the initial screening test, but it can play a role during the course of the treatment in the hospital. That much we can be sure. But time only will tell the answer for this. Very good, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Thank you. Thank you wonderful sir. Thank answers. You. Thank you, sir. Thank wonderful you. Wonderful answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Arun Krishna is available. Can I call him? Dr. Arun Krishna? Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Yeah, here, yes, sir. I think you have one question. Uh, one is, how do you explain the appearance of MIAC in uh, MIAC in new, uh, newborns? Sir, uh, I heard that you also mentioned about fetal MIAC. Did you, yes, did you mention or I just heard? Yes, sir, it is mentioned, sir. Uh, because one case we had is a, a fetal MASC and uh, there was one more case report also which was having a fetal MASC. So mm -hmm. there are two, uh, one, most of the case reports which is uh, which has been published uh, says that the transplacental uh, transmission of IgG from the mother causes the reaction, sir. That's uh, one thing. But the case which we dealt with was having IgM variety. So we speculated uh, it like the baby reacted to the uh, virus, producing an IgM titer of around 110. So that's the uh, thing. Th thank you, Arun. Thanks for your wonderful uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you call upon Dr. Uh, Shivan Kesavan? Um, See, neurologists so are always see. bright, no? And particularly in addition to brightness, if they also look very charming, the answer will be really great. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, I have two questions of which one I had already answered in the chat box. So I'll take one here. Uh, how long does it take for a patient to recover from anosmia or agusia? So on an average, it takes around uh, two weeks to recover from that. It can go as long as three to four weeks. The majority of patients recover. But however, we have a small proportion which has been uh, reported in adulthood, 25% uh, with other comorbidities like diabetes, smoking and risks of micro microvascular and neuropathic who, rec who take a long time to recover in those patients, it can be a permanent uh, deficit as well. But that's a very small proportion and that is in adulthood. Most of adolescents who report this symptom recover completely within an average of two weeks. What's more interesting about uh, anosmia and agusia is that uh, it has been reported or believed to be a predictor of a mild course of the illness. So people really don't know. Once you get uh, anosmia or agusia, uh, patients are told that you will not go into severe COVID. 
and they reassured that you will have a very uh, uh, mild course of infection. It's believed that when the local immunity is active, the cytokine production in the locality of the olfactory uh, neurons, there is much more destruction and uh, uh, probably destruction of the virus and uh, completion of the infection at that level itself. And it prevents uh, uh, entry of the virus further into uh, the internal structures. And probably that is one reason why anosmia and agusia or these cranial nerve symptoms are associated with uh, less milder course or a, a less severe respiratory or a systemic infection. So that is very peculiar and interesting about uh, agusia in uh, COVID. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shivan. But uh, most of the impact like, uh, like dengue, jab B, COVID, all of them concentrate on uh, thalamus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is there uh, any this, particular uh, reason for that? Uh, sir, uh, one thing is that uh, this thalamic injury you are talking about is a part of acute necrotizing uh, encephalopathy. So, uh, uh, Japanese encephalitis has a neurotropism for the thalamus that is related in the molecular level that uh, uh, the virus has a neurotropism. For the rest of the viruses which are not really neurotropic, because COVID is not really neurotropic, and uh, dengue virus as well is not, uh, in the majority of cases, is not neurotropic. So it is neuroinflammation, which is secondary to the immune response. So the immune response probably is more prevalent, uh, uh, affect prevalently affecting the thalamus for unknown reasons. One is probably the uh, cytokine profile and the immune reaction to these uh, viral antigens is more prominent in the thalamus. So that must be one of the examples. But in Japanese encephalitis, that is a totally uh, different explanation that the virus itself is neurotropic and uh, that is why the thalamus is frequently affected. Thank you, Shivan. Uh, suddenly, one question has come for uh, Sasidharan. Why dexamethasone in acute COVID and methyl prednisolone in MISC? Sir, um, basically, uh, th this is a very interesting thought process. Um, uh, usually, there are two things will, which will decide uh, what uh, steroid you would give. For example, um, I'll go to the next uh, uh, next thing also, because in septic shock, refractory shock, we will say hydrocortisone. If you say it's uh, secondary HLH, we will say dexamethasone, 10 to 20 milligram per meter squared body surface area. And uh, if we say the uh, adrenal crisis replacement therapy, again, we will go to hydrocortisone. At the same time, if you go to the KD uh, experience of IVIG, um, and other therapy over years, as well as the rheumatologist way of treating uh, uh, like uh, SOGIA and other diseases, um, they predominantly, they prefer to use methylprednisolone. So basically the answer number one, the answer number one is there is a preferential usage by rheumatologists uh, because this algorithm has evolved from the rheumatologist. And another thing is in cardiac predominant presentation, we are comfortable to use methylprednisolone. That is also there. And uh, whenever the lung is an issue or it is a systemic process like secondary HLH, dexamethasone is preferred. Whatever lung study you predominantly see, starting from viral pneumonia, adjuvant steroid therapy, most of the places they try to use dexamethasone. So lung dexamethasone is a preferred thing. And systemic secondary HLH also, dexamethasone is preferred thing. And when you say adrenal crisis or adrenal deficient patient replacement therapy, hydrocortisone, on that same basis, which happens in refractory septic shock, hydrocortisone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent, uh, intelligent answer. Can I add one more reason for that? Metal prednisolone in MISC both start with the letter M. Metal prednisolone in MISC. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I call upon that Gauri Shankar? Uh, yes, sir. Shall I read out the question, Gauri? I have sent you the question. Shall yes, I read sir. out? Are you got yes. it? Can you read out, sir? Ah. Sorry, sorry, one minute. I have posted something for Gauri. Yes, sir. Regarding Johnson and Johnson yeah. vaccine. Yeah. Is yes, it sir. available in India? No, sir. And there have been some uh, questions about it uh, in the USA itself because of some uh, reactions. So I think of some of you can go through it. I have posted that uh, link. Okay. So. Thank you, sir. 
Johnson, what is you know, Johnson, of course, Johnson powder, no, you know, it is carcinogenic and uh, they have uh, sued the company for so many. So you have to be very careful when uh, company is already in problem. Okay. So this Johnson, uh, recently I read few articles on this. That's why I just uh, took a photograph and sent it. Okay. So USA is questioning that uh, Johnson's company because they are trying to push it very fast. Single dose vaccine is there? Yeah. Single dose vaccine. Thank you, sir. What is the recommended interval to continue our routine immunization for children who have recovered from COVID? Now, that is ch children who have recovered from COVID. What is the recommended interval to continue our routine immunization other than COVID? I really do not know, but any viral infection, we say that about it takes about four weeks' time for the optimal immune response to come back. So four weeks may be an ideal one, but really I don't know the answer because I don't have any data or studies telling that how much is going to be the immune response if you're going to do it early. So, but again, COVID is a viral vaccine. Uh, COVID is a viral infection. So any viral infection, it can suppress the immune response and normally it takes about four weeks. This is what everyone says. So four weeks should be an ideal time, but this is my answer. I don't have any backing for that. Question related to that, any, any advice depending on the use of steroid and IV immunoglobulin? Uh, sir? Related question, any advice depending on the use of steroid or IV immunoglobulin? IV IG means 90 days, this is what they say, sir. So after 90 days, we can start using vaccination. We can continue the vaccination. Thank you, Gauri. Thank you, Gauri. Sir, Jalil wanted to ask some question. Jalil, yes, sir. sir. The COVID, the COVID mission, you know, sir, can, you, the, can you please be louder, sir? I can't hear you. The, the vaccine after the COVID exposure, uh, Dr. Gauri Sangar, sir, I think is correct. In the mission, they said it is four weeks. If not, uh, I think. I think Any two months interval between the disease and the vaccine, I heard. Sir. Like uh, mm -hmm. this is uh, CDC recommendation is once mm -hmm. the patient is mm -hmm. symptomatic mm -hmm. and when you are going to send the child, send the patient home without any restriction of his activity, from that time onwards, you can have the vaccine. This is what the CDC says. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gauri. Thank you, Jalil. And Dr. Shiva Gurunathan asked a question from Trichy. Uh, this, I think, Sasi can answer. Sasi or Mutai can answer. When the child recovered from MIC, but continued to have elevated D-dimer more than 2000, whether we have to start anticoagulants? Uh, anticoagulants in children uh, always remain controversial because they are actually discoagulant. And um, you know, in adult, the D-dimer was given huge amount of importance because the D-dimer predicts uh, pulmonary thromboembolism risk. So in uh, children, that is not the case. So uh, based on 2000 nanogram uh, uh, D-dimer value alone, we may not decide any anticoagulant prophylaxis. Uh, we have to go through the screening list and we have to see whether the child is having any other risk factor for prothrombotic state. So if the child is having a risk factor, the recent recommendation says that you can put on enoxaparin if there is a event of thrombus. If there is a event of thrombus, you can put on enoxaparin for up to three months uh, till the evaluation says that the child doesn't have familial thromboembolic disease. So uh, it is such a complex thing. So if it is isolated D-dimer 2000, what will be the practical perspective is you can continue antiplatelet that is three to five milligram per kg of aspirin and you can uh, maybe uh, measure uh, uh, two weekly interval if it is still high at the end of six weeks of discharge maybe the child requires a familial prothrombotic state to work up so based on that only we can decide anticoagulant we can't decide only based on d-dimer level Sir, one more, one more doubt. Uh, yes, uh, tell it. Why, huh? why we are not considering the INR when titrating the anticoagulants, sir, in COVID era? Sir, does uh, not mean. I think sir, low molecular I, heparin, INR is uh, not considered. Is it, Sasi? Sir, 
only for heparin I, INR is concerned yes sir yes sir uh, sir I, uh, we uh, we we use warfarin um if you use uh, heparin inr may be more meaningful sir but now in adult what they use is uh, the newer uh, the novas newer oral anticoagulant agents that is uh, like direct factor 10a inhibitors um, not thrombin inhibitors like afixaban uh, eliquis tablet and all those things so for that also we cannot monitor inr sir that is one low molecular weight heparin if we use we have to uh, monitor anti factor 10a activity and anti factor 10a activity if it is maintained 0.2 to 0.5 we are achieving prophylactic anticoagulation if it is 0.5 to 1 we are achieving therapeutic anticoagulation this is based on the guideline and we need not achieve therapeutic anticoagulation if the child doesn't have thrombus so if we achieve 0.2 to 0.5 is fine unfortunately anti factor 10a level may not be able to be done in most of the places except in organ transplant centers and some other places so that is why we say that you give prophylactic dose of 0.5 mg per kg maximum 40 mg od in children uh, more than that you don't give so that is like a practical recommendation thank you sasi this new anticoagulant novak is it is uh, still uh, can be used in children or uh, trials are not Sir, there as of now uh, at least covid related disease uh, the the uh, newer oral anticoagulant agent um uh, like afixaban afixaban has been approved by us fda for post covid prophylaxis in adults so uh, that eliquis 2.5 mg that is afixaban is commonly prescribed to adults but in children the um, uh, like uh, the experience with uh, um any kind of this direct uh, thrombin inhibitors or factor 10a inhibitors all these are newer oral anticoagulant is extremely limited and it is not uh, given routinely sometime for predisposed children like uh, renal transplant children the other children uh, people try to use if the child is uh, like kind of an adult more than 15 16 years 50 60 kg they tend to use otherwise uh, no acts are not used routinely in children one more question for you sasi uh, is there any possibility of getting mic after the vaccination Sir, uh, uh, actually, <laughs> the uh, um, Mutaya has uh, described about the mechanisms. So there are three mechanisms people say. One is uh, uh, that is the host immune response aberration, uh, which will happen after some time period, and uh, second thing is cellular immune mediated uh, abnormal response. and another is auto antibody to the organ system auto antibody to the gastroendothelium auto antibody to the immune cell it is like a auto inflammatory phenomena there it comes the antibody enhancement phenomena which we say like in dengue something like in dengue so, what happened in dengue yeah mm-hmm. something like in dengue so these three are the mechanisms so if it is a very specific fragment based antibody in um, uh, this thing like um, uh, vaccine uh theoretically it is not supposed to happen because that fc fragment will be different for the uh a- antibody uh, created by the patient versus uh, uh, the, the vaccine induced antibody so for the human body it may not be the same person it is actually a different person though we say everything is covid antibody it is person a it is person b thank you sasi and uh, dr prem you are a very good astrologer you predicted that there won't be any third wave even if the third wave comes also can i are you able to hear uh, prem y- yes sir yes sir your face looks very anxious <laughs> no because you are yes, a very sir. good astrologer predicted that no third wave will come even if the third wave come also it won't affect the children even if the children are affected they won't have any severe illness so you gave us a very good news so all of us thought that we will not disturb you with any more questions So no questions. No, maybe if I had the horoscope of the COVID virus, I could have said better, sir. But I didn't have that. We don't know who are no. We don't even know the date of birth of the COVID virus. When it was born, where it was no, born, sir, nobody but, knows. If we get it properly, no, no, but that's what, sir. But, no, no, but the, the, the all the uh, media search, everything is only from the epidemiologists yes. and other researchers saying pediatric. But all the most of the pediatricians across the Uh, country everybody feels that that's not going to be uh, much more children affected so that's probably a good positive news for all of us sir yeah we'll always stick to positive news i i don't want you please stay yes, for sir. the vote of thanks i first i would like to thank dr venkatesh 
Chennai City Tam IAP Chennai City Branch President for agreeing to co-sponsor with Mehta Multi Specialty Hospital and the IMA uh, IMA uh, functionaries. My sincere thanks to Shamir. He was he wanted to conduct and organize a good CME on COVID. Almost we took at most four or five weeks for us to organize this. I thank sincerely thank all the faculty. Right, lot of uh, effort and the chairpersons. We got very good. Good feedback. Even Dr. Shalu Gupta is a professor in Delhi, I think. Is it as I see? So many people, even across India and uh, other than Chennai, also participated. They were very positive uh, feedback to us. And then uh, special thanks to Dr. Sangeeta and Dr. Janvi. La, they have been la, last one week. They have been working hard to organize, inform, and passing on all the passing on the strict orders. I gave it to them. 15 minutes time, 13 minutes will get as well. All the strong orders I gave it to them only. I did not tell the faculty. So that is another thing. So I sincerely thank both of them, Dr. Sangeeta and Dr. Janami, for uh, conducting us, conducting the proceeding as well as organizing the whole thing. And also special thanks to that, Mr. Uh, either Ms. Angel, Lena, Fatima, for uh, doing the needy things to get the MCA credit points and for all, all the organization help. So I uh, again I. Sincerely thank all the viewers. Very actively participated. A lot of questions and actively participated, and then passed to encouragement for us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Last request for the faculty: please uh, pass it on the write-ups, because we have assured that uh, we'll share the PDF to them. So please, I think tonight before you sleep, please send the write write-up to us. <laughs> Otherwise, we can't sleep. I think everybody will start calling for the PDF. Thank you, Dr. Jalil. Thank you, another sir, participation. Thank you, Sinivas and sir, Ella sir. Thank you very much. Again, thanks to the IT persons also. I forgot to thank the IT. IT organized the Zoom, and then that Shivan gave an idea to stream in the YouTube. Both are done by IT team, Mr. Suresh and Asal, Mr. Siva. They did a very good job, and Sasi, Sasi from IT, he, he stayed all along for to help us. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. Good night, all of you. Good night, sir. Except for those people who have given their homework <laughs> to finish it. Good night, sir. Yeah.